Good morning, everyone. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being streamed live on the internet. Good morning, Vice President Ellenberg. Good morning, Jim. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about you? Best day ever. Great. And we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Good morning, Monica. Would you like to do a mic check? Uh, yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. See me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Good morning, Priest Prasad. Would you like to do a mic check? You're currently muted. Uh, good morning. Can you hear good me morning. now? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Wasserman. You are muted currently. Morning, Supervisor Simidian. Good morning. Are we doing a sound check? We are, and you're coming through loud and clear. Thanks so much. President Wasserman, do you want to try your mic? Yes, and now I've got full screen. Good. Great. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Supervisor Simidian, you'll be leading us in the pledge today. Thank you. My pleasure. Recording in progress. I'm 9.30 and I see my vice president. I There's all five of us, good enough. All right, let's take a roll call. We'll call this meeting to order. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Leon. And with that, if uh, all of you are able to stand, please do stand. And Supervisor Simidian will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor Simidian. We now move on to item number three, which is brought our invocation, which is brought to us today by Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee. Good morning. Um, since we are now in the month of uh, Diwali, uh, and, and we know Diwali is a traditional Indian festival of light. It celebrates the victory of light over darkness, knowledge over ignorance, hope over despair, and good over evil. And I would like to invite priest Rakhav Prasad from the Sunnyvale Hindu Temple and Community Center to do the invocation today. Priest Rakhav Prasad has studied Veda and Sanskrit, and he graduated from the University of Mysore in India. Currently, Raghav Prasad serves as the priest, and he has been working at the Sunnyvale Hindu Temple for eight years. He works with many others to contribute to our diversity by sharing India's beautiful culture. Please welcome Raghav Prasad. Welcome. You're muted, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, I'm glad to join this uh, great occasion of Diwali uh, Heritage Month uh, from the city of San Jose. Uh, we would like to, on behalf of Sunnyvale Hindu Temple, we uh, wish to happy Diwali to all. So we we'll let's start the invocation, prayer of Lord and the universe, and then we will go from there. Om Ganana Antwa Ganapati Gum Hava Mahe Kavinka Veda Mupamashravastamam Yestarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Pata Anashrin Banno Tibesi the Zadanam Mahaganapata Namaha Prano Devi Saraswati Baje Birvajini Bati Dinama Vitriabatu Maha Saraswati Namaha Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Brutyorma Amratangamaya Om Shantishantishantihi That means lead me from the unreal to the real, lead me from darkness to the light, lead me from Death to immunity. Kale Barishato Parjanyaha Prithi Vesasya Shalini Desho Yam Chobarahitaha Sajjana Santu Nirbhaya. That means, may there be prosperity to the subjects, the rulers protecting the world in lawful manner. May the cause and the Human beings have auspiciousness eternally. May all the people be prosperous. May the rains shower in the proper season. May the earth be prosperous with the abundant crops. May the country be free from the distress. May the human beings be fearless. Om. Pur Namadaf Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Bashishyate. That is whole and this is whole. The perfect has come out from the perfect. Having taken the perfect from the perfect, only the perfect remains. Let there be peace, peace, peace. Om, let's pray the Shanti Mantra. Om Prathibhe Shanta Sakhnina Shanta Same Shanta Shuchakum Shamajatu Antarikshakum Shantan Tadvayuna Shantan Tanme Shantakum Shuchakum Shamajatu Prathibhe Shantir Antarikshakum Shantir Yosh Shantir Disha Shantir Avantara Disha Shanti Ragnish Shanti Vajush Shanti Raditya Shanti Shandrama Shanti Nakshatrani Shanti Rapa Shanti Roshadaja Shanti Vanaspataja Shanti Gaushanti Raja 
ಶಾಂತಿರಶ್ವಶಾಂತಿರುಷಶಾಂತಿರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಶಾಂತಿರ್ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರೇವ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶೋಪಶಾಂತಿ ಓ ಸೊ ಸನ್ನಿವೇಲ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ವಿಲ್ ವಿಶ್ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ದಿವಾಲಿ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಸ್ಪರಿಟಿ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲೈಟ್ ಟು ಯುವರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಬ್ಲೆಸ್ ಯು ಅಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ giving the opportunity for this thank you thank you thank you supervisor lee now move on to item number 4 on our agenda which is announcements in adjournment supervisor lee you yes thank you uh for today's adjournment i would like to honor and adjourn our meeting on behalf of our friend bob lawson and sunny bell bob passed away on october 7th on uh, this year 11 days before his 60th wedding anniversary with his wife Margaret Bob was born in Bat Ax Michigan on November 19 1930 and raised it was raised in Detroit he received an undergraduate degree from University of Michigan served as a first lieutenant in the US army from 1952 to 54 Bob practiced law in Sunnyvale for over 50 years he was heavily involved in community services most notably in the Sunnyvale Rotary Club, the Sunnyvale Democratic Club, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Sunnyvale, and the Sunnyvale Chamber of Commerce. He served as the chair of the Sunnyvale Planning Commission, chair of the Parks and Rec Commission, as well as the Sunnyvale Arts Commissioner and the Sunnyvale Charter Review Committee member. In 2020, Bob and Margaret received the prestigious Murphy's Award for Lifetime Community Contribution, recognizing the exceptional service to Sunnyvale community. Bob loved all genres of music, supported the arts, and enjoyed playing the piano. He expressed his creative passion with his silk screen greeting cards for all occasions. Though life without Bob will never be the same, his humor, kindness, and loving nature will live on in his wife, Margaret Waddell Lawson, and their three daughters, Cynthia and Steve Berglin, Audrey Augustinski, and Missa Lawson, and his six grandchildren, Nick, Rachel, Sarah, Ben, Laura, and Grace, and his two great-grandchildren, Mason and Olivia. Bob will truly be missed, and our hearts go out to the family and Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Before we move on to our accommodations and proclamations, item 5, A, B, and C on your agenda, I'm going to ask anyone who wishes to speak during public comment, which will follow the proclamations and accommodations, to electronically register now so we have an idea of how many speakers, how much time to allot. Again, public comment is the opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. With that, we'll start item five, accommodation proclamations with a proclamation from Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman, once again. <laughs> in November, the county proclaims this month as the National Native American Heritage Month in Santa Clara. Uh, Monica Ariano, the vice chairman, the uh, chairwoman from the Moguekma Ohlone tribe of San Francisco Bay Area is joining us today. Over the centuries, American Indians and Alaskan Natives have shared their rich cultural heritage, knowledge, and wisdom to the betterment of modern society and have made significant contributions to both California and the great American society since its founding. By serving in all branches of the United States Armed Forces and the American Revolution through the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, now I want to read some of the whereas. Whereas it is in the spirit of promoting a sense of unity among American Indian and Alaskan Native peoples and community through sharing traditional values in cultural and educational presentations on American Indian history and heritage that we celebrate the month of November to honor all Native American nations and people of Americas by promoting community service, education, well-being, strength, survival, and prosperity for all American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara do, does hereby recognize and proclaim the month of November 2021 as the National Native American Heritage Month in Santa Clara County. Congratulations, and thank you for all your contribution for being part of this rich and diverse county. And Monica Arano, thank you very much for being here with us. 
Thank you. And with that, we'll go on to item 5B, presenting a proclamation, which is Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. A little busy day today for me. Um, the American Legion Auxiliary is a remarkable organization formed in 1919 and comprised of dedicated mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters of wartime veterans who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces, united by a common goal of continued service to our veterans, troops, youth, families, and community. Today, the county is proclaiming November as the Veteran and Family Months Family Months in Santa Clara County. And we have Cindy Newman, American Legion Auxiliary District 13 President, joining us today, and we'll have a few words to say a little later. And I will read a few of the whereas from the proclamation. Whereas the American Legion Auxiliary educates children, organizes community events, and helps our nation's veterans through legislative action and volunteerism. Whereas the American Legion Auxiliary District 13 represented all of the auxiliary units in Santa Clara County in recommending the county proclaim the month of November as Veterans and Military Families Month. And whereas Veterans and Military Families Month reminds us to support our veterans and their families and honor those who sacrificed while serving our nation. Now therefore be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby proclaim the month of November as Veterans and Military Families Month in Santa Clara County and call upon all citizens, companies, and organizations to join in honoring the service and sacrifice of these brave men, women, and their families. Cindy, thank you for being here with us today and enjoy to say a few words. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad uh, I saw you at the uh, September 11th uh, service along with uh, Supervisor Chavez. Um, thank you for standing with us to honor the service of the military families that support our men and women. It's not just a calling um, for folks, it's, and it's not just a career. These men and women are away from their families or they are here and they're training on weekends and the rest of us carry on. These veterans go on to serve the community not only while they are um, actively um, employed or deployed, but when they come home, the veterans continue to serve. Uh, they take jobs as firefighters, as police officers, as nurses and doctors, and their training helps to strengthen our community even more. Thank you for standing with us to honor the sacrifice of the military families that help uh, the rest of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Wasserman, I have a request here. I, I, uh, that was my mistake. Um, previous um, proclamation, uh, I mentioned the name Monica Ariano. She's actually here with us and would actually would like to speak to her regarding that proclamation. Would you mind if we allow her to say a couple of words as well? Sure, let's do that. And then uh, we'll move on to 5C. Great, thank you. Monica. Hi, can you hear me okay? Hi. Yes, we can. Okay. Good day. I am Monica Ariano. I am the vice chairwoman for the Moak Maloney Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. On behalf of the Moak Maloney Tribe and the Santa Clara County American Indian community, I would like to thank President Washerman, Supervisor Lee, and the entire Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for declaring the month of November 2021 as National and Native American Heritage Month in Santa Clara County. This is a special time for our people to be recognized for our culture, language, foods, history, and contributions throughout history. It is also a time to bring attention to such issues like missing and murdered indigenous women, the countless lives of small children lost at Indian boarding schools, local issues such as our fight for our ancestral remains to be, be returned to our Moakma people, and federal status clarification for our Moak Maloney tribe. We appreciate the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors recognizing November as our month, but we hope to be invited back to offer a land acknowledgement and share more about our Moak Maloney tribe, the Aboriginal tribe of this area, and ask for your support for our federal recognition for our Moak Maloney tribe. Aho. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. All right, and before we move on to item 5C, which as you guessed it will be Supervisor Lee, um, I do want to invite anybody wishing to speak on public comment, which will be the next item, to please register electronically now. 
to help us manage today's meeting. Supervisor Lee, you've got a commendation to present. Yes, I have one more. Um, this is the commendation for the Cost of Courage Foundation. Um, the Cost of Courage Foundation is a nonprofit with a goal and mission to support the educational and personal needs of deserving active duty and military veterans in our community and works to ensure a successful transition back into civilian life. November 2021 marks the seventh anniversary of doing great work in our community. Since 2014, the Cost of Courage Foundation has been proud to serve the military community through scholarship, art therapy, emergency assistance programs that support veterans, military service members, and their families. And before I read the whereas, I just want to share my own personal story. I uh, was uh, called to active duty serve in Iraq um, in 2009 and haven't gone through the war zone for a year. I tell you, the transition back into civilian life was not anything uh, but easy. Um, and certainly what the work that the Cost of Courage Foundation is doing for many of our veterans and family members is so crucial. And now go ahead and read the whereas in foundation. Whereas in November 2021, the Cost of Courage Foundation is celebrating its seventh anniversary in Santa Clara County, California. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of County Santa Clara hereby recognize and commend the Cost of Courage Foundation for its dedication and service to improving the quality of life for veterans and their families. Thank you for your dedication and services in supporting us, our veterans, our families. And I believe we have Don Estes, the board member of Cost of Courage Foundation, joining us. And we want to also add a few words as well. Thank you for allowing me to be here today uh, to speak on behalf of the Cost of Courage Foundation. Established in 2014 to honor the service legacy of Sergeant Donald Fitzmorris, who was killed in action during the World War II Doolittle Raid on April 18, 1942. In his name, we carry out our mission to support military service members, veterans, and their families through our food pantry, emergency aid, scholarship, and art therapy programs. On behalf of our board, I wish to extend our sincere appreciation to Supervisor Lee and the County of Santa Clara Board of Supervisors for this incredible honor. We thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, do you have any more that I don't have on my agenda? I think that's all I have today. Thank you very much, President Wasserman. Thank you. Okay, good enough. And I'm gonna repeat for the third and final time. And I see we've got about 40 people looking to speak right now. Anybody wishing to speak, register electronically. This is public comment which is the opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. Um, given the large number of people we expect on um, items a little further ahead in our agenda, I think 30 seconds at a time will be the appropriate time for the 40 speakers we now have um, on the public comment portion. Dave, up to you to manage. One moment, Mr. President, while we get the timer adjusted to 30 seconds. Thank you. The first speaker is Tao. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have 30 seconds to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, thank you. I, I want to express my opinion on the Home Key project. I highly, highly oppose the current project location. It is really close to the residence area. Uh, we've already collected over 3,000 signs from the local residents, and over 75% of them are highly objecting to this. So. I think there is a great transparency gap here, and I highly urge um, the, all, all, the, all the members to consider voting no for this project. Thank you. And before we go to our next speaker, Dave, I'm going to make it clear to the speakers, um, the item that was just referred to will be handled under items 14 and 15 today. Um, go ahead, please. Next speaker. The next speaker is Jesse. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Supervisor. I'm Jesse, and I live on the Carrillo. I strongly oppose the home, the home key sites at the three locations, Bella Vista, White Oak, and Crestville. We have 3,000 web signature and 4,000 online signature opposing this project. Please, please listen to your residents and votes. 
And I, I urge all supervisors voting no for this project. Thank you, please. The next speaker is Jenny. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have 30 seconds to speak. Please go ahead. And Dave, I'm going to interrupt again. Okay. Um, I've just been informed we can do 30 seconds on regular agendized items, but must do a 60 second minimum on public comment. So we need you to revise your clock to 60 seconds. And I need to remind every speaker now that's registered and we're up 38 right now. This is an opportunity to speak about something not on today's agenda. Item 14 is about the uh, property at 901903 East El Camino in Mountain View. Item 15 is about the property at 3550 El Camino Real in Santa Clara. So if you are registered to speak now and you wish to speak about either of those properties, please do not. Your time will be coming up very shortly under items 14 and 15. Thank you, go ahead, David. All right, one moment while we get the timer back up. The next speaker is Jenny, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute, you'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Jenny, are you there? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Jenny. I, along with more than 3,300 nearby residents, 2,200 from Santa Clara City, and um, many more will come to join. I strongly urge you to vote no to the Home, home Key Project. But also, we need a detailed plan for the children's safety in the commu community. As Two sites in Santa Clara is so close to over 10 elementary school, especially Bella Vista Inn. It's only within one mile to DMV. We know teenagers need to go there for getting their driver's license. Who can guarantee the, their safety? Moreover, super bad location for the residents in the future housing facility. Too much and too close to the super heavy traffic, super noisy and the smell. I, along with more than 33 nearby residents, 2,200 from Santa Clara, and uh, more people strongly urge The next speaker is Julie L. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Julie, are you there? Okay, we don't seem to have Julie. Uh, we'll move on. Next speaker is Christine. I'm unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Christine? Hi. Go ahead. We seem to have lost Christine. Okay, we'll move on. One moment, please. The next speaker is Kathy. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Kathy, are you there? Okay, we've lost Kathy. We'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is Junshan An. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Junshan, are you there? And Dave, this may be speakers who realize they want to speak on 14 instead. That is possible, uh, Mr. President. Um, would you like to give it just a moment and see if more hands get lowered? Yeah, is anybody it... wishing to speak on 14 with home key, please remove yourself from public comment. You'll get an opportunity under 14 shortly. It looks like some hands are starting to be lowered now. Okay. Just lost 15 of them. All right, we'll get them back shortly. Go ahead, David. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on. We've got a couple of speakers who have not lowered their hands yet that we have called on, so we'll keep moving down the list. Next speaker is Sanathan S. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. So uh, uh, I'm talking. I'm here to talk about White Oak specifically, which is not on the agenda. Uh, the county of supervisors have been saying that there's a life moves thingy. The city of Santa Clara is pushing this. But I'd love for uh, to urge this uh, city of uh, you know, uh, county of Santa Clara to actually influence life moves and city of uh, 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 Santa Clara about this. Councilor Hernandez has been giving guidance on this. Otto Lee, Joe Ellenberg, Chavez have all been talking with life moves. So you do have a lot of clout. 
and they would need to have county, you know, they would have to come to the county for funding. Please tell them that this is not this is a bad location for an intermediate homeless site. This is a bang in the middle of a residential neighborhood. On the plan itself, they plan to put in 60 units of around 200 people with just 27 parking places. This is a busy street and busy intersection. How is it even possible? Just imagine about the noise, the crime that might happen in the neighborhood. And if folks are not aware, I actually urge uh, Supervisor Otto Lee to drive you guys around. He used to live in the neighborhood. And I've also heard from the construction. Next speaker is Jessica. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, hi, this is Jessica. And I'm living in Santa Clara for a few years and I have a two-year-old kid. So I heard about the home key project a week ago and I was shocked since there's no consultation with the neighborhoods where the facilities will be located. So these proposals have major implications on our, our uh, city and neighborhoods. The city must work with both residents and neighboring to find a solution for homeless residents and for the cities. And also this project is too expensive. A super bad location for the residents of the future housing facility is too much and too close to the super heavy traffic. And it's very noise and smell. And finally, I think I will need a detailed plan for the children's safety in the community since it is very, very close to some schools and parks. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. And again, a reminder to the remaining speakers, if you're speaking about home key, please remove your hand now and raise your hand when 14 comes along. Thank you. The next speaker is Danny. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Supervisor. Danny, go ahead. Um, hi. Um, so I'm Dan Danny. Good morning. Um, so here I have I want to share my concern over sites with white ox. Um, so I'm living super close to that. So I not know that probably well. So don't trust the report from contractor companies. That's horrible site for the homeless people. We want to help them, but that site is extremely dangerous. There was a horrible car accident caused a big fire and explosion burned down all the buildings there. That was a, a pretty popular plaza, but everything's gone. It was burned down, explosion. That would be super dangerous for the homeless people if they are going to live there. I think we should find some uh, safe, non that crazy nice, little less traffic site for them, for their well-being. Thank you. Next speaker is Caleb. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I have lived here in the neighborhood for many years. I have sympathy for our house people, and we need a complete, comprehensive solution to homelessness and help homeless people to restart their life. And recently, I heard that some projects here uh, looks to me the same as creating a concentrated center for homeless people. To put the homeless people in a concentrated center is not a solution. Instead, it will create even more problems than it seems to solve. Also, a concentrated center sounds different from concentrated camps created by Nazi for Jews only, but it often reminds me of Nazi camps since it is to target a specific group of people and put them together in a, in a concentrated place. I'm really concerned, disappointed. I'm strongly opposed to any such project. As a matter of uh, of fact, there are many workable solutions to the homelessness, but this solution is clearly the worst one. Please stop it. Next speaker is Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. I'm uh, looking out my uh, window right now um, over on Spring Street, kind of looking out at Heading, and a lot of the homeless out here and I commend them for doing this. They're trying to drag their garbage down near the county building. Uh, the city has removed all the dumpsters out here. Well, there is a couple near a rec center over there, but they're always full. Um, you know, they've also caged off the bathrooms, shut off the water. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, are you guys going to start putting up uh, barbed wire and maybe just start dousing everybody with gasoline out here? Are we going to set this thing up like a concentration camp? This is disgusting out here. And, I, and I'm, I'm just amazed hundreds of people having to use one porta john a pregnant woman out here, and that is the hardest thing to see, um, she uses that bathroom. She got COVID. She got a blood transfusion two or three days ago. Woman should have never been in this situation. There's hundreds of people out here like this, and uh, this is a humanitarian disaster. You people need to act now. 
Next speaker is Brian Kay. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm focused on white oak. It's one peak, but it's white oak. I, I really despise the surreptitious, surreptitious nature of AB 83 and what you're leveraging in it, but 75 units in a 20 by, is a 20 by 20 room, if wall to wall, like a dog town, as others have said, 120 units with bridges across the way will make a shanty town government sanctioned slum. There is only one home key housing code from the state site, and I quote, the units will be in decent, safe, and sanitary condition at the time of their occupancy. Nothing about the day after or cramming. We had a neighbor for years with mental health problems. He fed rats until he had infestations. When he left the feces, filth, and vermin, beggared a hazmat suit. But this was one person in a house, not 75 in a slum. Now, to the sanctimonious, we shared meals, homes, and events with their neighbor, and they have not slowed down since rubbing up shoulders. So I think I have some, I know something about the state of mind that leads to homelessness. Nobody, I believe, will stay homeless for long unless they have severe mental health. The next speaker is Mel. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Supervisors, I want to strongly oppose the proposed auto lay home key development of White Oak Lane, which is not on the agenda. We've been told that White Oak Lane is not under the county's purview, but your own Office of Supporting Housing Development has been very clear in suggesting that no decision has been made, allowing all of you to avoid any responsibility for now. The cynical and secretive nature in which these home key projects are being pushed forward is explicitly anti-democratic. It is not a coincidence that this project and also Bella Vista and Crestview are located right on city borders in an obvious and cynical attempt to dilute the clear opposition. Over 3,000 people are vocally opposed to this and they have signed our petition to say so. Supervisors, you are elected to represent this community and you need to listen to the voices of the community, although I do not believe that you will do so. It's not enough to label opponents as NIMBYs and blanket dismiss legitimate concerns, which you are hearing on this call. We can solve for the unhoused, we can solve for communities, and we can solve for the county. Please work with Life Moves and the City of Santa Clara to find more. Next speaker is White Oak resident. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm calling in regarding 2335 White Oak Lane. I just want to voice opposition to this site specifically for um, Life Moves. I actually am a huge fan of what Life Moves does, but this site is not suitable. Um, the site is too small. It would need to be 50% larger to meet the guidelines set out in Life Moves playbook. Uh, the site and the project cost is too expensive. This will be one of the most expensive uh, costs per bed, but dropping in 10 buildings, three stories each for 234 individuals in a dense residential area of a lot that size is, it's too small. It is not suitable. There are better locations available. One of my neighbors owns commercial property elsewhere in Santa Clara City. He said he even offered that to the city at half the cost of the White Oak site. So I strongly encourage you, please look for other sites than this one. This is not suitable for the reasons that many of my neighbors have mentioned. Thank you for your time. David, if you can hold one minute. Supervisor, sure, go ahead. Supervisor Lee, the site that was just mentioned, um, as I see it, that's not an item on our agenda today. That's the city of Santa Clara item, is that correct? That is correct. And so that would be appropriate to be uh, discussed at this time, correct? Thank you. Okay, so for the remaining speakers and about 20 speakers just joined on, um, for the remaining speakers, the property that was just mentioned by the prior speaker um, is not on the agenda and it's not within the County of Santa Clara's jurisdiction. It's the city of Santa Clara's jurisdiction. Um, of course, you're welcome to speak on anything you want to speak. I just wanted you to understand what board you were addressing at this time. Um, that we have no decision making in that particular instance. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Next speaker is Evelyn. I'm unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Evelyn, are you there? Okay, we don't have Evelyn. We'll move on. Next speaker is Amy. I'm unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Amy, are you there? Okay, we don't have Amy. Next speaker is Jonathan Van Kloot. I'm unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. 
Good morning. Yes, I am a Sunnyvale native, uh, 48 years. My partner and I were both born right here uh, almost 50 years ago, and we are vehemently opposed. We live just a few blocks away from this White Oak project. Um, clearly, the community is strongly opposed to this. Thousands of people have signed uh, both wet and you know, even more digitally uh, against this project. It is very clear that this has been uh, being pushed through in a way to avoid anyone finding out about it. Most of us only even discovered that this was a thing a couple of weeks ago. And we've seen examples from, for example, Milpitas and Mountain View, both of very similar projects and the just abject disasters that they have quickly evolved into. Um, so for all the reasons everybody else has already stated, plus countless more, I'm sure I could go on about, uh, please use any influence you may have, even if it's not your direct decision to influence those who do have a decision on this to vote no or otherwise uh, move or reject this pr proposal. We're going to circle back to Evelyn. Evelyn, I'm unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I want to talk about uh, the White Oak Lane Home Key project as it is not on today's agenda. I'm living close to that area and I talked to my neighbors. None of us know about this. We were all so surprised and looks like there's a huge transparency gap about how this project got processed. And uh, um, I'm standing with the 3,300 wet signatures that's strongly opposing the Home Key project at White Oak Lane and plus the uh, Bella Vista and the Christville. As the, as the residents of this area, uh, we urge uh, you to, uh, uh, to address our concerns about the safety issue to the children, about the suitability of these bad locations, uh, about like the transparency about the process, and we urge uh, the supervisors to listen to the voice of the community and vote no to this home key project. Next speaker is Mike Tang. I'm unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, this is Mike. I'm li I'm live in the Santa Clara. I have a. I think it's very important for everybody to support the homeless. But I have a two concern here. First, uh, this project is not under a very transparent process. Nobody knows this process should be go, but this project should be started very soon. So our community hope everybody can engage into this decision making and have long time to consider. Second, I think the uh, Santa Clara County have a very pure record to manage such supported housing facilities. A home site in Milpita Second Street studio in San Jose and the residence uh, in places. How can we trust them to run this new place here? So other than management uh, the issues, we are Asian people here. We are afraid that there are some uh, Asian hate crimes happened recently. How the community, how the county can manage that? Thanks everybody. Thank you. Next speaker is Ratnendra Pandey. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Ratnendra Pandey. I live near 2035 White Oak Lane. Oh, by the way, I want to check, can I be heard? Yes. Okay, uh, so yes, I live near uh, uh, 2035 White Oak Lane and I'm very, very strongly opposed to this project. It came as a surprise. Nobody knew in my neighborhood and uh, means uh, more than the 3,300 signatures, wet signatures have been collected in its opposition and for various reasons that speaker before me have already explained in great detail what are the negatives of uh, 2035 White Oak Lane as a site for homeless uh, housing. And, uh, you know, I really uh, hold all you uh, people in high esteem and uh, uh, Supervisor Lee, you personally met me when you were canvassing for your campaign and uh, you assured me to take uh, good care of this neighborhood. And I think this is a chance for you as well as for other members of uh, this team to uh, listen to the people and oppose 2035 White Oak Lane and other uh, uh, homeless sites that are being built at a wrong place. Thank Next speaker is Thomas. I am unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I have numerous specific objections to this Crestview Hotel project. We collected over 3,300 wet signatures from nearby residents who stopped this project in just the last seven days. This clearly shows that the project transparency was a disaster. According to our estimate, at least 70% of our nearby residents are strongly opposing this project. 
and the current form and transparency. Almost all of those who claim to support the project are people living far away from the proposed site. I don't know why this project is so expensive and still can be justified. The Crestview Hotel costs is over $400,000 per room and over $1.5 million per homeless family when combining three rooms to form a 2B1B condo for them. It is not sustainable or sustainable way to support, to support our uh, friends and homeless people. So this project is the best example of bad execution and leadership at with goodwill. Voting yes, yeah, I strongly urge you along with our three, more than 3,000 voters. Next speaker is Ben S. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Our tax dollars should be spent more effectively on home, uh, homeless housing solutions at a less expensive locations and not paying top dollars, especially without, like many folks have mentioned, without proper planning place. And our goal is to provide sustainable service for homeless, not just now. The current plan is poorly communicated and leaves no time for the neighborhood to voice feedback and concerns. Lack of clear sustaining budget plan and accountability. I want to emphasize the accountability of future operations. This is a clearly a flawed and misconducting office, if not incompetence. A hasty decision can create much severe long-term consequences for all of our community. I'm calling out for a more sustainable proposal, getting multiple rounds of community feedback. And before that, I urge the committee members to vote no on Crestview and all the other uh, Santa Clara Sunnyvale locations. Next speaker is Vanessa. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Vanessa. Uh, so uh, the local neighbors were ambushed with, oh, I'm a Sunnyvale resident, by the way. So the, lo the local neighbors were ambushed with the Home King News. And yet they were able to uh, sign 3,000 physical signatures to oppose this decision. So please supervisors, please help and listen to the local neighbors. What I don't like most about this project is that the uh, executive people keep sugarcoating the reality with children, but they don't um, publish exact data of how many percent of children will be living on this site. In addition, there is no drug screen and um, I want to say that homeless children are as, as important as any other children. They deserve a clean environment. So if, if we're talking about the children, then please bring very detailed plan about how is the drug, drug, drug uh, screening and the, the neighbors, the, the, the tenants are selected on the site. Thank you. Next speaker is Megan Roy. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, hello, this is Megan. Uh, I live on the Lily Avenue, and I literally knocked every door on my street as well as the Myrtle Street. And no one single um, resident here have heard anything from the city. So we are so surprised at the, the uh, White Oak Line project, there is no communication at all. And all of the people I talked about, besides the two neutral, all the others are, are strongly opposed this project. So please address our concerns, which has uh, 3,300 white signatures. As well, I, I have another question that you, you mentioned this project is not under the county control, but I disagree with it. Because from the Santa Clara City's website, they said they are seeking the uh, cooperation with the county together to, to do the project on the White, White Oak Line. And the project is currently under the county's review. So I disagree this part. So I, I believe you have the jurisdiction on this. Thank you. Next speaker is Jenny Z. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, supervisors. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to vote no for the White Oak Lane project, uh, which is not on today's agenda. Uh, it might not be the first time I'm meeting to talk about this, but I still like the voice to be heard. Uh, the White Oak Lane is a very busy and narrow corner lot with cars parked around and blind points for both passengers and drivers. Uh, there used to be five small business shops at the proposed White Oak Lane location. Because the traffic is very busy and location is bad. Unfortunately, and uh, but not surprisingly, a car ran into this business plaza in 2015, uh, which caused a very big fire and bent all the shops into ashes. Considering this, the location is too dangerous for the safety of the homeless people. So uh, 
please avoid to choose such a dangerous place for the homeless. Thank you. The next speaker is Tina. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Tina, are you there? Okay, we're gonna move on. Next speaker is Ali. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hey, supervisors. As a Santa Clara resident, I strongly oppose the Home Key Project proposal. I urge all the supervisors to vote no and put pressure on other decision makers. You have heard from many residents loud and clear that there's no transparency in this proposal and people don't want this to be built in the neighborhood this way. We need a more transparent process and we need more communications to our residents. Thank you. The next speaker is Gall. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Gall, are you there? Okay, it doesn't look like Gall is there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Scott Hayden. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Scott, are you there? Looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, we'll move on. The next speaker is Alex. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Alex. Yeah, I'm right here. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering, have you guys ever thought, of, I mean, maybe this is not our agenda, but I don't have anywhere to go. I mean, just, I want to talk about this home key project. It's, I mean, somewhere on the El Camino Rio. Um, I mean, nobody talks about the small homeless business owner, you know, we were just standing there, we're holding this position and then, you just all of a sudden put two homeless shelter on the streets. You know, there are a lot of homes homeless already. And I just don't know how, how would you do it? Are you going to drive us into homeless or what? You know, this is going to definitely destroy, you know, destroy our business. You know, just think about it, right? No, no one want to come to our store for anything. Cause it's like homeless is going to set up tents on the street. I just don't know, man. I mean, all of a sudden you just put two, imagine, right? How would it going to, you know, destroy our situation here? I mean. I don't know what to say, but just think about it, right? That's just not right. It's not right at all. And you should really think about how you're going to do with small business owner, you know, just you know, think about it. Next speaker is Saul Martinez. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Saul, are you there? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes. Um, I am a lifelong Sunnyvale resident and a current Stanford student. I am here in strong support of the proposal today um, and above all of my community members and their right to a home. Um, this uh, proposal has been communicated, in fact, for months. And so to claim transparency issues um, simply due to a uh, resident's lack of information that was available um, is really not fair to the county or to the project and its potential. Um, furthermore, concerns about um, safety have really been um, debunked thoroughly as these folks have been living in our community already. We are not bringing in new people. We are simply supporting our communities who are already here to build homes. We should not let prejudice and misinformation dictate our policy. We should instead support every single community member's right to a home here in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Next speaker is Yan Lee. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yan Lee, are you there? Okay, Yan Lee is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Carolyn Sharo. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I am a Mountain View resident. I live near the Crestview Hotel and I am also calling with my strong support for these home key projects. And I'm just really kind of flabbergasted by the misinformation I'm hearing from these opponents. I've also been hearing about these projects since at least February, I just checked my emails. It's not an ambush. People complaining about the cost, but it's coming from state grants. People complaining about the location. These locations are great. They're close to public transportation. They're close to stores. Um, People, I mean, as the previous speaker said, these folks are already living in our community. And if folks are concerned about public safety, getting people and families into safe, safe stable, transitional housing, that's what's best for public safety. Leaving people to fend for themselves in desperate situations, that's not good for their safety and it's not good for community safety. 
We are literally the richest county in the entire country. It is unconscionable that we would not invest money in safe and secure housing for all of our community members. So please vote yes. Next speaker is Richard. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Richard, are you there? Uh, yeah, can, can you guys hear me? Go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, supervisors. So yeah, I'm calling to uh, express my um, disapproval of the Wiling Oak, White Oak Plain uh, project. And the main reason, as uh, many speakers said before, was that uh, you know, this location is you know, outcrowded and it's dangerous. And um, yeah, the, there's a lack of transparency from all parties in terms of communication for this for building this project. And I'm, I'm reading the city's website now, and it says that the, the proposal is actually submitted to the county for approval as well. So I understand that um, it may not be entirely within the county's jurisdiction, but when it comes, I urge you to vote no on this budget. Thank you. Next speaker is Jessica. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, uh, supervisors. I, I'm Jessica and I live very close to the White Oak Lane location. And I strongly disagree to the home key project along the Sunnyvale and the Santa Clara border. I knocked the door along my street and no one have heard that news before like uh, two to three weeks ago. So, uh, the, White Lane, the White Oak Lane location is a very bad place for homeless people to live in. It's noisy, crowded, and very easy to incur the traffic accident. And it's so close to kids' playgrounds and elementary schools. I have a big concern about this. So I uh, I have heard that uh, there are more than like 2,000 2, physical signatures were collected from Santa Clara uh, residentials to uh, oppose this project. I just hope our voice to be heard. Thank you. Next speaker is Colleen Hausler. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Colleen Hausler, 29-year resident of Sunnyvale. I'm speaking in support of permanent supportive housing on El Camino at the Sunnyvale Mountain View border. With thousands of unhoused people in our county, each city and neighborhood must do all we can to accommodate the crisis. Whether the income residents are employed or not, Oops. bodied everyone is a chance to stabilize their lives with a safe, comfortable place to sleep, appropriate plumbing, and a window is a wonderful benefit to help heal. Once the incoming residents move in, they will no longer be homeless, and chances of healing or ability to increase their income goes way up. Thank you. Next speaker is Steve Schramm. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Steve Schramm. I'm a 40-year resident of the area, and I just wanted to call in support of the uh, Crestview conversion and the uh, Bella Vista conversion. I'm sure you already know. Uh, you've heard the pros and cons, so I won't bother repeating them. But I just want to observe that it's very easy to be against things and to create fear. I think we should be for things, and I think this is a good thing for our community uh, to give these people a place to live. Thank you. Next speaker is Lewis. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. So I'm expressing my strong oppose on these uh, live move projects. I live within 300 yards, less than 300 yards from the White Oak Lane um, location. I've ensured you I've talked to the neighbors, long term neighbors over here. Nobody have heard about this um, just uh, like a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is a really bad location for 0 0.3 acres um, square footage, uh, sorry, acres. And then um, it's an irregular shape. It's very close to the expressway, very noisy, and it's very close to the neighbor, uh, the neighborhood. So I want to um, share my um, opinion that this is not the right place. Um, please, we support the homeless project, but please find a reasonable place and please ensure the local neighbors will support it for sustainability. Thanks. Next speaker is Bill Chan. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I would like to make sure I'm, I can, can I be heard? Yes. yes. Thank you. So I'm a Mountain View resident. I live uh, very close to the Crestview. I'm a dad of uh, twin kids. 
eight years old, one boy and one girl. In general, I would say, you know, everyone deserves a place to live. That is right. But look at the, my situation. My kids, they go to school every day. I'm busy at work. Three, uh, 3 p.m., the kids go work and walk themselves. I'm highly concerned the home key project, Crestview, impose the potential safety risks on my kids. I have no solution. And that is going to be my everyday pain point. And I'm glad that I heard the voice from another small business owner. Putting this kind of project in this kind of neighborhood, the impact of the neighborhood and the kids, about 2,800 kids in the neighborhood is incredible. And how do we spend our tax money efficiently? Is this the right place? I would appreciate you could look. Next speaker is Mike Cerrone. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Mike, are you there? Okay, we do not have Mike. We'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is Devika. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm a resident. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a resident of um, White Oak Lane and I'm opposing to the project on 2035 White Oak Lane. There has been little to no transparency and information about these home key sites on White Oak Lane. And as someone who lives right next to it, I would like to raise my concern of how close this is to schools, parks, child playgrounds, and high density residential areas. I'm a parent of a three-year-old and one-year-old. And how are we going to ensure the safety of the kids? How, how will I will be able to let my kids out and play on the street when there are going to be homeless projects like probably less than one block away. It is for my kids and for the safety of all kids in the neighborhood. And there are several thousand residents who are opposing to this electronically and through web signatures. Why has there been no formal communication from the city and the county? And when I do find out, it is only from my neighbors and not from the city or county. There are, there are also studies from um, New York University that state. Next speaker is Linda Grand. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. And Linda, if you, hold, Linda, if you can hold just one second, David. Um, sure. We currently have 65 more speakers being uh, lined up to speak. I just want to remind all the people that you're, if you're choosing to speak now on items 14 or 15, which is the East El Camino Real property in Mountain View, I'm sorry, the 901 and 903 El Camino Real property in Mountain View, or the 3550 El Camino Real property in Santa Clara, you're using your time now so that you will not be able to speak when I have 14 and 15 come along. You can choose not to speak now if you wish, and you can speak um, when we handle items 14 and 15 after lunch. I just want to let everybody know that. To keep everything fair, nobody gets to speak twice about the same thing. Thank you, David. Go ahead. Cindy? Uh, Linda, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm a city of Santa Clara homeowner and I highly support the home key project on El Camino. I think we really need to help our unhoused. There's such an affordability issue in our county. And I think it is really important to provide housing for our community members. It helps their safety and ours. So I am big support of this El Camino home key project. And um, I know there are others opposed, but safety concerns have actually shown not to be a large Large issue and it's more unsafe for the unhoused to be on our streets than to have them in a home. So please support this project and help address the affordable affordability issues in our community. Thank you. Next speaker is Zhijian Lu. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, um, uh, I'm a resident near the Crestview uh, Hotel. So uh, I strongly oppose this project. I attend the community meeting on uh, October 27. I found that uh, that com uh, the community meeting actually provide a lot of uh, misinformation to the public. I have sent my opinion yesterday to all the supervisor regarding those misinformation. A lot of uh, support I can hear is that they saw this project is going to support the local homeless. The fact is not true. Um, and I, I, I post my... Uh, uh, and then also this is the project at the long, serving the long, uh, homeless people at the long places. PS, PSU, uh, PSH housing is for those people uh, have a series who cannot find a job or cannot work. work. So, uh, but we need those people who can able to work, who can have income at this prime location. 
So this is a totally wrong place for the long people. We are, uh, we are still can help other homeless. The next speaker is Pomeroy Owners Association. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Okay. They have not unmuted. We'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is Joni. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning. I live in the neighborhood behind the El Camino project by the DMV, and I support this project. People without homes are part of our community and we need to support them. Many have full-time jobs, but have been priced out by the ever rising rents. Life Moves is an excellent organization that I support through my church and will do a good job running this project. I urge you to um, vote yes on this project. I yield back my time. Next speaker is Anna Sherudo. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, my name is Anna Sherudo and I'm calling on behalf of the Bay Area Council. The council respectfully urges your support for Project Home Key developments. Studies from across the US have shown that permanent supportive housing is an effective tool in ending homelessness and improving people's health. It can also lead people to use fewer emergency services which ultimately reduce public costs. For example, in Santa Clara County alone, there are about 2,800 units of supportive housing. Over the last three years, more than 96% of people in those units were still housed at the end of the year. Studies have also shown that placing the highest need people in supportive housing reduces annual per person costs by more than $42,000 a year. Project Home Key has a proven track record of getting people off the streets and into housing. For these reasons, we respectfully urge your approval of the proposed Project Home Key developments. Thank you. The next speaker is Patricia Evans. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a 40 year resident of the county and also the sister of a former homeless drug addict now living in supportive housing. I've heard a lot of concerns about safety, especially of children. I have met all the residents of my brother's facility. I know all their stories and I have never felt unsafe going there. Some of the residents are mentally challenged. Some of them are veterans. Some like my brother are recovered. Some of them are disabled. Why do I feel safe? Because everyone has been vetted. I had to jump through hoops to get my brother in that facility. With housing so short and so many homeless people, the organizations like Life Moves that are planning this project would never squander a precious resource on someone who poses a threat. I am sure that they will make sure that it is the project is well vetted and well managed. So I strongly support it. The next speaker is Deepa. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Deepa and I have been Santa Clara residents for many years. I have seen the city grown a lot in past years and I do understand that city is doing this for homeless people and I'm not against it. But you should also understand that these sites are for the homeless people should not be in the middle of the city, you know, impacting the existing residents. You can definitely find better sites reasonably away from existing neighborhoods. Also, in the name of affordable housing, builders and their lobbyists will be keep asking for building these projects, but it is just a business and profit for them. They don't really care for existing neighbors. Also, these proposals are often finalized behind the people's back and there is very little time for public to claim it and it's all done in transparent way. So just please stop doing it. I strongly oppose this. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Carol Lee. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I would like to vote for Carol, you need to get closer to your microphone. Hi, can you hear me? A little better. I would like to vote in to the Home Key Project in Elk Ridge Canal, Gallagher Spring, and Black Cloud Spring. And in general, I just want to voice my opposition to how the county engage and communicates with concerned residents. First of all, we know the severity of homeless problems, and we, of course, wish to return to normal life. However, there is no back and forth communication between the county and and also previous outreach meetings to look for misinformation, trying to hide nexus and happening between other country sites. And at the very prior speakers who supported the um, homeless sites were misled by this outreach meeting. 
just name the field, the home project does not necessarily set up a good way for the home project. Next speaker is May. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is May. I'm calling in to disagree the home care project in White Oak Lane. I appreciate the effort from city and county to help unhomed people, but this place is not a good one for such a project. It is in the high dense residence area and itself is very tiny and crowded for so many, for proposed so many people to live in without any parking place, not so many parking place. So I can imagine like there will be like more, more cars uh, parking in the uh, street, you know, and to, okay, anyway, it is also far away from any public transportation. It is not a good place. Yeah, please heard our, our voice. Thank you. Next speaker is Janice Bonello. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Janice, are you there? Yeah, sorry about that. Go ahead. Me? Okay, hi, my name is Janice. I've been working directly with the unhoused population for over seven years now. And I just wanna quickly humanize the population as unfortunately a lot of the comments today have humanized um, people in our own community that are our neighbors. Um, there is a gigantic need for permanent supportive housing. A lot of our families, seniors, and individuals who are hardworking people sadly only make income that's under $1,000. So I fully support both the Crestview and White Oak communities, especially if they're going to be permanent supportive housing. Project Home Key Mountain View has been a great help, um, although 90 days is not enough to help some people get housed. So if you do plan on making this permanent supportive housing, please make it affordable. Please make it by the person's income and not just a general um, amount. And please, please remember that our unhoused community are humans just like you and me. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Paul, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning, uh, uh, Supervisors. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Is this public comment? Yes, this is public comment. Oh, oh, okay, all right, all right, thank you. Um, what I wanted to share was um, just my sorrow and my grief as to what happened with uh, Council Member uh, Armendares. Uh, that was, uh, uh, considering the emails that I sent off a month ago, I feel a sense of guilt that somehow or another I could have prevented that had somebody just listened to me as to what I was saying. And nobody, nobody listened. I stated it very specifically in the email and I was refused help and assistance. And as a result of that, it allowed that to happen. I think there needs to be some accountability with regard to that because I asked for help. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy Kelly. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm a resident in Santa Clara for more than 10 years now. And I strongly vote no to the home key project. Uh, also, I stand together with me is other small business owners. Uh, this location is not good for the home key project. Uh, we vote no for, and with other 3,000, more than 3,000 web signatures vote no on this project. Thank you. Next speaker is Sally. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Sally Younger. I have lived in Santa Clara County for 40 years. I am a resident of Mountain View and a homeowner. I strongly support the Crestview project and the other Oak, whatever one, um, and all the homeless projects that you've got on the table. Um, I think that uh, it's important to make people understand that homeless people, people who have lost their homes, are no more dangerous than people who have homes. They're part of our community and all this reaction about homeless people being dangerous is just misplaced fear 
and prejudice. And I'm really sorry to hear all that being shared on this public comment. Um, but please do as much as you can to support the homeless. Thank you. Next speaker is Jonathan. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Jonathan, and I am a Mountain View resident for close to 40 years and um, strongly in support of uh, um, all of the Project Homekey projects and all of the efforts to house our homeless population. They are people. They deserve a home. And these are great locations. These are great ideas. We have housing available. Let us house them. I also would like to express my sympathy to all of the NIMBYs in this chat who seem to live in such dangerous neighborhoods that are too dangerous for the homeless people to live, yet perfectly safe for them to live. Um, but yes, I fully support this project and all projects like this. Please support Project Hungry. Thank you. Next speaker is Janet Workman. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm a resident of Mountain View and a homeowner, and I also strongly support the Crestview project. And um, I agree with what earlier speakers have said about the wildly exaggerated fears being a result of real misunderstanding and misinformation about these projects. Um, we need this permanent supportive housing. Um, it will not, it, these people will not be homeless people, they will be housed people. And like other permanent supportive um, housing in the city, they will be good neighbors. Um, thank you very much for supporting this project. The next speaker is Winnie. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Winnie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Winnie. I'm a mother of two young kids. I live in Mountain View. Um, yeah, Home Key Project is very close to my home. Like all my neighbors, no one in our circle was informed of this until two weeks ago. We have they think the project is way too rushed and the neighborhood engagement is severely lacking. No one of, in our online group of sounds of concerned residents have received notice by the city. In the past two weeks, there are more than 3K physical signatures and 4K online signatures collected from residents who will know on the project. This is not right to move forward until most of the Mountain View residents have had a fair chance to be informed and participate in the decision-making process. I strongly urge you to vote no on the project. Thank you. Next speaker is Hotin. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I am a resident in Santa Clara and I strongly oppose to build homeless housing in those areas with such high residential density. Uh, for such a project, the most important thing is the residents' voice. However, they never collected feedback from the residents. One major concern is the cleanliness and safety. There are many schools and parks nearby, and this home key project will put the kids in danger. Uh, also, Santa Clara has a high cost of living. There are other areas less expensive, so it's more suitable for homeless people. There are many better locations for homeless housing, and I don't understand why it has to be built at Santa Clara. Uh, Palo Alto and San Jose build a homeless housing at a, at a non-residential area. I think that's the right thing to do for Santa Clara. Um, so um, people don't save and uh, taxpayers will move out, small business will move out. So please help us oppose the home key location selection. Thank you. Next speaker is Tina. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I live very close to the Santa Clara White Oak Home Key Project, and I heard about it two weeks ago. Then I read a lot about the proposal, and I feel extremely angry, not for ourselves as a local resident, but for homeless people. And I strongly disagree with the project. This site is super small and have a very bad transportation condition. While I'm looking at the building plan, I can't believe my eyes. 
240 units in such a small place is literally cages. Is that true? Is that a way how we treat poor people who really need help? Why we spend that much money to be such a small and uncomfortable place? We should use money to improve their life, buy a larger, safer place, get more facilities for them, instead of using all of the money to get things blend. The homeless are also human. Please don't put them into cages. If you truly care, please find a better place for them. Well, no to this project. Next speaker is Milo Trouse. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Milo Trouse. I'm a member of Livable Sunnyvale. Um, I have a baby on the way. And um, I'd like to point out, you know, safety wise, that, that the status quo of people living kind of scat like wherever they can find somewhere is extremely unsafe. Like there, there are no safety guarantees there. Kids could be assaulted. So, I mean, I'm not saying that they like, so, so this intervention is a major improvement. Um, and I actually grew up across the street from a like intermediate rehab facility and it was safe. I felt good. You know, it worked. These are people who are, are wanting to better their lives. They just need society to give them a chance. And that's what we should do. So please, yeah, let's th th move forward with this intervention. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Hayden. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Scott. Scott, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Go ahead. You can hear me, he said. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I'm. this is public comment, so I'm not specifically addressing any of the sites. I just want to express my dismay at the uh, organized opposition to helping our less fortunate neighbors. Uh, a lot of these people are commenting that they have 3,000 signatures, and I googled it up, and, and I found that the population of Santa Clara County is uh, 1.9 million people, and I don't think 0.0015% of the population should torpedo this plan or any plans to help our homeless neighbors. If anything, what we should be doing is doing is building more places to house our unhoused neighbors, and the fact that people are talking about the homeless as if they're dangerous criminals is is just it just makes me sick it makes me so sad to hear people talk like that next speaker is william huang i am unmuting you you'll have one minute to speak please go ahead hello can you hear me yes hey yeah so i just want to call in. so i'm a resident of santa clara so the most uh, i'm also talking about like the home key projects uh down the white line uh, the white key lane um, and I think the issue I have the biggest issue is the transparency issue. I think the fact that the volunteers were able to collect thousands of signatures over a single weekend is a testament of how poor a job the city is doing. Um, and there were concerns about misinformation. And I think the like the solution to misinformation is always to have more information and more transparency so people can have like a full discussion about the issues they care about. Um, and the last quarter just mentioned like 3,000 people is not a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. But how many people did like were actually aware of these proposals? Right. So I, um, given this, I think the county should delay the vote and uh, consult the public more. Thank you. Next speaker is Grace. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Grace, are you there? Okay, we don't have Grace. We'll move on. Next speaker is Claire Delta. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm a Milpinas resident and still want to say no to the Santa Clara Mountain View Home Key Projects. As a similar site was built already close to my house, which puts lots of safety issues to the residents close by. We cannot go outside during the night. It's very, very creepy that strongly hurt my normal life. We don't want the disaster to repeat. And uh, 
um, ruin the Mountain View Avenue and Santa Clara areas? Please vote no. Next speaker is Jeremy. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, supervisors. I'm a Briarwood resident. And I hope everyone will be treated equally in our community. However, I'm opposing the White Oak Lane location of the Home Key project as it is against the proposal. Apart from all the transparency and financial concerns that prior speakers have brought up, the White Oak, Lake, uh, the White Oak location is not an ideal place at all for such a project. First, that piece of land is too small to hold up anything about like 10 units and way too close to the Lawrence Expressway, which will be extremely noisy. Also, for the residents nearby, we all know there was a car crash, which eventually led to a fire burning down the entire plaza just years ago. This is not a solution for future residents who will live there and will put the residents in the building into danger. For the supporters of the location who spoke earlier, especially for those who don't even know the name of the location, I urge you to go ahead, take a drive, and take a look at the location in person instead of just saying, great, let's support. The fake pretended kindness just make me sick. In the end, it seems to be... Uh... Next speaker is Tom. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. I strongly oppose the, all these three sites for Home Key Project. Nuclear weapons will help you win the war against uh, immediately against small country. But can we do that? No. We have much, much better ways we can communicate. We do not want wars to destroy everyone. Don't just look at the positives, like project will help to accommodate a couple of homeless people, but at what cost? Is it scalable? Open your mind, please. Use some common sense and do not just represent the community and you are all actually spreading misinformation if you are hearing to the other people's comment here. So please, and please prove that you live nearby. And even if you do live nearby and you support it, you are only part of the very, very tiny portion of our neighbors and go talk to your neighbors, please. I, I believe that there are much, much better ways to help homeless people without ruining the, the community. And it is cheap to show your love uh, you, you, if you do not need to pay for it. Thank you. Next speaker is Lily. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, I'm a resident in Santa Clara and I live really close to White Oakland um, site that has been, uh, is planning to turn into a home people project and I disagree on the selection of the site. The homeless people, they deserve a better living place and um, unlike like a cell or a cube like on, that only uh, afford for a few beds and uh, the safety issue to our community is also very obvious. The children um, they, now they, keep, they can play on the playground of free of concerns, but with those homeless people and they are like the strangers to our neighborhood uh, constantly. We don't know what's their background, what's their health condition. Um, that's a big concern to our community. So I urge uh, vote no on this uh, project, including the Mountain View and uh, the Bella Vista uh, in project, thanks. Next speaker is Allison Biggs. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'm just calling. I'm a, I'm a resident in Los Altos and I fully support the Home Key Project. Um, you know, everyone's talking about the homeless, like there's some certain group of person, but that could be you tomorrow. So many people in this area live on the line between homelessness and being housed. Um, it's really crucial to put a project like this in a neighborhood, a residential one, because it makes it a home. We are talking about creating homes for people. And then these people will now be housed and part of the community. Um, these homeless people are not monsters. It is not something to fear. I support this project 100%, and I only wish more were being created. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy Chow. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Amy, are you there? Uh, yeah, this go is ahead. Amy. Yeah, uh, I'm here to, uh, I think I'm I'm supported at Home Key Project. However, I think uh, the city council should consider move Home Key Project to, uh, uh, to uh, far away from a uh, resident area because I think, uh, the homeless is danger because according to housing to kick government.org data, 
uh, for homeless people, there are 42% have an emotion condition, 35% are drug and uh, alcohol, 33% uh, they are uh, they they uh, they are like a stress disorder, and uh, there are a lot of uh, data there. They are dangerous and a personal experience. I used to live in uh, San Francisco. I I being like harassed by a lot of uh, homeless people. That reason why I moved to Santa Clara, and also for people who talking about, I think they miss up what is uh. Uh, they miss out what is uh, homeless and uh, uh, the difference between affordable. Next speaker is a caller ending in 9560. I am unmuting you. You will have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Caller ending in 9560. Okay, nothing there. We'll move on. One moment, please. Next speaker is Steven Ortega. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning. Steven, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, I'm a resident of the county near Mountain View, and I'm just calling in to express my unreserved support for the Crestview Home Key Project and the Home Key Projects under discussion today generally. Um, we're all here today because the housing market in this state and in this region in particular is broken. It's driving low income families into homelessness. And these projects are a golden opportunity to break from piecemeal solutions and actually get to the root of the problem. We're using state money with the cooperation of the owners of these um, hotels. And this is an opportunity that is not going to come around again. We need to utilize it now to make this problem um, actually solvable. We are hearing today from a lot of people who won't be satisfied until the homeless are located on the dark side of the moon, but this is, these are our community members. We need to act now to support them and make sure that everyone can live in this community, including longtime residents. Thank you. Next speaker is Chuck Frawley. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, yeah. I'm a 20 year resident of Sunnyvale and I lived not too far from the uh, Crestview property. And I encourage the supervisors to approve uh, the Crestview and Bella Vista projects. They'll provide a lot of much needed housing uh, for the most vulnerable residents of our community, and I strongly support them. Thanks. David, if you'll hold on just a minute. What sure. I'm going to do, do as chair, we have many, many more items on our agenda that many people are waiting to hear. I'm going to cap the speaking to three more speakers, which will be 11 o'clock. And then we will pick up all remaining speakers at the end of the agenda, so as to be fair to everyone. So three more speakers at this time, and to the people waiting, um, we will take your comments at the end of today's agenda. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Next speaker is Leon Nugent. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, dear, uh, dear supervisors, uh, I know it's urgent to solve homeless problems uh, in uh, California, and I myself was uh, working as a volunteer to help them. However, I, I strongly oppose the home key project in a dense area such as in Mountain View. So previous outreach meeting heavily fully addressed questions and concerns from the local uh, neighborhood, especially they uh, provide some uh, missing information. For example, they uh, give us uh, a low income affordable housing as a good example. However, we know that the low income affordable housing is totally different from the permanent supportive housing. So we wish the fully um, local residents can fully engage into the decision making and uh, uh, and uh, we can make it a success rather than a disaster to the neighborhood. Thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer T. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, in observing this, what I'm noticing is that may be a problem in the outreach meeting process. I mean, maybe that can be solved somehow. Um, I've observed that there is no back and forth interaction during the outreach meetings. Um, and as you know, for full communication, you really need and require that back and forth interaction. Um, I think everything's well intended from the county um, and from the residents. But I think they're talking past each other. A question is posed and not answered. I have some ideas help in this interaction. Um, so I would want to suggest some items um, offline that might be helpful. But again, I think the outreach process is flawed. And that's why you're encountering a problem here. The parties are talking past each other. 
questions are not getting answered. So again, something that we might want to look into for the future. Thank you. The last speaker is Mike Sarone. I am unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I'm speaking as a member of both Livable Sunnyvale and the Sunnyvale Democratic Club. Both organizations strongly support uh, permanent and transitional housing projects like the Crestview uh, project in Mountain View. I've been appalled at the lack of compassion and outright hostility exhibited uh, on these calls uh, against the most unfortunate people in our neighborhood and the high level of misinformation. Do we really feel safer with neighbors living uh, in desperate conditions outside under bridges or whatever? Uh, that certainly doesn't make me feel safer. Uh, regarding transparency, we have followed these projects for months. Uh, it has hardly been a secret project, uh, projects and uh, there have been many outreach meetings. To state the obvious, if you give a homeless person a home, they are no longer homeless. I hope you will support these developments. Thank you. And that concludes this portion of our requests to speak, Mr. President. Thank you. And again, we'll, we'll pick up those people wishing to speak on public comment at the end of today's agenda. But we do have a good 20 other different items with other people wishing to speak as well. With that, Dave, we're going to move on to item seven, which is approval of the consent calendar and changes to the board. If you'll please read what we currently have on our update. Certainly. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to hold item number nine to December 14th, 2021. Item number nine is to approve a referral to County Council to report to the board with options for consideration relating to revising board policy 3.68 on donations and sponsorships using county assets. We have a request from President Wasserman to delete item number 11. Item number 11 is to approve county sponsorship of the San Martin Neighborhood Association in the amount of $5,000. We have a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Lee to consider item numbers 14 and 15 concurrently. Item number 14 is a public hearing relating to the purchase of real property located at 901 and 903 East El Camino Real in Mountain View. Item number 15 is a public hearing relating to the purchase of real property located at 3550 El Camino Real in Santa Clara. We have a request from administration to continue item number 17 to date uncertain. Item number 17 is a public hearing relating to the purchase of real property located at 726 Brentwood Drive in San Jose. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to consider item number 24 after item number 19. Item number 19 is to receive a report relating to American Rescue Plan Act proposals. Item number 24 is to receive a report relating to an air quality grant program for local small businesses and nonprofit organizations. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 21 to the consent calendar. Item number 21 is to consider recommendations relating to Afghan refugee resettlement. We have a request from administration to hold item number 25 to this November 16th, 2021. Item number 25 is to receive a report relating to options for advocacy for state legislation for provision of funding incentives to jurisdictions to build housing for the unhoused members of the community. And that concludes my list. Thank you, Mr. Leo. With that, I'm going to look to my board for, uh, we've got Supervisor Chavez, your hand up first, then Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to leave item 46 on consent. Um, this is a response to a referral I brought from March asking County Council to work with the California Massage Therapy Council to update our ordinance and align it with the most recent state legislation regulating massage establishments, massage therapists, and massage practitioners. I really just wanted to say a very sincere thank you to County Council uh, for their work on this. Item 38 is the closeout of the management audit of the Los Altos Hills County Fire. I wanna thank the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Cheryl for all their work on this. I wanna confirm um, and put this on the record that the direction from FGOC from October 14th will be included. And that states that on behalf um, from our meeting of FGOC, we directed that the management audit division receive all direct records pertaining to procurement of goods and services for 12 months following preparation of an off agenda memorandum regarding the procurement of those records with the report back uh, at nine months in June of 2022. I also wanted to recommend that item eight, which is a referral being brought forward by myself and my colleague, uh, Supervisor Otto Lee, regarding inter interim housing be placed on consent 
and that we ask that staff to not only consider properties that the county owns, but consider the purchase of properties that are contiguous to properties that the county owns. On item 22, this is a response back from the unhoused task force regarding equitable distribution. I wanna put the report on consent and ask for an off agenda item, just giving us the timeline of community outreach as this is primarily a community and, and to, to quote Supervisor Ellenberg, a community engagement process that will be kicked off with the timeline for that engagement process. <clears throat> item 24 is a report back on the air quality uh, regarding uh, air quality and the ability to get air filters as we're focused on both COVID and clean air from fires. I'd like to also put that on consent, thank the staff for their work, and then um, ask the staff to report back an off agenda, letting us know about their conversations with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that may also have uh, resources to contribute to our county for the same program. And that would be my additions to consent calendar. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you had your hand raised. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, just wanted to make a couple of notes here. I, I'm fine with um, Supervisor Chavez and, and, and Lee's um, referral on item eight um, being moved to consent, but I'd like to add, I'd like to ask staff to include county owned land in the cities of Campbell and Santa Clara uh, when they come back to us in December. Is that all right with um, the creators of the motion? Of the item? Yes, and actually, I, I I presumed it would be countywide, so I really appreciate oh, you lifting okay. that up. So thank you. Sure, it specifies in the city of San Jose. So yeah, thank you for catching that. Okay, terrific. And uh, item twenty one, I requested uh, to be added to consent, but I, and I just want to make a very brief comment. This was truly an excellent report. It demonstrated really solid research into the specifics of what needs to be uh, addressed to support people who are coming into our county from Afghanistan. Uh, it includes some really broad background research into what other locales across the country are doing to support refugees and it identified gaps that will be addressed with the referral. So thank you so much to um, Zelica Deems Rodriguez and the Office of Immigrant Relations for preparing this report and for your work in ensuring that people who are arriving to Santa Clara County from Afghanistan are wrapped in the best possible care and support. And that is what I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to ask that we hear items 14 and 15 separately rather than concurrently, only because they really are two very different projects in two very different locations, obviously. And um, I think we need to sort of hear them as separate and distinct items. I think the conversations we've had at prior meetings and the public comment that we've had again today is a reminder that it is easy to confuse or conflate or to uh, jumble uh, what really are very different projects in very different circumstances and very different locations that will perhaps require very different approaches. So with all of that, uh, I would simply like to ask that we maintain our uh, separate and distinct uh, consideration as indicated on our published agenda. All righty. And Supervisor Lee, your hand is not raised. So you're okay with what you've heard? Okay, thank you. Uh, we now do have speakers. We're going to limit the speakers going forward, um, except for the uh, public comment ones that we'll hear at the end of the day but all speakers going forward will be limited to 30 seconds. And uh, David, if you can start us on the dozen or so that have registered for the consent calendar. Sure, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. First speaker is Mike Wynn. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I just want to say I strongly oppose this project. Please save this community. The reason is simple. Look at San Francisco. Check the crime rate there and ask the people who live or work there. We don't want Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and the Southern Bay Area to become the next San Francisco. Thank you. And please, speaker is registering to speak now. This is on the consent calendar. This is not on items 14 or 15. 
which is the housing that a lot of people have spoken to previously. So if you've raised your hand to speak now during the consent calendar, you can speak about anything on the consent calendar. The two housing projects are not on the consent calendar. So you need to speak about something else if you wish to speak. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Next speaker is Irene. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, I strongly oppose to the proposal to build a homeless address in the Bay, uh, in the Sunnyville, Santa Clara County. The reason is very simple. If you do really want to support the homeless people, you can provide your own home as to ask them to live inside your house to give them more comfortable place instead of putting them into a very small area in the hotel. Yeah, and uh, it's it's definitely a uh, government need to hear more of the residents residents voice. Next speaker is Mo. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Mo, are you there? Mo is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I was going to try to talk extremely fast, but uh, I can't do much in uh, in 30 seconds about the issues that I would like to talk about. So um, yeah, that's this uh, consent calendar. I'm not sure if item number eight or nine, the one involving the housing, made it on there. Uh, maybe I can squeeze this out really fast. It's, it's bad, guys. Let's go on a vacation. Let's go see what's really going on out at Spring Street. Uh, we need you out there. We, we need you guys to, uh, to help. Okay? Thank you. Next speaker is Brian Kay. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm not sure you understand the consent. I did want to comment, though, that on those who... Um, said that there's misinformation. We are not the richest county. Those are around DC, number one. Number two, 8083 intentionally mitigates CEQA and all local ordinances related to housing quality. When Rotten Robbie wanted to go into White Oak, they had to do public notices, public hearings. This has been surreptitious. There's no if, ands, or doubts about that. That is a lie promulgated by the proponents of this. And um, the other thing is the the, the uh, courthouse is available, perfect site, put him there. Next speaker is Iris Lee. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Iris, are you there? Hi, yeah. Go so ahead. I'm a, yeah, I'm a uh, Sunnywell resident. I'm here in the Santa Clara County. So I'm here to oppose all the three sites chosen for the home key project. Whether you say it's not related, but as the board of the supervisor, you should listen to the residents of this area. This project has no transparency, it's not safe, it will cause a safety issue to the community. Please oppose to those projects. Thanks. David, I'm going to speak to the speakers again. Sure. Please, speakers, please listen to me. If you want to speak about the projects in Mountain View and Sunnyvale, those are items 14 and 15. That they are not on the consent calendar that you should be speaking to items on the consent calendar. If you speak about the projects in Sunnyvale and Mountain View, along with the 100 or so people that spoke earlier, then you will not be allowed to speak again on 14 and 15. We're trying to keep the public speaking process equal for everyone. And it is not fair for people to speak under public comment and then the consent and then items 14 and 15. Thank you. Please go ahead. Next speaker is Agnes Beith. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Agnes, are you there? Uh, yes, but I did want to speak on 14 and 15, so I'll yield my time. Thank you. Agnes. Next speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Board of Supervisors. I'll take 15 seconds on that. I wanted to mention about the AB uh, Assembly Bill 1174 to, mis to ministerialize the approval process for the housing development in jurisdiction, as well as to consider SB 8, 9, and 10 before approving the project 14 and 15. Thank you. Next speaker is David. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I do want to say about the item 14 and uh, I, I post it. Yeah, I will yield. Thank you. Next speaker is Gall. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
I want to speak about 14 and 15. I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Jasmine. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Jasmine, are you there? Jasmine is not there. We will move on. Next speaker is Irene. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Irene, are you there? Okay, Irene is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Richard. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Nothing from Richard. Okay, we'll move on. Next speaker is Danny. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry, Supervisor. I will want to show my opposition against the I mean, Honky Hon project, but as now I got it. It's not a right session. So yeah, I'm going to join again. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tony. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I strongly uh, oppose the computer project, but the, since this is not the correct time, so I will yield later. All right, thank you. Next speaker is Richard. I'll try that one more time. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, pretty much the same here. I also have this objection to the home key project, but just, I will yield. Thank you. Thanks. That concludes our request to speak, Mr. President. Thank you, David. And a reminder to everybody listening, if you spoke on those projects in public comment, you will not be allowed to speak again on items 14 and 15. May I have a motion, please, to approve the consent calendar as we've listed it? So moved. Thank you, Vice President Elford. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. And David, just check me along here. I've got eight has been put on consent, nine has been held, 11 was deleted. Um, moving on, hold on a sec here. 17 was held. Mm -hmm. 24 was consented, 22 was consented. We're gonna hear 24 after 19, 24 was consented, 25 was held, and we'll hear the remaining public speakers um, at the very end after 26. Uh, Mr. President, just to clarify, I have 21 on consent. Thank you, that was mine, yes. Yeah, and 22 on consent and 24 on consent, which was originally scheduled to be heard um, before item 19, I believe, but that is now. Okay, so Supervisor Ellenberg, I believe you wanted to hear 24 after 19. There was a motion to put 24 on consent. Do you wish it taken off consent? Uh, I don't, it's fine. I, I've got um, relevant comments that I'll make during 19. Okay, so we won't hear 24 after consent. David, I'm with you. We've got a motion by Vice President Ellenberg, a second by Chavez. Any further discussion or questions, supervisors? Seeing and hearing none, roll call vote, please, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. He's Welcome muted. back. Yeah, he's muted. Welcome back. Vice President Ellenberg. Muted. Thank you. President Wasserman. Yes. And one more time for Supervisor Simidian. Almost. He's unmuted, but I'm not sure. Uh, Supervisor, can we do a mic check? Are you are you there, sir? Forgive me, I'm having some difficulties here with bandwidth. I believe you called for a vote on the consent calendar. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I am an I vote. My apologies for that. Thank you. And with that, that passes unanimously. We now go on to eight, which was consented. Nine that was held. We now move on to item ten. Consider recommendations re relating to public reporting custody related incidents. And this was brought forward by supervisors Ellenberg and Lee. Any opening comments you wish to make? Supervisor? Yes. All righty. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we'll start by uh, thanking supervisor Lee for partnering with me on this referral to increase transparency and with that, accountability regarding the harms and injuries uh, that individuals in our jails experience daily. The public, of course, was made aware of Michael Tyree's murder by correctional officers while in jail and of the violence committed against Andrew Hogan while in custody of correctional officers, leaving him with a traumatic brain injury and requiring care for the remainder of his life. Unfortunately, the public doesn't generally receive information that would demonstrate 
that these types of occurrences happen on nearly a daily basis. We hear anecdotally from formerly incarcerated individuals and their loved ones of their experiences of harm and violence uh, endured while in custody. This referral is intended to make public any documented de-identified information regarding uses of force against people who are incarcerated. And the information is really necessary to paint a broader picture of, this, of the county system of incarceration, which is particularly relevant as the board considers further actions regarding our local practices around incarceration, pretrial alternatives, and appropriate facilities to maintain public, uh, public safety. So I will uh, make a motion to approve the referral and uh, ask for oh, my support. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Supervisor Ellenberg for inviting me to join her in supporting this uh, important recommendation. I certainly believe the public has a right uh, uh, to know and for us to continue to advocate for the transparency and accountability in our jail uh, incarceration system. By allowing for regular public reporting on any use of force incidents uh, would help shed light on this very important issue. And I want to say thank you and look forward to the staff response on this. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to ask a question of uh, our county counsel, James Williams, which I know the two attorneys that brought this motion forward are aware of. I just wanted to clarify for the record, as far as releasing non-identifying information would not include any details about medical or mental health related lawsuits. And that I assume is the intention of both the motion maker and the seconder. That's correct. Thank you very much. With that, we have one speaker. Oops, sorry, um, Supervisor Watson, let me just, if um, both, let me just use Michael Tyree as an example. He did have a, a significant mental health condition um, that may or may not have been directly related to uh, the violence that was done against him. So are you asking only for examples of uses of force against people that do not have serious mental illnesses? Because that, that's not my intention, but I'm not asking for information that does not include direct uses of force or- Gotcha, thank let me, you. Let me roll that back, sorry. Um, force, uh, force and injuries against um, people who are incarcerated. Thank you for clarification and James, if you'll, of course. <laughs> James, if you'll please weigh in. What I was saying is that information about individuals, medical, mental health related lawsuits would not be released. Is that correct? Cannot, cannot be released. Information um, about people's medical or mental health status, uh, including records or information from their treatment would not be released. Got it. Does that work for you, Vice President Ellenberg? It absolutely does. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. And Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, Supervisors uh, Ellenberg and Lee, this is a, a general question for you. Um, I know the staff will be coming back with a framework and what's lawful and unlawful to, um, to share. And I think you're right. We want to be transparent without, um, without divulging people's personal information where that's not appropriate. We have also been very focused on workplace um, safety as well, what happens to our employees. And my question is, is, is when you're looking at these um, report outs, are you also asking for injuries to our, our staff as well? Or no, that kind of I'm, information? I'm not. I feel that that would fall under under a different category and, and have a different purpose. That's, that's obviously important work as well, uh, but separate from what we're specifically looking for here. And we already do have mechanisms for reporting uh, workplace violence. Well, I think, let, let me ask this, is the point, is the point, because I think one of the questions that I would have is, is the overall safety of the jails should include our employees and to decouple those, those reports seems like you would really not be getting a, a fulsome picture of what's happening. So maybe if you could just take a minute to say what the distinction is and if there's another way to have the conversation, because I do appreciate the point you're raising about the reports. I don't find the reports, the way they come back to us, very transparent or easy to understand, to be honest with you. It's why you and I have brought at least one initiative forward to address that as it relates to the hospital. 
but do, could you just help me sure. understand that? So actually all of this information is already compiled, but you know, both the, the uses of uh, uses of force against people who are incarcerated and examples uh, and instances of workplace place violence. We receive information um, as board members in a confidential format. So what I am asking for is that that information be made public, again, de-identified. I'm, I'm looking for types of injury and harm and frequency of instances. Um, for the workplace violence issues, I don't know if there are um, other, if that's already accessible to the public, if there are other privacy requirements around those, uh, because my focus was on the population that's in our custody. I think, um, so I, I appreciate that. I, I guess what I what I want to make sure of, again, is that the, that the, the picture is very complete Great. in terms of, um, so I'm concerned that the way that you're asking for the information would be just partial information. Mm -hmm. If if you're comfortable with it, I would ask staff to just investigate because I think the point you're raising about how we get that information right now, I'm, I'm kind of going through the reports in my mind and I'm not sure I, I recall all of our um, workplace safety issues and how transparent that is. I, I know we see them in a form that I'm not sure is a, a publicly digestible form but I would very, very much be interested in the staff giving us feedback on the um, the um, the way to do that that doesn't again violate anybody's um, rights. Rights, yes. If you're comfortable with that, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, I'm going to, rather than answering you directly uh, first, I want to turn to. Um, James Williams and ask whether the workplace violence information is already publicly accessible somewhere. There's Cal OSHA related reporting on workplace incidents um, and that is public uh, reporting and it has to be even in fact posted at work sites. Okay, then, then I would say that that's already available and when the report comes back, you might wanna add that information um, for consideration at the same time, but but I'd like to keep this specific referral um, uh, as it is right now on the on the population of incarcerated folks because that's something that we don't currently have. Yeah, and I'm not sure, James, that people would know to go look at that. And the other reason is, again, I, Supervisor Elmberg, I'm concerned that we're not giving a full picture of what's happening in, in custody, but I hear that that's not comfortable for you today. And so I, what I will do is give some thought to that. Um, James, I'll be seeking your counsel on this and perhaps bringing back an additional referral, just again, because I think it's really important that. Sure, let me be a little bit more clear. I'm not opposed to gathering that information. What I heard James say is that it already exists. Yeah, I'm going to take a look and see how easy it is to access and read is my point, because I'm not sure I, I think it is <laughs> easy to access or read. And that's based on research that we did for the other referral. So um, but I'll, I can hold off on that. Okay, and, and I agree that's important. I'm interested in a, in a full picture um, as well. So happy to revisit that if, in fact, it's not as available as, as we both hope that it is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And I will say in, uh, in the spirit of transparency, having as much in the same place as possible is the easiest thing for the public to understand. So Supervisor Chavez, if you're bringing back something, um, I certainly would be in favor of that information being combined, work, workplace violence being combined with what Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee are bring, are, uh, have brought forward. Yeah. Right. Supervisor <laughs> President Ellenberg. So let me um, try a Semitian style to, to bring us all to a, a common place. It, since the material already exists, is it something that can be assembled at the same time? This is a question again for county council and just brought back, not, not combining the information, but essentially having um, two reports so that each is, is clean and we can, um, we, we can look at each individually. And this specific referral really to me is is, um, is important in looking at alternatives to incarceration and why we might want to be investigating 
different avenues um, to keep people who are currently in our custody safe, the, the issue of workplace violence may actually lead to the same conclusion. But again, um, they are separate. But James, what would that look like to bring them back at the same time, bring that information at the same time? James. Well, I think there's a few different things, as I understand the referral as written. Um, you know, there's a request for county council to provide summary aggregate information. Um, that information is available on an annual basis for workplace uh, injuries or incidents uh, through Cal OSHA reporting. And so that, that can be provided certainly on an annual basis. And then there's a referral to the sheriff's office and probation department to come back to the board with some proposals for use of force reporting. And so if there's a request to augment that and ask them to also come back with, um, you know, with options for, you know, incident reporting related to, to employees, uh, I think that can be augmented to the referral. Um, but that would be a question for them to answer. County council doesn't obtain workplace, uh, injury reporting but but there's the at every department level across the county there's the cal OSHA reporting that occurs on an annual basis okay supervisor supervisor chavez does that meet um what you're looking for i think that's a great start and then we can take a look when it comes back and make a decision and um and that'll give me a little time to go back and look at all the information we, we called up as we were looking at workplace violence uh issues so yeah i think that's a great start thank you for being so helpful great happy to do that thank you and i think we're headed in the right direction all right we've got a couple of speakers if we may supervise the committee and i don't see your hand up so i'm going to speakers if that's all right with you thank you sir Thank you, David. Next speaker is Irene. As soon as the timer is up, we will begin. There we go. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I strongly oppose to uh, have the homeless site in the Santa Clara County. Think about the big tech company nearby. They are they are all in the Sunnyville and the Mountainville. I'm sorry, area. I'm going to cut her off, David. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, that's we're talking about item number 10 now. Go ahead, next speaker. Next speaker is Natalie Moore. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Natalie, are you there? Okay, we seem to have lost Natalie. We'll move on. Next speaker is Stephen. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I do want to talk about item 14, so I will yet. Thank you. Next speaker is Lauren Renaud. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Lauren, are you there? Um, seems that Lauren is not unmuting. Okay, we'll move on. Next speaker is Scott Hayden. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Scott, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I... I... Uh, support this motion. I think that uh, people need to know what's happening inside our jails. It feels to me like the the bringing in the workplace violence thing is sort of a deflection, sort of a, well, hey, we might be abusing the prisoners, but you know, what about the guards, don't they? Like that, that information is already accessible. It feels like it's trying to confuse the issue to me. I think we should make this information public. Next speaker is Zach. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Zach McDonough. I'm part of Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America, and I actually created my hospital's workplace violence plan through Cal OSHA. Uh, that information is publicly available. There's a requirement on the time frame in which it needs to be reported, depending on injury sustained uh, by the uh, worker, and those time frames can range from like 24 hours for a serious injury or death, up to 72 hours for less important or less. Um, uh, vital injuries. Um, I don't really see the importance in complete. Next speaker, we're going back to Lauren Renaud. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. My name is Lauren Arnaud. I just want to support the referral and emphasize what was said earlier that often we hear about the worst of these cases or particular anecdotes if we happen to know someone who is affected. But it's really important for the public to be able to see an overall picture of what is going on uh, with use of force for our incarcerated folks. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I appreciate that. We've got a motion by Vice President Ellenberg and second by Chuck uh, Lee. Any other comments, members? Seeing none, may we please have a roll call vote, David? Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on. Nine, that was nine, that was 10. We have a decision to make here in just a moment, board members. We have a report from our county executive, Dr. Smith, and then James, our county counsel. Dr. Smith. Um, in the interest of time, I'll uh, defer. Mike. Thank you, James. No, Supervisor Wasserman. Yes, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I, I heard that uh, Dr. Smith chose not to make a report, but I do have a, a request of him that if uh, you don't mind, I'd like to yes. ask before, before he cedes his time. Uh, thank you. Um, so Dr. Smith, I wanna just uh, better understand the specifics of how the COVID-19 pandemic pay is being provided to county part-time employees as opposed to extra help employees. I'm concerned that the language, uh, uh, as the language was approved on October 5th, that extra help employees can receive up to the full bonus based on the hours they worked, but county part-time employees, on the other hand, can only receive what um, was in their base FTE, even if in fact they did work full-time during um, the periods of interest during the pandemic. So I'd like to request an off-agenda uh, report from you, please, that, uh, that identifies the date range used for analysis of hours worked by extra help employees to set pandemic pay prorating, and a table that lists, number one, the number of county part-time employees by department employed during that same date range, and number two, how many of those part-time employees uh, were scheduled to work above their FTE code during that same time period. And just to be clear, I'd like to see this data across all part-time uh, county employees. And if you could provide that, please, uh, no later than agenda, uh, in an off agenda, uh, no later than December 3rd, um, that will provide uh, me or perhaps my colleagues to follow up with further recommendations to ensure that all of our county employees are treated equitably. Uh, let me try to respond to at least part of that. <clears throat> when the board took action, um, regarding permanent employees. So that's permanent part-time and permanent full-time. <clears throat> the action was to allocate 200 or $2,500 to full-time and then prorate it based on the code's status for permanent part-time. Um, in terms of extra help, we were told by the board after our recommendation that we'd still have to work on a, a mechanism to figure that out based on defining a period of time and looking at how much people work. So that issue will be coming back to the board. So I can't really give you an off agenda report about how that's being done because we haven't done it yet and we need to come back to the board to get approval. When is uh, it coming back to the board? At this point, we don't have a specific time scheduled, but I would imagine it'll be in December, probably the second meeting. In which case, the information that I'm asking for would be rolled into that because we would need, I, I think I, as one supervisor, would like to have that information before me in making a decision. And I don't know that it is clear to our part-time employees that there is more work on this issue to come. They have been told um, that there is nothing else forthcoming, that the plan is what it is, and that if they are part-time, they get their prorated share, regardless of 
working full time, whereas the extra help employees could get that full 2500 if they worked full time during the, the same period. So there's well, a let me, let me try to be clear. We're talking about the difference between permanent part time and extra help. So Correct. Um, from the action that the board took, the permanent part time decision was made that it was going to be allocated prorated based on full time being 2500. But uh, the motion from Supervisor Chavez at the time was that we come back, the staff come back with a proposal for extra help. So from staff's perspective, the full-time decision and part-time decision has been made and we're implementing it for the paycheck on December 3rd. And we still need to come back to the board with a recommendation for extra help. Obviously the board can change your mind if you wanna vote on it. I would suggest you wait until the ARPA item uh, on the agenda because it's not scheduled to be voted on. Right, and I wasn't asking for a vote today just for more information to be able to compare because it's, it's perhaps possible that it wasn't clear. Well, I would say it wasn't clear to, to me that, um, that extra help employees could end up actually with, um, with bigger bonuses than, for example, our part-time nurses who did work full-time during the, the same period. So if, um, if there's an understanding that that decision has been made, I would like to uh, revisit it because I do think that there's an inequity with our uh, part-time help employees. And if it's appropriate during ARPA today, happy to re-raise it there. Um, although, frankly, there are other things that I want to focus on there. If it's coming back to the board in December and can come back with the information that I've asked for, um, that might be an opportunity to revisit. I am not looking to slow down payments to employees. That should move ahead. Um, as if there's nothing else being considered. We have an opportunity if we're going to um, remedy the inequity, we have an opportunity to do that in early 2022. So let me just be super clear that I am not looking to pause, slow down, or hold any of the current um, pandemic paychecks. Okay. I don't think that was a question at the end. That was a statement, correct, Vice President? Uh, well, I'm looking for what the um, thoughts on what the best forward direction is From here Dr. and whether any of my other colleagues are interested in revisiting the part-time yet full-time uh, employee, part-time employees who worked full-time during the period in question. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I, um, I would love to have a conversation about that under the ARPA, ARPA ARPA section. I just think it's more appropriate, appropriate and all that. But yeah, I'd like to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. James, uh, County Council. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that this be moved over to that item since this is really not agendized under this item, but could be discussed um, in the context of that item, or at least partly discussed in Thank the context you. of that item. Thank you. Does that work for you, Vice President? Yep. Okay, we'll, we'll move that over because it's not really under there. And we're aware of the Brown Act. We'll move that on to County Council now. 13. There were no reportable actions taken at the November 1, 2021 closed session meeting. That concludes my report. All right. So we're now at about a quarter of 12. We have items that were to be heard no earlier than 10. We certainly meet that requirement. Is it the board's wish that we continue on? We're gonna hear 14 and 15 separately as stated by supervised committee and earlier. All speakers can speak one time on both. We're gonna take separate votes on 14 and 15, two public hearings. And anyone who chose to speak during public comment on these items may not speak again, so as to ensure the most equality we possibly can among speakers. Board members, do you want to continue with 14 now? Or are we breaking for 20 minutes for lunch? Uh, my suggestion is we 
go on through and see how long 14 takes before we hit 15. Does that work for everybody? Works for me. Okay, it works. So what I'm gonna do is open the public hearing on item number 14 now regarding the purchase of real property located at 901 and 903 East El Camino Real in Mountain View. I'm opening the public hearing, then we'll hear from speakers. Uh, Supervisor Lee, did you wish to make a comment before we went to speakers? And thank you, um, Supervisor, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, since we're splitting these two items ahead, I will ask uh, to let the public to speak on this item first, uh, and maybe I will speak later on before the uh, second item. Thank you. Okay, so I've opened the public hearing item to item number 14 now. We have numerous speakers logging on to speak, and I'm going to caution each and every one of them. If either I or David recognize that you spoke previously, you, you will be cut off at that point. It's 30 seconds per speaker. And again, in fairness to everyone with opinions that may be similar or dissimilar, if you've spoken already on consent or public comment about this item, you may not speak again now. David, 30 seconds. Let's start the group here. I see we've got three dozen on there so far. Okay, go ahead. The next speaker is Richard Mellinger. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good morning, uh, honorable supervisors. My name is Richard Mellinger. Proud to be standing here in support of the Crestview Hotel conversion. Proud to be standing with our unhoused neighbors. Proud to be standing with the members of Livable Sunnyvale and the board of the Sunnyvale Democratic Club, which has endorsed this vital project. We know that housing cures homelessness. Uh, with respect to many of the speakers we've heard earlier, there is a great deal of fear and misinformation about this. The residents will be background checked. This is a safe project. We need this project. Build this project. Next speaker is Young. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Young, are you hey, there? Um, I'm, I'm calling in to, uh, against this project. Um, this, to me, is uh, we, we are not seeing all the information we need to see. And this is spending a lot of taxpayers' money without considering uh, doing a lot of background research. I'm against this, and I'm uh, asking for more transparency and hold on this project, and then picking somewhere else and find better ways to help us, uh, our uh, homeless uh, friend. Um, this is not a good location, and uh, this needs more research. Um, and thank you very much. Next speaker is Scott Hayden. I'm unmuting you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Scott Hayden. Or can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so my name is Scott Hayden, and I live down the street from the Crestview Hotel. When I started seeing notices in the mail and posted around the neighborhood that they were going to convert this into a home key project, I was elated. When I saw a local anti-homeless group flying my neighborhood, spreading fear and uncertainty about possible people with substance abuse issues, I thought, good, let them move in. If we were serious about helping them, we would give them supportive housing to work on any problems they may have. I support this. Next speaker is Natalie Moore. I have unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Natalie, are you there? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm here uh, to strongly oppose the Home Key uh, Crestville Home uh, Project. You know, I'm a, a longtime local resident living here for over 10 years and one block away from Crestview Hotel. You know, we all want to help homeless people. You know, it becomes a national crisis now. But I could never, ever understand why we have to select the locations deep into the high dense residential areas with all the seniors and kids nearby. You know, and also the locations are very close to the main traffic. Next speaker is Kevin Ma. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. As a second generation Chinese American homeowner Mountain View, D5, I speak in strong support of the purchase of the Crestview Hotel for permanent supportive housing. We have a duty to provide the most vulnerable in our community a path forward to a dignified life, not condemning them to a life on the street. I would like to thank the staff who have worked so hard on this important item, as well as my city council and unanimously supporting this acquisition. As such, I look forward to its completion and to similar projects like this and the others on the agenda so we can truly make an integrated welcoming community. Next speaker is Tata. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. My daughter recently moved from San Francisco and now lives with us. She has been harassed and attacked by homeless people. She quit her job in San Francisco and now lives with us in the South Bay area. 
with this home key project, my daughter is scared and all my family are frustrated and live in distress. We are very worried at that. And uh, our beautiful South Bay is becoming a homeless bay. Please stop all the home, home key projects in South Bay, please. Next speaker is Help the Homeless. Uh, I have unmuted you, you'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm speaking, I'm, I'm a resident at Sylvan Park. I'm speaking to urge you to please vote no on Crestview Hotel and other home key projects. This home key project has not worked elsewhere and will not work here. No priorities have been given to homeless people in local area. No drug tests or mental health checks makes it unsafe for homeless people, especially those with kids. And very inefficient way of helping no homeless people and can solve a very small part of the problem. There is no prudence economically or socially. Next speaker is Suzanne Cowan. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I live very close to the uh, Crestview Hotel and I stand in strong support of Project Home Key and the projects. Uh, a greater percentage of these residences will be uh, families, meaning they'll have children. And it'll be a great way to be able to provide these unhoused kids with um, a stable roof over their head. I support it highly. Thank you. Next speaker is Julia Liu. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Julia, are you there? We do not have Julia. Oh, oh one moment, please. Sorry, Julia. If you could raise your hand again, we'll get you back in the queue. Uh, the next speaker is Christine Fitzgerald. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Christine Fitzgerald, Community Advocate for Silicon Valley Independence. The, Go ahead, Christine. The home key, uh, Crestview and Bella Vista um, sites for supportive housing. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Salim. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, Mountain View resident in support. We have neglected our homeless brothers and sisters for decades, and it is our fault as a society that people can fall so far as to have no home. Uh, so to the people with homes calling in to deny others a home, you should be ashamed. I can tell you most homeless people are much nicer than the cruel NIMBYs that are calling in to deny people a home. Our county is better than this. Please approve this project. You know it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Next speaker is Christine Case Lowe. I have unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I am a Mountain View resident for the last 15 years, and uh, my name is Christine Case Lowe, and I am in strong support of this. I am a Girl Scout leader, and I have members of my troop who are worried about their housing status and are feared of becoming uh, homeless. Uh, I also have a child who is severely disabled, and um, there are very few options for disabled people for housing, and I support any um, project that increases housing uh, for the future. Next speaker is Tim McKenzie. I've unmuted you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Greeting supervisors, uh, Tim McKenzie, he, him pronouns. I've been a resident of Santa Clara County for nearly a decade, vast majority of that time in Mountain View and a uh, member of the Mountain View local group of Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America. Huge fan of the project, love it, please vote for it. And I'd also ask that we look for more projects like this in the future, building social housing, public housing, community land trust that provide housing for all as a human right. Uh, thank you very much. Next speaker is Kathy. I've unmuted you, you have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Kathy, are you there? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I muted you. Please unmute yourself. Kathy. Thank you. I'm just doing that. Sorry. Um, I, my name is uh, Kathleen Crow. I'm chaplain at San Jose State working with underserved students there. Um, recent survey shows almost 4,000 are with uh, housing insecure. And um, I definitely agree uh, and support this project. Also trying to understand those who speak in opposition Maybe if there were uh, programs to help uh, the uh, homeless population. Next speaker is Zach. I'm unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Zach from uh, Silicon Valley DSA. In 2018, Santa Clara County published a report called Evidence That Supportive Housing Works. Very interesting. Um, it says that uh, Santa Clara County spends about $520 million annually. Uh, in the first year of Santa Clara County's Project Welcome Home, uh, there was a 55% reduction in emergency room visits. And altogether, there was over $40,000 in savings per high use um, uh, unhoused person that access services in the county. So it, it saves money and it improves people's health. Next speaker is Naka Elele. I am unmuting you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm speaking in favor of residential sites. Anyone who decides to call meaningless concerns about things like traffic will be happy to learn that highways have way, way more cars. Let's be candidly. You want homeless people to do your work, clean your streets, fix your roads, cook your food, but you're not willing to do the basics and give them a place to stay. They're not poisonous, they're people. Talking about people this way makes me embarrassed to call people in opposition Americans. Please do the right thing, vote for this bill. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Yvette. I've unmuted you. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'd like to oppose building permanent supportive housing at Crestview site or other highly residential areas. There's clearly lack of transparency on who are targeted by PSH and uh, how those chronically homeless people with substance abuse or mental health problems can benefit from such densely populated areas. There's also no long-term sustainable planning to ensure such properties will be safely managed and to ensure the safety of the neighborhood. Next speaker is Mark Molino. I'm unmuting you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi there. My name is Mark Molino, member of Silicon Valley DSA, as well as Common Ground California and other organizations. I just want to say uh, our housing unaffordability, it's our fault. It's our policies. We have created this. Uh, and the least we can do is the very exciting and I'm, I think very encouraging uh, Project Home Key. I support these projects very strongly. Uh, and I just want to say people in opposition, uh, in addition to their, their anti-humanism, they just have no solutions. They complain about citing in bad faith and they're real estate investors themselves. Please disregard them. This is a good project. Next speaker is Zach Schlegel. I have unmuted you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, calling on behalf of PATH, people assisting the homeless and support of the item. As the state's largest homeless service provider and an active partner in the Silicon Valley's efforts in homelessness, we are excited to see the county moving forward with the property. By purchasing the site, you would quickly open up 66 units to people experiencing homelessness who will then be able to access much needed supportive services. We've had positive experiences with Project Home Key, with six sites either in operation or in development across the state. We found it to be one of the best methods for moving and keeping people off the street, and we urge your support. Thank you. Next speaker is Christopher Meyer. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Mountain View resident who's lived near the Crestview Hotel for over 12 years now. The hotel is literally in my backyard. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I support Project Home Key. As we've seen with repeated studies in California and Florida, having supportive housing can only strengthen the community as a whole and make it safer. It relieves pressure and financial burden on emergency services. It provides a stable base for people to get back on their feet. And the residents whose backgrounds must be vetted and will be vetted undergo less desperation, which will make our community safer. The unhoused are already on the streets outside. We can only improve matters by giving them a roof and a chance. Next speaker is Janet Del Villaggio. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, the availability of Crestview and other sites, along with the state funding at hand, provide an immediate opportunity to create affordable, permanent, supportive housing in the resource areas, high resource areas that have direct access to transportation, stores, and the supportive services necessary for our unhoused to thrive and to make our community safer. Providing this stability in appropriate residential areas where these individuals can truly feel part of our community is critical to their successful transitions. Please support this and similar proposals so we can chip. Next speaker is Jordan Lee. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, as a 10 year Sunnyville resident, I oppose the Crestview Home Project built building in a dense residential area. Permanent supportive housing units are now focusing on local, low-income people. Instead, the selection is based on assessment system at the county level, which could congregate people with mental health issues and drug addiction problems. That's why my neighbors are worried, and the more than 1,200 neighbors stand up to oppose it with wet signatures within one seven, day, seven days. So to the other side, can you collect the same number? Next speaker is Ying. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Ying, are you there? Okay, we'll move on. Next speaker is Flaherty Ward. You'll have 30 seconds, please go ahead.
Flaherty Ward, are you there? Sorry about that. Good morning. Um, my name is Flaherty Ward and I'm with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority. I am speaking today to voice our strong support of the county's home key efforts. As you're aware, our county faces an unprecedented homelessness and housing crisis. The home key program provides an extraordinary opportunity to quickly house those most vulnerable in our community, providing both capital and operating dollars to support these important projects. We have spent months working with county staff and various city staff on the program. We intend, intend to continue this collaborative work into the future. Thank you. Next speaker is Dory Meyer. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as an eight year resident on Crestview Drive, I created a petition earlier this year to support this project. It's now gotten over 1200 signatures. And I believe that this is the, the silent majority does support this. I think the opposition is better organized and uh, just the squeaky wheel. I think that more people do support housing on Crestview uh, at the hotel. Thank you. Next speaker is Ingrid Granados. You'll have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Ingrid Granados with Destination Home, and I encourage you to move forward with the home care proposal to convert two hotels in Mountain View and Santa Clara, which will provide urgently needed new supportive and interim housing in Santa Clara County. The Crestview and Bella Vista in proposals will bring more than 100 affordable homes to the county. Aggressively moving forward to leverage this historic funding opportunity is essential to help create stable housing. We cannot afford any delay moving forward with these proven solutions to end homelessness. Thank you for your work on this important part of our collective work to end and prevent homelessness throughout the county. Next speaker is Richard. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Richard, are you there? Hi, Richard. can you hear me? Go ahead. Yep. Hi, yeah, sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Richard. I'm a father of two young children living in Sunnyvale. Like many of the speakers today and thousands of angry, disappointed families who can't speak today, we strongly urge you to vote no on the Home Key Project. The reason is simple. The project heavily impacts the lives of surrounding neighbors that they weren't engaged and didn't get a chance for their opinions to be heard. We're baffled as to why the county would alienate us with actions like these instead of working with us. Thank you. Next speaker is Rohin Ghosh. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Rohin, are you there? We do not have Rohin, we'll move on. The next speaker is Angela Rausch. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Angela Rausch and I've been a resident of the county for 17 years. In my ministry work with folks who are housing insecure, I see the need for housing. I have a dream that when folks come with needs for housing, I can say without pause, I know of a place that will work and it has space that is open. This is a dream because I can rarely say this now, but I know to realize this dream I must act. So my act today is to request that you approve the purchase of this housing opportunity. Thank you for your support. Next speaker is Louise Auerhan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, Louise Auerhan with Working Partnerships. I want to speak in strong support of this project and Project Home Key. The reason that we have seen more and more people suffering homelessness in our county is that there are not enough homes that people can afford. I know and work with so many people, families who have lost their housing and are living in cars so their kids can go to school, young people at San Jose State and other colleges who are going to school during the day and homeless at night. We need more housing like this project, thank you. Next speaker is Jordan Grimes. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I guess we're at good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Jordan Grimes, political director of the Peninsula Young Democrats, as well as a member of Peninsula for Everyone, just here in strong support. This is really a moral imperative. We have students, uh, community members, uh, elders on the streets um, who, who could be housed and will be housed by this project. It is a moral imperative, and I urge you to move forward with it as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Sunnyvale, 15 year resident. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, I'm a 15 year uh, Sunnyvale resident and I strongly oppose the immediate, I emphasize the immediate purchase of Mountain View Quest Hotel. Location selected does not make econo economic sense and without a transparent and sustain sustainable plan, this can create a huge financial burden in the long term for local government and worsen the homeless problem while creating more problems for the future. Just like we're leaving more debt for the, our kids. Faking support, Faking to support homeless with the purpose of spending huge taxpayer dollars and pushing it to other people's backyard is not a real solution. 
Next speaker is Jeff Houston. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. And David, if you'll hold Jeff's time for just a minute. Sure. I'm just going to do my reminder again. Um, I see we have 70 speakers to go still on this item that anyone who spoke previously, please do not speak again so that everyone who does speak has equal amount of time. Thank you. Jeff, I've unmuted you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Jeff, are you there? Jeff is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Alex Dela Cruz. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a resident of uh, uh, Hi, I'm a resident of Santa Clara, and uh, I participated in a uh, uh, I had 3,000 signatures collected, uh, voting vehemently against the project at hand. Um, I'm against it as I'm an older brother, and my sister walks to school every day, and I've seen studies published by the Santa Clara government entities that 42% um, of homeless people suffer from mental illness. And I just feel that would be a threat to the community. Next speaker is N. Hao Gong. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a local resident. I strongly against this project from thousands of local residents signed for opposition just in a week. It already showed lots of people are opposing it. Why you vote yes? There's a lack of transparency, leadership, and bad execution from the county in the name of good, but it's caused nothing but disruption, insecurity, and corruption. Please listen to the voice of local residents and vote no, or call for public voting to have local neighborhood vote. Please hear our voice. Thank you. Next speaker is Stephen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. I have been astonished by how, like these people, how these people are thinking in support of this project. I strongly oppose it, and they are ridiculous in in to me. And I can spend hours like uh, talking about this why this does not make sense. But please let people vote. This process is just a gesture. It does not clearly shows uh, the, the both sides opinion and we should create a new like a, a different form to discuss this thank you next speaker is Teresa so I have unmuted you you have 30 seconds please go ahead Teresa are you there Teresa is not there we'll move on next speaker is Emily you have 30 seconds please go ahead Hi, I'm against uh, strong strong against the Crestville project. I live nearby with kids, go to school around. This project would uh, make me worry about my kids' safety all all day, because at least fifty one percent of the tenants would be the homeless, which can live by their own. What they need more is the health care instead of just a place to live. This project is a, a permanent supportive house, but we only see houses. No support. I urge supervisors to vote no. Next speaker is Lillian. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Lillian, are you there? It looks like she just unmuted and then muted Can again. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm a resident of Sunnyvale. I live very close to Crestview Hotel. And over the weekend, I went, went to the street and collect those uh, signatures against the Crestview Hotel. And then Easily, we got over two, um, 100, uh, we got 1,200 um, signed sign signatures against those, and those signatures are from the Mountain View area. So, like I urge the county members here, please hear the voice from the people who live close to the area. Please, please, thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Jennifer, are you there? Jennifer is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Angus L. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Angus Liu from uh, Sunnyvale. I'm with Livable Sunnyvale and South Bay Yimby here, and I support the Crestview Home Key Project. Um, the Bay Area, as we know, has a severe housing shortage, and the Crestview Hotel to Housing Conversion will help with the housing shortage. When you give home to the homeless, they are no longer homeless. They're just regular people. Please vote in favor of this project, and I yield the rest of my time. Next speaker is Alex Brown. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hey, Alex Brown here with the Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America, Mountain View Mobile Home Alliance, Mountain View Yimby, Mountain View Housing Justice, a bunch of other groups. Speaking in strong support, I'd like to thank the county and cities for taking advantage of these fantastic opportunities to put a dent in our housing crisis and support our neighbors, both old and new. Let's get these done and then find even more to work on. Thanks. Next speaker is Seema Joshi. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Hi, I'm uh, very concerned about the safety of the community and it, inadequate cra criminal background checks and lack of transparency there. Every time the city elected officials uh, spoke about security, the, they defer to the selected property management to provide details. Ms. Hernandez mentioned the tenants will be checked for background in violent crimes. What crimes come under that? What about crimes like loot acts, again, minors, uh, the felonies, destruction of property? Uh, I, I would like transparency of that. I would otherwise support the housing of homeless, uh, but I have concerns about safety. Next speaker is Tony. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Tony, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I strongly against the home key, home key project. I'm a local resident in Mountain View and a neighbor to the correct uh, hotel. I have been living here for around uh, 10 years. I strongly concerned about the decision to add a home key site in such a proximity to high density residential area and to schools, to parks, and to children uh, playgrounds. This is a very small and a wrong place. I strongly urge you to consider alternative locations. Please vote no to this. Thank you. Next speaker is Harper Kim. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Montsonville resident and homeowner for more than 10 years and is strongly opposed to the Crestville project. In fact, we collected over 1,300 wet signed petitions from eligible voters and residents in Santa Clara County opposing Crestville project in less than just seven days. And then we have submitted it as an official record to Santa Clara County. So we add, ask the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to not ignore unheard voices from the neighborhood. Next speaker is Rachel. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, hi. I'm living in Sunnyville and Mountainville for over 10 years. I'm strongly opposed to having the Crescentville Hotel as a permanent homeless place. The, the reason is simple. Like there are schools and uh, uh, senior apartments nearby. There are a lot of safety concerns mentioned by other people. And moreover, it's not healthy for those homeless people to live in such dense residential area with just give them a place without care. They should find some other place where with better uh, way to spend money. Next speaker is Mark Farley. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Mark, are you there? Mark is- Sorry, I, sorry, I had to unmute, my bad. Go ahead. Um, I'm in support of Project Home Key. I, you know, there's a lot of opposition. I think people think that we're going to be transporting homeless people from the Tenderloin into the South Bay. That's not the case. These are people that have had medical emergencies, lost one of two jobs. The house that we're renting got sold underneath them. These are hardworking people with kids. They're going to be part of your community. If, if this goes through, think well of them. They're going to be great neighbors. They're going to be on your kids' sports teams and clubs. These are going to be people that you love. Next speaker is Kelsey Baines. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Kelsey Baines. I'm the regional director for Yimby Action. I'm also a, a D5 resident, a licensed clinical psychologist who served people experiencing homelessness in Santa Clara County. And I served on the county's unhoused task force. I strongly support the Crestview acquisition, uh, which would create uh, permanent supportive housing for our unhoused neighbors. There is overwhelming evidence and broad consensus that Housing First is effective and the central location is ideal. Um, thank you. Next speaker is Sunny. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. I am a Sunnyville resident and I strongly oppose the Crestview Health Acquisition. Uh, Palato put their home key project out near the bay. San Francisco new homeless housing is directly across the street from police headquarters, making it to address safety concerns. Why did San Francisco build its new homeless center in Pacific Heights among the mansion of Diane Fenster, Nancy Pelosi? So we seem to be outstep with- Next speaker is Bruce England. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, speaking on behalf of Mountain View Coalition for Sustainable Planning, we strongly support the project. We believe that notifications, outreach, and transparency have been very strong, so we're not concerned about that. This is a solution that's seriously needed across the region, not just this project, but all kinds of projects like this that provide housing and having them highly distributed across the communities. And we believe also that residence management will be well thought out and executed. So we have no concerns in that area about safety, security, and so on. Thank you. Next speaker is Ann Paulson. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
excuse me, David, excuse yes. me. And I was talking and I muted myself. Um, for everybody listening, we currently have 76 more speakers. What I'm gonna do is we're going to break. So Create TV and staff, listen to this. We're gonna break at 1230 for just 15 minutes so people can have lunch. I know we have meetings going today until 9 p.m. So at 12.30 in 15 minutes, we're gonna break for 15 minutes. All remaining speakers, which are now 78, you can hang on and you can start speaking again at 12.45. Board members, is that all agreeable? Just give me some nods. That's okay, I've got three, so I'm gonna call that done. So David, we're gonna hear uh, from speakers until 12.30 then break for 15 minutes, resume at 12.45. Understood. Thank you, go ahead. All right, Ann, you are unmuted, please go ahead. I'm Ann Paulson, a 34 year Los Altos homeowner. I strongly support the Crestview. I live pretty close to the location and I often bike along the Stevens Creek bike trail, which is very near the location. The bike trail is one more advantage of this great location. Probably a lot of the residents of the Crestview will be like me. They won't drive. The bike trail means they won't have to go on busy streets. They can just pop on their, get on their bike, pop on the bike trail to get places just like I do all the time. Please move this forward. Next speaker is Emily Ann Ramos. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Me? Go ahead. Yes, wonderful. Hi, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I am a Mountain View resident, but I'm here speaking on behalf of Silicon Valley at Home, the voice of affordable housing here in Silicon Valley. I'm here to express strong support for the county's acquisition of the Crestview Hotel as part of the Project Home Key program. This is one of nine worthy projects the County Board of Supervisors is evaluating to house the unhoused. This is opportunity is great. There have been several opportunities from outreach by the city and the county for this project, including three community outreaches. Please move this forward. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Grace. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I see that the main debate point is whether this is safe or not. And the, the discussions are basically baseless. People were supporting this saying, I have families who are uh, junkies and homeless, they're totally harmless. And some people say it's totally not safe because it's the men it, they have mental issues. I think this is where the county own as an ex explanation and uh, uh, screening process is totally untransparent. And uh, this is causing a lot of issues. I urge you vote for no right now. Next speaker is James Liu. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, first, uh, I oppose this project. Uh, I would like to say this hearing is unfair to those people who are working classes uh, in the neighborhood. Second, uh, uh, the safety concern is uh, very well supported by the Repeaters Police uh, Department uh, report on the Hill, Hillview Home Key project. And so many supporters don't distinguish or understand the difference between affordable housing, transitional housing and permanent supporting housing. So they thought that they are supporting the local people, but that's not. Permanent housing is not supporting the, the local uh, homeless people. Next speaker is Amy Kay. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Rock and Robbie wanted White Oak a few years ago. We were given public notice, public hearings, and assured code compliance. Now, nothing here. This is outrageous. The old county courthouse has been empty for years. Now, Home Key could renovate what you already own, and it is next to Nova public uh, library, community center, shopping and transit. Given the preceding, it is, it is really cool, uh, cruel to ignore the hardworking. Next speaker is Bruce Mayo. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Bruce, are you there? Bruce is not, okay, we'll move on. Next speaker is Joyce H. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, hello, my name is Joyce. So we have collected thousands of physical signatures to strongly oppose the cross, uh, this uh, home key project. So it has uh, numerous uh, safety issues and we also see the police report from the Mill Peters. So we strongly oppose it and we hope you can vote no, otherwise we will vote you down in the next election. Thank you. Next speaker is Isaac Stone. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Isaac, are you there? Isaac is not. We'll come back. Next speaker is Marie Bernard. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Hello, my name is Marie Bernard, Executive Director at Sunnyvale Community Services. We're one of the emergency assistance agencies in our county. I'm also a 38 year resident of the county. Um, this project home key is something that we can all benefit from. It's a proven model. It's near public transportation. It provides a roof, a door and supportive services. 800 of the people that we helped last year were already homeless. Many are children going to school alongside many of the children that people are worried about. These are children who live. Next speaker is Julia Liu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Julia Liu. My husband and I have lived in Sunnyvale for 36 years, raised two kids here. Now, senior citizens, we still care very much about the safety of our surroundings. We fully support converting the Crestview Hotel and Bella Vista into affordable, supportive housing for the unhoused. Getting people off the streets and into supportive housing leads to better outcome and improves quality of life for all of us. Let's get these built. Thank you. Next speaker is Lenny Siegel. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Lenny Siegel. I served on the Mountain View City Council. I currently serve on the Housing Bond Oversight Committee of the county. Uh, the reason the majority of people in this county and in Mountain View support all kinds of housing, affordable housing, permanent supportive housing shelters is because these projects are well designed and well managed in our communities. And I, the best evidence of that is the strong support that we had for Measure A in 2016. People want these projects built and we're spreading them around the county near transit. Next speaker is Daniel Hulse. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so I'm calling in support of uh, the uh, Home Key project uh, and the, the conversion of the hotel. Uh, I live in Mountain View. Um, I think we have an obligation to uh, prevent homelessness as much as possible. Um, I'm concerned with all the vitriol that's coming from the opposition of this uh, project. Uh, and I think there should be some political courage uh, to support it because that vitriol is not who we are. Next speaker is Claire Chen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I have been a long-term resident of the Santa Clara County, and I vote no for the three home key projects because I really value our neighborhood's safety, and I believe there is a better solution to help the homeless people to live in a lower-density residential area instead of the location right now. Thank you. Next speaker is Rob. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I oppose these project sites. Those supporting it are all from organizations that have supported all the previously flawed and failed homeless projects that the state has taken on. They ignore the rising crime statistics for all areas impacted by these sites. There's a reason people are fleeing San Francisco and the Bay Area. Your virtue signaling solutions only hurt those who work hard and contribute to our society. I urge you, urge you to vote now to protect your community and those who, those who live here. Thank you. Next speaker is Kathy. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm the resident in the Santa Clara. I strongly urge supervisors to vote no to all these home key projects. It is lacking enough back and forth communication between the county and the local residents. We haven't been involved in all this process. I heard it just in last week. Looks like people who has pushed this project are trying to hide it from all the local residents to ignore our voice. Please vote no, please. Next speaker is Leanna Wickstrom. Please go ahead. Oh, Linnea, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. <laughs> Thank you. Linnea Wickstrom, a Santa Clara County resident for over 60 years. As an advocate for housing for the developmentally disabled, many who of whom are housing insecure or maybe homeless, I am strongly in support of this project. Helping the homeless is an imperative in increasing housing for all. Vote yes to support these home key projects. Thank you. Next speaker is Katie Lyles. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Katie, a longtime Mountain View resident, I live very close by Crestview Hotel. 
I'm here strongly oppose the uh, Crestview Home Key project in Mountain View. This is truly not ideal location to help homeless people. We do want to help, but the locations are truly, truly wrong. I mean, and a lot of supporters are from a sort of organization. They're not truly local people. If you truly want to listen to the local people voice, please call for the public voting with two local addresses. And also listen to the people voice from your Peters in San Francisco, where the Home Key projects exist. And then you can know the truth. Next speaker is Linda. Please go ahead. Linda, are you there? Yeah, sorry. Um, I strongly oppose this home key um, in Crestview Hotel. I live about one mile nearby. There has been no transparency, insufficient efforts from the county to have been made to notify local residents, engage in depth discussions, and attempt to dismiss all those concerns raised before. And the, the number of the signers uh, is growing. The officials should not ignore the strong opposition. There has been no zero wet signatures from the home address which supports this project. That's zero. Next speaker is Yue Zhao. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I live in Sunnyville and I strongly vote no to the home key project, especially the Preset View Hotel. There has been no ESO selected with home address, which shows no support from local people. It's easy to support if it doesn't influence you. The Preset View is only 20 minutes walk to the Cherry Chase Elementary School. There are children playing in the neighborhood every day. This isn't fair to them and isn't fair to the small business owner right next to the local. Uh, to the location. Please call for public vote and hear the voice from the real local people. Next speaker is Mandy. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm here to strongly oppose the sites in Santa Clara County that are chosen by the Home Key Project. We already collected more than 3,300 white signatures to oppose those sites within seven days, and the number is fast growing. At least 70% of the nearby residents are strongly opposing it, including the ones who have lived here for more than 50 years. I urge you to vote no to the Home Key Project choosing these sites. Thank you. Next speaker is Shin. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Shin, are you there? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I strongly oppose to build homeless housing in those areas. Those who claim to support the project are people who are living very far away from the proposed sites. We have over 3,000 signatures. We have their addresses and they are real people. Supporters, what do you have, supporters? Do you dare to show your address to show you really live to the you really live next to the proposed area? Those homeless people, they are not hardworking people who can afford a house. They have severe mental issues and drug issues. They have they are sex offenders. Next speaker is Bob. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I moved to uh, Mountain View and Sunday View 10 years back. So uh, I talked to uh, 50 uh, neighbors in my community in you know, 10 minutes uh, walking from the Crestview Hotel. So 40 of them would know. And uh, I represent them on the, in this meeting to say no. So for supervisors, so know your uh, neighbors, know your uh, residents and listen to them. So I represent 40 neighbors to say no. Next speaker is Alyssa Cisneros. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Alyssa Cisneros. I'm a council member for the city of Sunnyvale, but today I'm speaking on my own behalf. Uh, first, I wanna preface this by saying I have family members who have relied on permanent supportive housing to get themselves out of homelessness. And the one thing that we cannot lose sight of is that in order to end homelessness, we need people to be in homes. Uh, this is an essential project uh, to serving our community in a way that we are currently unable to do. So I urge the Board of Supervisors to support this. Next speaker is Crystal Wickham. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Supervisors, for the opportunity to express my support for the Crestview Hotel project. I'm a 17 year resident and homeowner of Sunnyvale and live within half mile of the Crestview Hotel. I have a school aged child and I am not afraid of the home key project or the people it will serve. I'm happy to have this project in my neighborhood to help those people that need shelter and support. Thank you. Next speaker is Milo Trouse. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Milo Trouse. I'm um, speaking in strong support of this site acquisition. Um, 
finding residences for folks who currently do not have them is some is, is the number one way we can increase safety um public safety and um safety for the people who are out on the street and the health of our communities so please acquire this site acquire others like it um with livable sunnyvale and uh south bay yimby and um this is a good project thank you thank you and this will be our final speaker for 15 minutes david all right, the next speaker is Leo. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Thanks. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to the supervisor. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm a resident in Sanville, has been for over 10 years. I'm here to strongly against this proposal. And I, I really have the safety issues, uh, concerns about this project, of the Questview project. And we have collected over 3,000 uh, wet signatures from the nearby residents to stop the Questview project in the past seven days. And the number is growing really fast. We hope the supervisor will know and to hear the voice from the local residents. Thanks. And that concludes that portion of the speakers. Thank you. Board members, we're going to adjourn for 15 minutes. We're going to resume at 1245 with continuance of the public speakers on item 14. See you all in 15 minutes. Recording stopped.
David, do I have you? I'm here, yes. Wonderful. Just uh, to establish the presence of a quorum, would you please uh, take roll call? Yes, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Apologies. Lee. Can we start the recording and try again? Yes, please. One moment. Recording in progress. Okay, Supervisor Lee. We'll come back. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. President Wasserman. Here as well. And one more time for Supervisor Lee. All right. He's not here at the moment, but we do mm -hmm. have a quorum. Let's continue with our speakers, then we'll recognize Supervisor Lee when he returns. <clears throat> okay, one moment, please. The next speaker is Stephen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Stephen, are you there? Uh, yes, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, late. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm a long-term resident of Santa Clara without any fancy photo, but I still strongly oppose the location of home project in all three locations in Santa Clara County. Same as homeless people, I think local residents should be also be cared for. I saw rapes, uh, assault with knife, even murder happen in Milpitas Home Key Project. There were 58 911 calls in the past five months in that facility. This shocking data in the same facility of Milpitas have proven it to be a failure for local community from safety. Next speaker is Lucy. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Lucy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, go ahead. Lucy, I'm Sunnyvale Residence. I do support any attempt to help homeless. However, I also strongly oppose these three locations. The current location we have are, and the facilities are too small and crowded. Homeless are human like you and me. They deserve a bigger and better space for their life and family, not a hotel room. Please do good care on them and choose a bigger place for them. Thank you. Next speaker is Sherry. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Sherry. I'm the long-term resident for the Mountain View. Um, my opinion is uh, we, um, I urge the council member to delay this voting because this is a homeless shelter based on my understanding. Maybe the communication didn't go through like that. It's not a formal affordable housing. I think residents need to know how this is managed and how to help these people to be back to their food instead of just put them in a, in a place providing a housing. That's all I see. Thank you. Next speaker is Kara Lee. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so I am a Montana resident and homeowner for more than 15 years. I live two blocks down Crestville Hotel and I strongly oppose this home key project. One fact that supports our concern over safety, the Santa Clara County has a poor record in managing such housing facilities. The home key site in Monoville, uh, sorry, in Milpitas had 18 police reports, including trespassing, rape, assault with knife, mental healthness, and slowing vehicles since it's open. Next speaker is Ying. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a resident of, in Sunnyvale, so I'm strongly opposed for this, uh, the home key project. Mm, um, as a local residents, we care mm, about the safety and we don't want the city to neglect the the um, neglect the negative effect and uh, if the business and the home um if the business, local business and um, homeowner they are afraid then you should consider that next speaker is cindy you have 30 seconds please go ahead hi i'm a resident living about one mile from the chris uh, uh chris chrisville site i strongly against the proposal what i've heard from the meeting is that the supporters are mostly coming from all kinds of organizations, but please be aware they cannot speak for the real local residents. I sincerely urge the supervisors to take immediate actions and not ignore the local residents who really pays for the project and whose lives will be affected by this project. Thank you. Next speaker is Cindy Newman. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a real local resident. I live less than two miles from the project in Mountain View and a property owner. My brother and sister were both homeless. It was only through supported housing projects like this that they got back into their health and they got back into their family. I urge you to support this and I urge all the negative people against this project 
to take advantage and go to a project and get a tour. Educate yourself. Thank you. Next speaker is Joan Rodofsky. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Joan, are you there? Joan is not there. We'll move on. Next speaker is Events SVH. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm Allison Singalani, resident of Santa Clara County and parent of two young children who welcomes home key projects in my neighborhood and throughout the county. We know that new affordable housing does not increase neighborhood crime. What some of us have forgotten is that people experiencing homelessness are people. They are not the problem. Homelessness is the problem. Home key projects allow us to address this problem directly with safe, stable homes and supportive services provided in a cost-effective way. Please approve the purchase of the Crestview and Bella Vista sites. Thank you for your work on homelessness throughout the county. Next speaker is Edie Keating. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, I am a Mountain View resident. I strongly support the Crestview project. It is an ideal location near bus lines, stores, and jobs. Our whole community benefits from more deeply affordable housing. Adding affordable housing will provide security and peace to the residents who will live there. At my church's homeless shelter that we support for one month, I've met wonderful people. They all want to be housed. Please support Crestview. Next speaker is Chris Sue. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. As a Sunday route, Sunnyvale resident for more than 20 years, I'm supportive of helping the homeless, but strongly against the home key project. Obviously, there are a lot of concerns about safety for our children in nearby schools and community, but there are over 30, uh, 3,000 local residents against the project. So I urge the council members to vote no. Homeless people don't need just a shelter, but they need a home. The better approach is really to identify and locate the families of the homeless so that they can get the love and support from their own families to get back on their feet with other means of government support. Next speaker is Johnny. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Johnny, are you there? Johnny is not. Next speaker is Kate Cow. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Oh, it looks like Kate is using an older version of Zoom. All right. So we'll have to remove for permission to speak. Uh, next speaker is Jeff Houston. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello. I'm a resident of Santa Clara. I support this project for the reasons explained by the many supporters that eloquently spoke before me. Thank you for listening to us. I support this project and ask you to approve it. That is all. Next speaker is Yun Fang. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yun, are you there? Okay, we don't have Yun. We'll move on. Next speaker is Alex. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Alex, are you there? We do not have Alex. Next speaker is Serta. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello. Hey, as a long-term resident in the Santa Clara County, I support homeless by strongly support this project in the residential area. The supporting side is judgmental and literally leverage emphasis for homeless to ruin our neighborhoods. Doesn't mean that we have to rob our neighbors to help the poor. I suspect a lot of supporters are financially benefit from this home key project and use homeless as an excuse. And seriously, several supporters here are even working on the home key project and the whole setting is unfair for most of the day work, you know, daytime working in a residence, you know, thanks. Next speaker is Alice Kurth. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I would like to vote no on a home key project. Please take your eyes on the 3,000 votes. We vote no. Please listen to our community. Those people who propose, uh, propose people who support this project is from the big organizations. Listen to the local community members. Next speaker is Sean Han. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Sean, are you there? Yes, hi, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Sean, and I live in Laura Place 2 in Santa Clara, which is immediate, immediate next to Bella West Inn. So I knocked on everyone's door in our complex, and I was able to talk to over 40 of them. Three of them are neutral, and the rest all strongly opposed and provided wet signature. 
No communication of any kind has been conducted to the neighbors. So along with all my neighbors, I strongly oppose. Thank you. Next speaker is Teresa Zell. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Teresa, are you there? Teresa is not unmuting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Can ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm the residence close to the Honky Crestview site. I oppose this uh, Crestview site because there was not sufficient publicity of the Honky site, especially for minority group. Uh, as a Chinese, I feel discriminated. It's, it's not fair for the minority residents in the near neighborhood. Secondly, I suggest to delay the voting. Next speaker is Angela. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Angela, are you there? We do not have Angela. Okay, next speaker is Carl Volker. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Carl Volker. I live in Sunnyvale, half a mile from the Crestview Hotel location. Uh, so I am in the neighborhood. I'm also a member of Livable Sunnyvale and I am strongly in support of the project. This is exactly the kind of thing we need. This is my neighborhood. I walk around it all the time and the, the misinformation about this is ridiculous. Please vote in support, thanks. Next speaker is Dana Peed. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Dana, are you there? Seem to have lost Dana. Next speaker is Miriam Connor. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Miriam Connor. I am a local Mountain View resident. I'm also a member of the Mountain View Coalition for Police Reform and Accountability. Um, I support Project Home Key and my group, all the people in it support it. We think it's great for our community. We think it increases public safety by getting people into real housing. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about the prospect of this and I'm hoping to see more projects like this in the future. Next speaker is Sophia Lee. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, as a resident of the Crestview community, I strongly oppose this project because the, the proposed locations are really inappropriate. I urge you to listen to the voices of local residents instead of those who are not directly impacted by these projects. We do need to help the homeless people, but it's not feasible to decide policies based solely on a compassionate heart. Please use your reason and your judgment and consider other locations. Please vote no. Thank you. Next speaker is Susie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I strongly oppose to this uh, 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 proposal. So uh, like uh, uh, there are a lot of options you can do, like uh, uh, government have our tax tax money and then they can give it to whoever wants to support this case to, to ask them live in their homes. That's the alternative they can go. But we want to keep our community safe and healthy. We want to make it our home. Uh, please do consider the local residents' opinion. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Jane Sunil. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm a Sunnyvale resident, mother of two, and I live in Cherry Chase neighborhood, and I strongly oppose the, the Crestfield Home Key Project. On misinformation, there, there's no clarity on tenant mix. There's no indication that these housing developments could alleviate homeless issues locally. Only a very tiny of percentage of tenants at the Milpitas home key site are from local. And we should give priority to local homelessness. And also there's lack of financial transparency. The county spent over- Next speaker is Jane. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jane. Hey, hey. Yes. Uh, I, I'm a Sunnyvale resident for like uh, 17 years, a mother of two, and I uh, live in the Cherry Trees neighborhood. And uh, let me tell you a fact. Um, when we went to collect uh, signatures from the two apartments and uh, one single and the single family house is right behind the Crestview, all of them haven't heard about this project and all against it. So I'm against this proposal too. And please listen to the local people. Next speaker is Steve Pinkston. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Reverend Steve Pinkston. I'm with the Silicon Valley Interfaith Collaborative. I urge you to support the Home Key Permanent Supportive Housing Project. These unhoused men, women, 
brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters are our neighbors. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights declared years ago that housing is a human right for all. Given a restart with supportive services, these unhoused neighbors can be given an opportunity to rebound positively and contribute. To Next speaker is Grace. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi. So I'm strongly opposed to uh, uh, this new uh, home key project. Uh, I think the ideal location would be just a small part of the uh, previous golf course of uh, Levi Stadium. And just 5% of land will be a lot more than what this project needs. And the Center Cara County Board has development plan for that day. But if they cannot just give five. Next speaker is Mike. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Okay. 70% uh, of the local residents opposes this project and get, go talk to them face to face. This so called NGOs and a small number of unverified local supporters are strongly biased and blinded. They are spreading misinformation nonsense. They are essentially saying that we should support any kind of project at all costs, but do not want to donate a fraction of their health to help them. This is insane. We need to improve the process and transparency. I need, I call for potential interest connection with this project. I call for DOP members and media to step in. I call for letting people vote. I call. Next speaker is Molly. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Molly, you're going to. Looks like you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a I'm a teacher working with um, a preschool children just nearby this Crestview Hotel, and I strongly oppose this project. This project is going to pose huge uh, safety risks for, for the children who come to my my, my place. And I also think that people who are supporting it, can you please look at the nearby home key projects and see how many of those projects are actually supporting, like or helping the, those people become a better human or like living up by themselves. Next speaker is Jenny T. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I strongly, strongly disagree as I have pre previously lived in areas with affordable housing projects and I moved to Sunnyvale for the very reason of escaping them. I have had trash hurled by my head by the homeless. I have seen a man pull down his pants on the sidewalk completely to expose his genitals. I have seen their feces on the sidewalk and they have slept on my doorstep and spat at me. Is this what you really want? I can say from personal experience that this is not a good idea. Next speaker is Isaac Stone. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Isaac, are you there? Hi, 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 okay, it's working now. Hi, uh, my name is Isaac Stone. I live in Mountain View. Um, I support making the Crestview Hotel into permanent supportive housing. I used to live next to a homeless shelter and I experienced no problems. The people who lived next door were courteous and polite. Um, I myself was unstably housed for two years in the past and it was only because of luck that I was able to get out of that. And I think we should be doing everything we can to support the people, they're just people. Next speaker is Kat Wortham. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. So my name is Kat Wortham, and by day I'm a housing advocate, but by night I am also a housing advocate because I believe that we need all types of housing at all income levels. This includes home key projects. I would urge the supervisors to vote yes and appropriate the funds for these proposals and more. And I'd also like to say I am a Sunnyvale resident. I do live close to these projects, and I think they're incredibly, incredibly important. Thank you. Next speaker is Raisa Singh. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Raisa Singh. I live and work in Mountain View and I live less than two miles from the Crestview. I urge you to approve the Crestview and Bella Vista projects. It saddens me that so many of the previous callers have forgotten this one indisputable fact, which is housing is health care. I urge and beg you to not forget this when making your vote. So let me repeat that. Housing is health care. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Alyssa Weatherston. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Alyssa, are you there? We do not have Alyssa. Next speaker is Russ Boyak. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Russ. 
Are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm strongly opposed this project. I live in a community for many years. As a father of five years old, I worried of, uh, about my kids living in a community that is unsafe and potentially harmful to, for him. In the weekend, I talked with my neighbors about this project. All the neighbors oppose this project. And I collect around 40 white signatures in just a very short time. Yeah, I think we are oppose this project. Thanks. Next speaker is Cordelia Liu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Cordelia, are you there? Hi, hi. hi. I, uh, sorry about the double um, sound. Uh, I have a hearing disability. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I live on Floral Vista Avenue, and I strongly oppose the Bella View in, in project. I uh, Bella Vista in project. I was at the September 30th uh, community meeting by RCD and Santa Clara City. They gave us misleading info that only a quarter would be interim housing, whereas a half would be as reported by all other sources. They gloss over on how to screen out sex offenders too. Because of this, I strongly oppose this development. Please vote no for us. Thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer H. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, hello. My name is Jennifer. We have collected more than 3,000 uh, physical signatures to oppose the location, three locations of this home key project. We suggest you find other locations which are not highly populated because of the safety issue. And we hope you can really represent our uh, concerns. And next time we can support your election. Otherwise, we will vote we'll vote you out and also uh, explore the corruption into these projects. Next speaker is Jane Smith. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm the Santa Clara resident uh, for this home key project. I think there are no transparency, no public being. So who is benefiting from the project? Truly homeless people? No, they're the people who fail to put it to public voting. I strongly urge supervisors vote no to this project and stop those people who is hiding behind and taking advantage of people's human goodness. Please vote no. Thank you. Next speaker is Emma. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I want to emphasize that opposing the three locations is not opposing help to homeless people. The project home key at the three locations, one in Mountain View and the two in Santa Clara, lacks transparency. And there are so many questions that are not answered. So I urge you to have more public hearings and listen to the silent majority. We elected you officials to represent us. But if this is not true, we can also vote you out. For the record, we collected more than 3,000. Next speaker is Maggie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Maggie, are you there? We do not have Maggie. Next speaker is Bella Jin. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, hi. I, I strongly oppose the project because uh, I think we received 3,000 disagree on wet signature and 4,000 on online signature. That is the voice from us. Um, so I hope the, the, the supervisor can listen to us. Otherwise, you didn't do what you do when you, uh, when you, when you apply for the position. Thank you. Next speaker is James Cosmo. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, James Kuzmo. And as a lifelong Mountain View resident, I just want to say I strongly support this project. And even if there are any parts of this project that are not perfect, we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And it's important to remember that with these types of projects, we need to have them happen as fast as possible so we can help people as quickly as possible. Because all the other tools in our toolkit for improving the housing crisis will take years to implement. And so let's get this done sooner rather than later and not delay any more than necessary. Next speaker is Rohin Ghosh. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, Board of Supervisors. My name is Rohin. I am a resident of D5 speaking in strong support of the project today. I am deeply disappointed to hear the racist, classist, fear-mongering rhetoric from opponents of the project who are securely housed, most likely, and uh, don't know what it's like to not be securely housed. We are all better off as a community when everyone has a secure home to live in. 
and I strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to stand up for all of our neighbors and support the project without any delay. Thank you. Next speaker is Pablo Hernandez Sanz. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Pablo. I'm a Mountain View resident and I strongly support Home Key. I believe those less fortunate need to be treated with dignity and respect. I personally was raised in a very poor country and yet I have never seen the level of indifference to poverty and human suffering that I've seen in the Bay Area. For me, Home Key is one big ray of hope that makes me think that people do care. So please approve this purchase. The next speaker is Jason. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, officer. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm a Mountain View a resident for over 10 years. I'm here to strongly against this uh, proposal and for the Crestview project. So first one is that this project lacks of the transparency. I think as we many as mentioned that for the Crestview project, many people don't know about not be aware of this project, even though it is very close to the uh, Crestville Hotel, and we have collected over 3,000 mass signatures and 4,000 signatures online, so please will know here, listen to the people around me. Thank you. Next speaker is Jen T. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Please vote no on Crestview. We need answers prior to approval. The county is mismanaging three new large 100% permanent supportive housing facilities. These three new complexes are less than two years old and having major issues now. Originally touted as wonderful, with major issues including numerous fires. We need to know that these problems will not happen at Crestview. We need answers and we need them now and prior to approval. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy Yu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Amy Yu. I'm a resident close to Crestview Hotel, and I also worked in a daycare less than one mile to the side. I strongly oppose this proposal. There was a homeless, a drunk homeless, pulled down his pants and threw bottles around in front of the daycare parking lot last week, and many kids saw this thing and got scared. I don't want this to happen to any to, to our neighborhood again, I, and I don't want my kids to see this anymore. Please vote no. Next speaker is Sunnyvale Local. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say I personally made uh, monetary donations of the homeless and for all the good causes. Uh, however, Crestview Hotel is a really, really bad location, as well as the two uh, in the border of Sunnyville and Santa Clara for Home Key Project. Pro, uh, for, home, for Home Key Project, based on experience from Mountain View lawsuits from communities occurred uh, due to the lack of effort and to effectively address community concerns and poor record. Next speaker is Tina. You have thirty seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Mountain View resident who is close to Crestview. I strongly oppose this project. I have volunteered at a homeless shelter in San Fran and uncovered that these housing projects will not solve the problem, but will create many more issues. Many of them, the homeless people, are special groups of people that deserve special care. The, support, the supporters we're hearing are either outside of this community or other organizations that may pose a conflict of interest here. If you proceed, you are not re representing 70% of the local residents. Next speaker is Loreto QD. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm Loretto Quevedo de Manda from Milpitas, or Loretto Cutis Brigade Silicon Valley, and I strongly support all project home key and all sorts of housing all over the county, but make sure that they're run professionally and transparently with some oversight. Don't worry, Supervisor Lee and other sp supervisors will vote you in and out. Let's have some empathy to our vulnerable and underprivileged neighbors. They need urgent help. Yes, I live in Milpitas. We are taxpayers too, so we have every right of voicing our suggestions as well. May I remind those talking about corruption that the voices of Milpitas lost the cases they filed against the Milpitas Project Home Key. Thank you. Next speaker is Alex Nunez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Mountain View resident, extremely supportive of this project and all efforts to help our previously housed uh residents here in the county um i i definitely uh am feeling a little bit uh saddened at the levels of misinformation um that are abounding i definitely invite anyone who is afraid to go meet the people who are living next to you when they move in and you'll find that uh everyone is not as it would seem thank you 
Next speaker is Lee. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a uh, Sunnyvale resident and I'm opposed to make any decision today. There have been enough objections and lots of signals that people are not knowing this until two weeks ago. So to me, this project's not following a framework of decision making. The public comments just one opinion versus the other opinion. So moving forward, my recommendation is hold the decision today, do your due diligence and follow a proper framework of decision making. Specifically, publish your rationale of site picking, publish data points of expected positive and negative community impact, publish past record of success. Next speaker is Aaron. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Sunnyvale resident. I strongly oppose th uh, this project. I'm a mother, and all the parents from my kids' daycare are strongly oppose this project. For very few people who come from some interesting parties, please show some sympathy and respect for parents who are really af afraid. The crime records are real. They are facts. They are not illusion. Please open your eyes and see the facts, see the signs. Thank you. Next speaker is Vivian Gonzalez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Vivian, are you there? We do not have Vivian. We'll move on. The next speaker is Charlie W. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I just simply don't think there is enough information on attendance to convince me that this is safe for me and my kids. We live in walkable distance uh, from the Crestview Hotel. So stop saying that they're just humans who are harmless. We simply do not know that. And secondly, most likely it's not safe with my personal experience with another property we used to own. We There was a homeless uh, shelter built nearby. We found needles in the pool. We found trash in front of our house and we found naked men in our spa where kids are playing. So do you want this for your children? If not, please vote no. And you you represent local resident. We vote you in. So please do not represent the big organization who actually can benefit from this money. Next speaker is Bill Cheney. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you. So I heard all of the different voices. Myself, I strongly oppose this project. I live very close to the property. And I would have a sincere word here to say is uh, your kindness at other people's cost, at the painfulness of every other people's living. It's really very cheap, very low. I challenge that in a lot of uh, conversations in today's uh, meeting. But myself, I have the pain every day if it happens. Thank you. Next speaker is Todd. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Todd. Um, I'm living in Santa Clara and I'm on the view for uh, like seven years. Uh, I try to oppose this uh, building project at this status. I feel a lot of discussions and also check the website of HomeKey. Uh, unfortunately, on HomeKey side, Home website, first I didn't see anything about the uh, eligibility check for each person. And there's only about the site construction, but not about the people who want to check. And the people is not a problem for sure, but uh, it depends on the people's really mature at the heart. So I want to oppose it. Next speaker is Jade. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, yeah, um, I'd like to urge the council members to look at actual stats from the Mount Peters Home Key project. That site generated 20 911 calls by 50 tenants in one single month. The incidents range from assault with knife to rape. The Crestview Hotel location is right in the middle of multiple public schools, preschools, after schools. If we approve this proposal, you are really putting the safety of our community's most vulnerable group at risk. Consider how you feel if- Next speaker is Michelle Lai. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Michelle, are you there? We do not have Michelle, we'll move on. Next speaker is Joan Berdowski. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hello. Um... I live around the corner from uh, the Crestview Hotel, and I think this is a great place for a project home key residence. It's already there. It's already built. You can have it up and running in a, in a, a short time. Please approve it. Next speaker is Adrian. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi. 
My name is Adrian. I'm a local resident in Mountain View. The house is pretty close to the Silverman Park and also pretty close to Crestview. I can only represent a few people from my neighborhood. We vote no to this proposal and we oppose this project entirely. So for those people who support it, it's easier and cheaper for you to show your kindness because you don't have to pay for it. I know you want to be nice to the homeless people. I also want to help them too, but please also be nice to our local people. We are humans too. Next speaker is Sophia. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Sophia. Hi, I'm here. Um, I am a long-term resident in Santa Clara and actually I have a cousin and a brother that were homeless. And I've actually consulted them and they have expressed they would like to have housing, but not under this unclear and not transparency process. I strongly oppose to this project. The homeless need a home, but definitely a safe home. And we need a local community to support this. Thank you. Next speaker is Rui Zheng. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, hi. Uh, I'm a resident and homeowner in Mountain View and I strongly speak against this uh, home key projects. I would say that, uh, yeah, uh, don't just listen to the anecdotal stories uh, saying those people are going to be nice. We need to have a proper screaming process to make sure <clears throat> those projects would host uh, uh, nice people without crime uh, record or uh, sex offenders. Yeah, listen to the prior speakers about the uh, crime record Next speaker is Henry Luo. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Henry, are you there? We do not have Henry. Can you hear me now? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, first, I just wanna say our concerns and fears are not unfounded. We need to recognize that homeless facilities need to run for a long time, but they are simply not well run. As a result, that definitely brings long-term instability into communities. The list of broken records goes from Second Street Studios to Reticent Place to meet Milpita's home key projects. It is therefore irresponsible and senseless to sprinkle the South Bay with shelters and then call it the solution. Next speaker is Ilya Gurin. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Ilya Gurin, and I'm an 11 year Mountain View resident. I support the project for reasons already stated, and I urge all of my kind and compassionate neighbors speaking against the project to please propose alternate locations where we can house people who are already homeless and living on the streets. Thank you. I yield my time. Next speaker is David. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I live in the city of Santa Clara. Um, as a new parent to a Piedmont build, my wife and I picked the Durland due to its uh, child uh, friendliness. Um, and all of my neighbors did not know about this. We opposed uh, the, this permanent health homeless shelter project. There are other locations such as office parks that right next, uh, instead of right next to schools and vulnerable kids, vetting doesn't work at all. Just look at the male Peter's home key. There was a murder there. All, after all of that vetting, there was a murder. Please vote no. Um, the mayor and city are suing. Next speaker is Sophia Kachi. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I represent my 179 neighbors in the Santa Clara neighborhood and say no to this project. My father has attacked by a homeless person who has mental problem. It was hopeless and scary at the moment for a senior person. This project is lack of transparency, lack of consideration for safety for our senior people and kids. Please do not ignore more than 3,000 of physical signature being collected for opposing the project. Please do not ignore our voice. We are real local majority residents. Next speaker is Mia. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Mia, are you there? Hello. Go ahead. Hello. I'm a Mountain View resident. I live here over seven years. I strongly oppose this Crestview project. This set is too close to schools, senior center, and the playgrounds. I urge you can consider other locations not near high density residential areas. Please vote no to Crestview Home Key projects. Please uh, listen to our voice. Thank you. Next speaker is Kate Cow. You have 30 seconds. Oh, it looks like she's using an older version of Zoom, so we won't be able to let her speak. Next speaker is Rafa Sonnenfeld. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
I support this project. Um, I've managed a homeless shelter in Santa Cruz. We've had clients driven to our programs from the South Bay because there isn't adequate capacity in your shelters. We need permanent housing to make our shelter system a real pathway to housing instead of a revolving door back onto the streets. Housing is health care and a human right. We need this project now because it'll benefit any, everyone in our region and improve everyone's quality of life. The next speaker is Eric Poikon. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Eric Poikon. I also work in the Mountain View area. I support this project and encourage uh, council to endorse it as well. I think one of the misnomers that a lot of these community caring community members are mentioning is unfounded, especially with the care of kids when many of our um, house population have kids that need to go to school and need that uh, safety within the home. I yield my time. Next speaker is Stephen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. I strongly oppose to the three locations of a home key project in Sunnyvale and Mountainville. I'm a Mountainville resident close to uh, Crystal Hotel. Clearly, this project is led of financial uh, transparency. Meanwhile, after this funding, who is going to continue paying to support these people? And how to deal with other 99% homeless people? We need to see the whole plan uh, how to uh, solve this uh, uh, homeless issue. This is not a solution. Please vote no. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, so can you help me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm a local resident. I'm strongly against this proposal to build a home, uh, to build a homeless housing. Uh, I asked him, all my members, they uh, labors, they all against this project. So I heard some some people from the organization that supports, but that not local residents. I said that we can let people vote. People walk within one mile to vote for this project, but to Next speaker is Sophie Liu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm a local resident and I'm strongly opposed to this project. And I want to focus this project's lack of financial transparency. The Santa Clara County will spend donor of 60, 60 million or 23 million to purchase lease funds for only 67 uh, housing units. However, until now, we haven't seen the appraisal report yet. So how can Santa Clara County know this hotel is worth buying? Next speaker is Alyssa Weatherston. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. And David, before you start with Alyssa, yes. we're going to stop accepting public comment now. Um, any more people registering on? We have 25 in the queue, and that'll be the 25, final 25. I'm putting a cap on the speaking on this item. Understood. Thank you. One moment, please. Okay, we have the name of the last speaker in the queue. All right, uh, Alyssa Weatherston, you are unmuted. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Alyssa, are you there? Alyssa is not there. Uh, okay, next speaker is Vanessa. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. Uh, so I'm a Sunnyvale resident. I strongly oppose to the Home Key Project in the Santa Clara. My major concern is that lack of coordination with local PD, fire department, and lack of funding to the local PD and fire de department seems to be a concern, considering increased population and uncles. The tenants in the home key are not uh, taxpayers, and they won't contribute to the funding as much as the other uh, local residents. Next speaker is Emily Zhang. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Emily, are you there? We do not have Emily. We'll move on. Next speaker is Jennifer Liu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I would like to restate the fact that we collected over 1,300 wet signed petitions opposing Crestville project from Santa Clara County residents and eligible voter in less than seven days. In addition, over 1,800 signed online petitions to hold the purchase of Crestville Hotel. These all clearly indicate that the community has not been properly engaged and that our input has not been satisfactorily incorporated into the Crestville proposal or community meetings. We urge other supervisors to vote no. Next speaker is Chen Yang Yu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Hi, I strongly oppose the uh, location of these three sites. Yes, uh, we do want to help home, homeless people, but the location is totally wrong, right? Every, someone said everyone has the right to live and they enjoy the housing, but why not build this in the White House? Why not build it in Beverly Hill? Because it's not a reasonable place. The same concept is here. Don't mix around. It's just not right the location. Next speaker is Sarah Ahn. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I live in the Crestview neighborhood and I strongly oppose this project. Building homeless shelters in these locations do not really solve the problem and will create many new problems, especially when this decision is not supported by local communities. Please vote no and find more affordable locations so that we can really help everyone. Thank you. Next speaker is Taylor. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Taylor. First, first of all, I want to say I strong, strongly oppose converting Bella West into home key project because this this place is not a good place. This place is surrounded by all the residential people and all the elementary school. My concern is about my children's safety. Safety. Who can guarantee their their safety? And also, police show show the kindness to to the to the residential people, not only the homeless people. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is is Johnny Zhang. You have thirty seconds. Please go ahead. Johnny, are you there? We do not have Johnny. We'll move on. Next speaker is SC. You have thirty seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Serena Chua. I'm a long-term resident in Mountain View for more than 10 years. I strongly oppose, oppose this project and I would like committee to vote no um, and not to go forward with this because um, uh, I support homeless and I support to get them out of the homelessness, but a solution should not jeopardize the safety of local residents and it should not destroy neighborhood and it should not create more homeless in the long run. Also, I drove by the area lately and you're already showing stores closing and things are coming. Um... Next speaker is Ryan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Ryan, are you there? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I muted you. Hold on one moment. Unmute yourself again, please. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Hi, hi. Hey, this is Ryan. I'm a resident in Santa Clara. But before I came into the meeting, I'm actually for the housing project. Now I have concerns. Uh, I hear so many different opinions from different parties. I I don't think I think I actually think we should delay this and reconsider uh, from the beginning. A homeless shelter cannot live without major support from the community. More border members, are you ready for the protests and the public conflicts for, from all the people, all the neighborhoods, all the people in the neighborhood? That will be terrible. Next speaker is Leon. You have thirty seconds. Please go ahead. Leon, are you there? We do not have Leon. We'll move on. The next speaker is Maggie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm a resident of San Diego. I'm here to express my deepest concern to the Home Key Project and request transparency. Have you heard that in San Francisco, one homeless tent a year costs taxpayer dollars, 61000 How ridiculous, right? How corrupt was that money spent? For Crest View project, the cost projection is 40,000 per room. Why it is so expensive? Another corrupt project? I don't know. But I do know we want transparency. We want public engagement. Next speaker is Michelle Lai. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my call. I strongly opposite, uh, oppose to this uh, project. It's not because of project itself, it's the location wise, we have so much concern. Years ago, I was an auditor working on the audit of the uh, uh, low income people housing in another state. And I see during the audit time, I see how much concern people had in the neighborhood, even though those you know, housing were a little bit remote, not in such a crowded area. And still like people see a lot of- Next speaker is Angela. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Angela, are you there? Yes, 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 I'm here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm the attorney a citizen in Mountain View. I'm strongly against the project because it's close to our community. We have kids, so we need a safe environment to live. We, uh, we want to help work homeless, but we uh, hope you can think about another place 
uh, far from the city. Please, please, please. Next speaker is King Xie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I live very close to the to this hotel. So me and my neighborhood and together with thousands of local residents are against this project. I think it's, overall this project lacks of transparency, public communication, and also risk analysis. We want to help the, uh, the homeless, but like a, a supporter said that I think the city should come up with a, a list of all possible locations, budget, and we have a complete analysis. That's the job that the city should do. Thank you. Next speaker is Jessica Sutter. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Jessica, are you there? We do not have Jessica. Okay, we'll move on. Next speaker is Shirley Liu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Shirley, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Shirley, long-time resident in Cal uh, Santa Clara County. Uh, I strongly oppose this uh, home key project. We have uh, many, many concerns about the uh, safety issue around this area. They are too close to our parks, schools, and the uh, playgrounds and the neighborhoods. So we already collected over 30 uh, websites uh, signatures. Please uh, vote no for this project. Thank you. Next speaker is Neil Park McClintock. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Neil, are you there? We do not have Neil. Next speaker is Sophie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a Mountain View resident and I strongly oppose this project. I want to remind the council members the mission of the County of Santa Clara. One of that is to promote a healthy, safe, and prosperous community for all. And we have heard a lot of skepticism around all these issues. I don't think it's prudent to move forward for now. And remember, one of the core values here is value the community. Please listen to your neighborhood. Listen to the people who reside here. The next speaker is Ellen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Ellen. I just want to uh, express my strong oppose to this project. Uh, please listen to the local community. I don't live in uh, uh, too close to the to the area, but uh, the the local resident voice matters. Please listen to them. Most of the people who support this project they don't even live there, so don't speak for them. I, I strongly support the local resident to uh, fight against this project. Thank you. Our final speaker is Alex. You have 30 seconds. Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a student and I live in um, Sunnyvale. I just want to say that there is no financial transparency in this project. The average cost for the new construction is $3,031,000. Um, that is 16.6 .6 million home key found plus 3.7 monoville found. And that is twice as expensive as if we find a site elsewhere. So I strongly oppose to this um, home, uh, home key project at Crestville and I urge the supervisors to vote no. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you, David. Quite a job you're doing today. All right, I am now going to close the public hearing. I'm now going to turn to Consuelo <clears throat> and Jeff, if he's here, to give a brief staff report as we move forward on this item. And then, uh, Supervisor Lee, I'm going to turn to you uh, for comments. Thank you, Board President Wasserman. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. A quick update for you all that we did host a community meeting last week where we addressed some of the um, asks of the board at the last meeting, which included a discussion about the referral process, our selection process of a development partner, um, questions around safety, security, services that are provided, um, and uh, happy to take any additional questions that the board might have. Thank you, Consuelo. I appreciate that. Board members, any questions of staff or a motion? Supervisor Lee, I'm going to turn to you first, then Supervisor Smitty. Oh, maybe we don't have, we do, we do have Supervisor Lee, there you go. Yes, I'm a little slow on the draw here, sorry about that. Um, so, um, 
A quick question for Consuela. I just want to make sure uh, we're clear about the Cresview project, and that is, um, we heard this two weeks ago, right? And uh, some of the questions I think have been asked, but I want to just double check to confirm. The Crestview project is for the permanent supportive housing and that we are going to be able to conduct background check on everybody that comes to, uh, to apply to live in this project, correct? Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for yes. the question. Um, it does include the conversion of the hotel into permanent and affordable housing, which means it will be some combination of supportive housing, either permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing and um, quote unquote, regular affordable, meaning that there's no set aside for those that are previously unhoused. We did also share with the public our intention of setting aside 25% of the units for our transitioned age youth, as that is one of the target populations that we're looking at um, any opportunity that we can to have that set aside. Um, with that said, it is a permanent affordable development, uh, which will include leases. Uh, people do have to go through a background check, um, both for credit and criminal. Um, and that includes, um, you know, that that's the job of the property management. Right, and the concern that we hear a lot of the residents that voice is that they're afraid of these are transients uh, on house. And, and here's the thing is being permanent supportive housing, the leases on these are at least one year long, am I correct? Correct, Supervisor, the folks um, don't leave during the day, it's, it's an apartment building, if you will. Right, and then they do sign long leases, right? Like at least one year lease, am I correct? That is correct, Supervisor. Okay, good. Uh, and in terms of security, there's a lot of concerns about security, about the neighborhood and all that. Um, I was told and even confirmed with me that there is going to be um, uh, management, property management 24-7, overseeing the site with security cameras and things like that. Can you uh, elaborate on that for me, please? Thank you, Supervisor. Similar to our other affordable and supportive housing, the property management budget typically includes some level of security, whether that's to patrol the parking lot, uh, to make sure that people are not trespassing into the building, um, we do have a similar property with a uh, mix that includes uh, previously unhoused veterans down the street. It's about a mile and a half or two miles away. Um, and we would offer the same service that's being provided there. Okay. On that project, you said clear, um, nearby with the veterans over there. Do you see the type of concern that's been raised today by many of the speakers regarding uh, uh, drunkenness or or uh, all those uh, uh, dangerous things that they talked about. No, supervisor, not to our not to our awareness. Uh, we've not heard those complaints for that property. Okay, thank you. And that's the questions I have for staff. And I'm ready to make a statement. I'll just let others uh, on on the board to see if they have any questions for them, for from staff. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair uh, and colleagues and members of the public. Uh, I wanted to. First, uh, go ahead and move the staff recommendation, uh, which is to acquire the property uh, with the various uh, authorizations and delegations contained, but with the further uh, amendment, which is that uh, we would direct the administration to prepare a community impact report within the first 18 months of operations and annually thereafter to be agendized at the board's Housing, Land Use, Environment and Transportation Committee, and to hold community meetings at least once a year throughout the duration of the project to hear any concerns from the community. And those would be in addition to the three additional community meetings that the developer will be holding prior to construction. That is my motion. If I can get a second, I will speak to it. Second. Got a motion, second by Supervisor Chavez. Back to you, Supervisor Smith. Thank you. A um, couple of observations, uh, colleagues, and uh, uh, I do want to uh, ask Mr. Chair that we be mindful on this item, item 14, that it is specific to this project, the Crestview, uh, and only to item 14, the Crestview, notwithstanding the blended uh, community conversation that we've just had. Um, and on the issue of public process and transparency, you know, I'm sure there's always more we can do and I'm sure we can always do it better, but I do wanna highlight in even greater detail uh, the engagement that I referenced at our prior meeting 
uh, because I did go back and check uh, both our notes and our records here in my office. There have been uh, in the last year, uh, so hardly a rushed process, two Mountain View City Council meetings, three County Board of Supervisors meetings, three community outreach meetings, four stories in the Mountain View Voice, four stories in the Mercury News, one county press release, postcard notices within a thousand feet, emails and next door notices as well, and at least a half dozen smaller group meetings, anywhere from one person to 15, that I know have been accommodated because my office was in some way aware of, part of, or helped arrange uh, those meetings. And additionally, I want folks to know, because the project is in my district, um, that I have visited the site personally. I've walked the site, uh, both floors there. Uh, I've driven through the neighborhoods uh, that surround it because I wanted to have that, if not boots in the ground, at least wheels on the ground, understanding of what, uh, what was happening uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so again, I just think um, uh, if, if there were stumbles along the way, and some people think there were, some people think there weren't, I think at this point, uh, we would have to agree that the project has been well and widely noticed. Uh, Ms. Hernandez did not have occasion to reference it, but I noticed that at the most recent community meeting, I think we had more than 300 folks who participated and I saw 500 comments and questions uh, in, the, in the chat. That's a level of engagement for a relatively modest sized project that is rarely achieved. So. Uh, let me just stop there on that piece. Having said that, I think we need to turn to the merits of the project. And um, as I mentioned, I'm focusing exclusively at this point on the merits of the Crestview project on El Camino Real in Mountain View in close proximity to Sunnyvale. And um, I have been persuaded uh, by what I've heard from both the city of Mountain View uh, staff and council as well as our own staff, as well as my own observations, as well as community comments, that it's an appropriate location and a sensible project. Um, and uh, I, I just want folks to know that uh, amidst the tumult that we have uh, experienced around this project, that you know, at some point you really do have to say, uh, is this a, uh, a sound project on the merits? It is my judgment that it is. Years ago, as a local city council member, people used to ask me, you know, how did I decide what I was going to vote for or against? And I said, it was really pretty easy. I voted for good projects and I voted against bad projects. And people kind of roll their eyes, but that, that really is the assessment we are obliged to make at some point. And I wanted to sort of underscore the fact that uh, for me, uh, notwithstanding my own desire to address the, this larger set of issues that we've highlighted, I have to look at every project on a project by project basis and ask myself, do I think the project is fundamentally sound? Um, I am concerned about the level of polarization that we have witnessed in connection with this project. And I think that's something we're gonna have to acknowledge and we're gonna have to work through it. We're gonna have to get past it. And I'm gonna ask everybody, whatever their uh, point of view today to, turn their attention and their efforts to making this the best possible project that it can be. And I don't say that in a goody goody Pollyannish sort of way. If we get a majority of the vote uh, today, and I hope we get a unanimous vote, uh, there will be a project. And then it's on all of us to make sure that it is the kind of quality project that we have told the community uh, we aspire to develop. And, and um, I wanna ask that everyone uh, pro or con, uh, put their efforts towards making that happen. It is clear to me that for whatever set of reasons, there's a lot of anxiety about what the project will or won't be, uh, because that's an uncertainty. And I think folks are understandably uh, almost always anxious about uncertain futures. And it is for that reason that I have added the two uh, directions to the staff recommendation, and I want to read them again and speak to them briefly. In addition to the staff recommendation, which is part of the motion, and thank you to Supervisor Chavez for her second. The motion also directs the administration to prepare, prepare a community impact report 
within the first 18 months of operations and annually thereafter to be agendized at the board's Housing, Land Use, Environment and Transportation Committee. And what I'm trying to achieve here is a couple of things. First and foremost, I want this to be a requirement that obliges the project management team to assess and describe what the impact of the project has been on the surrounding community. And I want that to be an annual event because it will both provide accountability, it will provide incentive to do an ever better job, and it will allow us to speak factually about what does or doesn't happen and what needs to happen going forward. So I don't know what those reports will contain, none of us can, but if we have the reports then coming to our Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee, there will further be a public venue, Mr. Chair, where folks can address any concerns that they believe are still outstanding. And the second thing is um, uh, a direction to the administration that the project management uh, or development team will hold a community meeting at least once a year during the, the life of the project. I know, and I'm gonna to look to Ms. Hernandez to give me a nod and a smile, I hope, that it is our custom and practice to have a contact person at every such project that the community can re reach out to. And I think I see nodding and smiling on that little square, I do. But I think the question that has arisen is, all right, well, but how do I know that won't just be disregarded or dismissed? And so what I'm uh, asking that we further call out and require is a, uh, a formal public meeting to be held by the management of the project once a year. And so if there are folks who have concerns, if there have been issues that they feel are unaddressed, there will be a venue. And again, I think that kind of accountability ensures to an even greater degree that folks will work very hard to make sure that those issues do not arise. And I wanna thank the city of Mountain View and the council for their formal support. It is perhaps hard to remember now, but all of this began when the property owner, as I understand it, reached out to the city of Mountain View and the city of Mountain View had a conversation, gosh, all the way back in January at their city council meeting. And there's a little bit of irony here, Mr. Chair, because, and colleagues, because the city did what we, I think, would typically characterize as a very good government thing. They had an early conversation, back to transparency, that was open and public to talk about the potential use or development of the site. Now, the downside of that was because the conversation was preliminary, that allowed people to imagine all kinds of things and then start a conversation about all kinds of things, which have never been seriously considered, let alone proposed for the site. But um, good to the city, uh, good for them, good for us that they stepped up, ultimately concluded that if they were gonna move forward on this effort, they needed a partner, that would be us. And uh, it will take partnerships of this kind to address the issue. And finally, I'm gonna do something I rarely do, Mr. Chairman, which is I'm gonna speak a little more personally. And so I am looking at my screen and I see Supervisor Otto Lee and Mike Wasserman and Susan Ellenberg and Cindy Chavez. And forgive me, I have a very long ago memory of being a small child raised by a single mother in a place called Roosevelt Towers, which in its day was the poster child for the projects, in this case in East Cambridge, run by the Cambridge Housing Authority. And it is my earliest memory of a place that I called home as my mother raised me as a single mom. I think of it as tall, although it was only eight stories. I remember it as a foreboding place, at least from the outside, but secure once the door to our very modest apartment closed. We were in a project. It was a government housing project. That's where I started my life. And that's where we got a chance for my mother to build a better life for both of us. 
And because we had that chance, she was able to do just that. And I was able to make my way to this valley, go to great public schools, get a college degree, get not one, but two, but three advanced degrees from fine universities, both public and private, serve as an elected official representing now the folks who live in the Mountain View Sunnyvale area. And so when we talk about those people in that kind of a project, I hope you'll understand if it's a little bit more personal than I may typically let on. Those people, that's me and my mother all those years ago. I think I turned out okay. Forgive that lack of modesty. But let's keep that aspirational American dream in our heads and our hearts when we make these kinds of decisions. It doesn't mean we can't exercise, indeed have to exercise good judgment about which projects we vote for and which projects we're obliged to vote against. Of course we do. It doesn't mean that we are not mindful of the legitimate concerns that folks in the surrounding neighborhood have. Of course we are, and of course we should be. But it should also be top of mind that if we're gonna make that dream real, if we're gonna make that possibility, one that every county resident can aspire to, we've gotta to do today what people did for my little household all those years ago on the other side of the country. And I ask for a unanimous I vote today. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Minion, for your uh, very heartfelt uh, uh, speech. And I, I certainly uh, want to learn more about what you went through and, and really respect your views and your public service for all these years, uh, not just at the Board of Supervisors and City of Palo Alto, but also a State Assembly and also State Senate as well. And I would like to also thank all of the residents who took the time to contact our office and sharing your thoughts uh, about these projects. My office this week has received over 400 emails, letters and phone calls in this matter. And I want to let you know that I take your concerns very, very seriously. Your concerns are very real about safety, about your children and many, all my neighbors, Home Key is the program of how our state of California is trying to solve a homeless problem by investing funds to renovate outdated, dilapidated buildings sometimes, such as old motels, or find suitable land places to build more housing, long-term housing, transitional housing, and interim housing. And please do know that not every proposal will be approved for Home Key funding. Suitable ones will be approved, and some unsuitable ones will not be. Some projects are led by cities and some are by counties. The project on the agenda today that we're speaking right now is about Crestview, which is located in Mountain View, my colleague supervisors from Midian's district. Two weeks ago, we've heard in public hearing for at least an hour regarding this issue. And the city of Mountain View has also held public hearings and work on this project close to a year. Crestview is building a permanent supportive housing along with some uh, low income housing or, or affordable housing, shall we say, is located on El Camino Real, a main thoroughfare with lots of services and also a very active bus line. Bus 22, which is 24 hours and serves, unfortunately, this is also called Hotel 22 because many in house have slept on this bus line. Our house problem is very real and we are trying our best to build projects that can be successful so that people are no longer sleeping in tents and overpasses or under overpasses or outside people's businesses. The residents that we anticipate in this uh, Crestview future project will actually are long-term. The leases will be at least one year long and that this is not free living. Residents will be paying monthly rent, subsidized based on the income level and that most of the residents will have a job. Every resident will have some income because if they have no income per se, they will not even be qualified because they can't pay rent. No one lives here for free. Also, 
all residents will have to be qualified going through a long and thorough vetting process, such as background checks that we talked about. The future residents are not and will not be the so-called transient homeless or drug dealers or criminals as stated on these flyers that we've been seeing on the social media because folks like that will not pass a background check. Some residents actually will be families and some will be even young children. Some will be veterans who have served in wars that defended our country's freedom. And as a veteran myself who has served the Navy for 28 years, including in Iraq, I could tell you that I think it'll be very important we provide our returning veterans the housing they so desperately need. The neighboring project for veterans, as we just learned, have also proven to be successful without those scary incidents that's mentioned today. There will be support staff on site at the front desk for Crestview development and with security cameras. And let me just repeat that. There will be folks on site. This is not just some housing. There'll be people on site. There'll be security to ensure the safety inside and surrounding the building. There's a lot of falsehood being spread about something how more tens of homeless people will come in these home key projects. No. Absolutely not. There will not be allowed any tents or any increase of tents in your neighborhood. The reason we're building is so that we can keep people away from living in tents and that they will not be putting tents in our parks or our neighborhoods. And I want everybody to please stay engaged. If the project's approved, we need everyone to stay in touch to make sure that this is going to be successful, that we won't have trash or criminal activity or anything like that in the neighborhood. And we want to make sure we hold the property management uh, company to be responsible and accountable. And I want everybody to be as engaged today and not just to give up whatever the outcome to be, because we really want to keep our neighborhood safe and su successful. And thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you. I don't see any other supervisors speaking. We have a motion by Supervisor Chavez, excuse me, Supervisor Simidian, a second by Chavez. Uh, Supervisor Lee, your hand is up. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. No problem at all. So I'll call for uh, David to give us a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Item 14 passes unanimously. We now move on to item 15, which is a public hearing for purchase of real property located at 3550 El Camino Real in Santa Clara. I'm going to open the public hearing now and receive testimony. David, we have people registering, uh, speaking on this item, and we're going to limit the speaking of this item to 30 minutes. We still have another public health, excuse me, another public hearing, and then we have the public health presentation as well. So we're going to go from 2 to 2.30 if needed for the speakers. If not, we'll um, conclude public speaking prior to that. Then, uh, then we'll close the public hearing then have a staff report and then discussion among the supervisors. David, All right. Go ahead, please, with the speakers. All right, one moment. We'll get the timer up. Next speaker is Ethan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Ethan, are you there? We do not have Ethan. Next speaker is Joyce Lang. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. So we strongly oppose these three sites for the home key projects. We su suggest you pick some other sites so the home key people can have spacious housing, are not, uh, but not like in this limited area, uh, limited space. So we have 3,000 wet signatures to oppose this, and you just ignore it. So we will vote you out, and we have contacted GOP members, and also we will have uh, continued effort in explore the corruption inside these projects. Next speaker is Kelly. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Kelly. I live in Santa Clara for over 10 years. I strongly oppose converting Bella West into home key projects. I'm not against to support to have a place to for homeless people to stay or whoever in the place to, to stay. But so please reconsider the location. This location is surrounded by over 10 elementary school and close to DMV. We all know the teenagers need to go there to get their driver license. Who can guarantee their safety? So please consider us. And we as a human, 
Next speaker is Kelly. You have 30 seconds. Oh, Kelly dropped off. Next speaker is Derek Y. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, I live in Santa Clara. Uh, I'm a Santa Clara resident. The census selection for the uh, the Vista Inn is very bad. It's like actually connecting to some uh, single family house by a patio directly. And uh, also, it is only an interim uh, uh, housing, which doesn't pro uh, provide long term housing for the homeless people at all. And also, I'm questioning the transparency of the outreach. Because you are always using affordable housing, but it's actually now it's for homeless people. Next speaker is Faith H. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Faith, are you there? Faith is not there. Patrick Jones, you are next. You are unmuted. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Patrick, are you there? We do not have Patrick. Next speaker is Emily. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, I strongly disagree the project. The site is located in a busy commercial area and close to the schools and the parks. The real data shows that many of the homeless could have uh, potential mental issues. Then my question is how to ensure the kids' safety. So I strongly urge you to hear about the neighbor concerns and make further dis uh, consideration and vote no to this project. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Serta. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Serta, are you there? Do not have Serta. Next speaker is Yvette. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. So I attended the community meeting two days ago, several days ago, and also uh, listened through today's meeting. And I'm just deeply disappointed. I feel all the neighbor community's voices are being dismissed. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's just a waste of hours for us to like attend those meetings and how our voice can be heard by you. Next speaker is Emily Davis. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm a long, long time resident of Santa Clara. I'm so disappointed. Seems like supervisors are not listening to your local residents. And we haven't seen any detailed plan. We are uh, Someone just mentioned there will be lease contract, but lease contract is nothing. It is meaningless, ridiculous. How to ensure safety? What about drug screening? How to provide enough health care? And what is long time funding? We pay the tax. We have the right to know. This is a. Next speaker is Ella Lee. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Ella, are you there? We do not have Ella, we'll move on. Next speaker is Tim McKenzie. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, Tim McKenzie. I've been a resident of Santa Clara County for nearly a decade at this point. Um, I live in Mountain View and was very pleased with the Crestview project that you just voted for. Uh, the outreach was really great. There was a lot of community engagement. I'm sure there was a similar outreach for this project and I'm really happy to see similar projects being built up to help address the uh, housing crisis that we have in our area. And I just wanna express my unreserved support and thank you for the work you're doing. Next speaker is Alex Shore. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, this is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. Our members had a chance to score the Clara Gardens project from Resources for Community Development in Santa Clara and gave it a four out of five not only does it provide needed housing for our community, but RCD is thinking very deliberately about how to build community beyond just for the residents and how to make it beneficial for all of us. We have a, a moral imperative to build housing in our community. Let's have the board support moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sarah Kay. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm a local resident in Santa Clara area. I vote no, um, oppose this project at Bella Vista Inn. Um, this is a not an ideal location to, for this project to be in. And we already see that the Milpitas has a very bad uh, impact to the neighborhood. I really oppose this project. Yeah, thank you. Next speaker is Alyssa Weatherston. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. 
Hello there. I'm a DSA member and Sunnyvale homeowner here to support the Homekey project. I've been following these projects for a while and I'm confused that so many of my fellow Santa Clara residents who say they care about the homeless in our community weren't aware of these developments. Please don't let a few people riled up by social media delay this urgently needed project. Supervisor Lee, you're my representative and I hope you support this project. Next speaker is Rick. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. My name is Rick Salvis with SV at Home. I was born and raised in the city of Santa Clara. I own property in the city of Santa Clara, and I strongly support the county's acquisition of 3550 El Camino Real in Santa Clara. You're evaluating nine worthy uh, projects to house the unhoused, and all of them are underutilized sites. Some of them are already in term housing, making them perfect for solving our housing needs. I urge you to support the acquisition of this site. RCD is doing a great job connecting with the community. Thank you. Next speaker is David. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Um, hello. Um, so there's actually an online comment that some of you supervisors actually had a private conversation that you're personally against this project too and totally understand why the two neighborhoods say no, but you got too much pressure from the peers and the party. So if that's true, don't worry. We have thousands people behind you and supporting you, you see we already have more than 3,000 vote, I mean, signatures. Vote no, please. Next speaker is Cindy Newman. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. I totally support this project. I'm familiar with it. I've taken my alcoholic sister there to dry out. Um, the best thing we can do is repurpose these um, older hotels and motels to be uh, supportive housing to help solve the problem. Um, the fear of people about their children and the parks and the traffic, for heaven's sakes, if we don't house them, they will be in your parks using your bathrooms. So if you're afra afraid of them now on Il Camino, don't. Do Next speaker is Winnie. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Winnie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes. Hi, I'm a daycare teacher. This project is right in my backyard. I do not support this project. Like all of my neighbors, no one in my neighborhood was informed of this until two weeks ago. It's proven by statistics that, unfortunately, homeless population have higher ten tendency to cause danger to themselves and those around them. Building it in the middle of so many daycare, preschool, elementary school is absolutely cause safety issues. I strongly urge you to vote no on the project. Next speaker is Jonathan Van Kloot. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I think it's critical that people understand that these projects are not all the same. Crestview has leases, rents, background checks, but from what I've been reading, the Bella Vista and White Oak projects don't have any such things at all. They're purely short-term interim housing for the most troubled people. Where will they go when their time is up? I'm expecting the nearby parks. Vote no on Bella Vista and White Oak, please. Thank you. Next speaker is Derek Hicks. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Derek Hicks, and I represent Catalyze SV and the members of our Project Advocacy Committee who, are, who reside across Santa Clara County. On behalf of our members, I would like to express our strong support for the proposed Home Key Project located at the Bella Vista Hotel site, as well as the other Home Key Projects on today's agenda. These home key projects will provide much needed housing at the deepest levels of affordability and will provide a tangible solution to alleviating our homeless issue. Our members have reviewed the proposed plan for Bella Vista and agree that the uh, designs are thoughtfully executed and done to a high standard that would. Next speaker is Loretto QD. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm Loretto Cavetto de Mandal from Milpitas, or Loretto Cutis Brigade Silicon Valley, and I strongly support these and other project home key projects and all sorts of housing all over the county for unhoused and underprivileged neighbors who need a lot of help. We're all taxpayers, even if we don't live in the city of Santa Clara. I haven't read nor heard Milpitas Project Home Key residents attacking any Milpitas residents. Better that they're housed than roaming around in our neighborhoods. Suggestion to Santa Clara County, community impact report should be every six months, not 80 months, because it might be too late for reforms if project manage. Next speaker is Jennifer. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Jennifer, are you there? We do not have Jennifer. We'll move on. The next speaker is a phone caller ending in 910. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Phone caller ending in 910, are you there? No, they are not unmuting. We'll move on. Next speaker is Selena Nate. You have 30 seconds. Oh, I apologize. They're using an older version of Zoom. We won't be able to hear them speak. No worries. Next speaker is Urji Wang. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Urji. Uh, I'm living in the Pomeroy uh, neighborhood, and I talk with my neighbors, and uh, almost none of them are informed about this project of a Bala, Bala Vista Inn. And uh, according to the research from UCLA, like 40% or 45% of the homeless people, they have a mentally illness. So how do you, uh, so that is our concern about the safety to the, to the neighborhood. So I, I suggest that all the supervisors vote no for this, yeah, thanks. Next speaker is Galen Davis. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Galen Kiln Davis, Chair of Livable Sunnyvale, a true life organization with over 130 members. You're free to come to the meetings and check us out. I am speaking only as myself today. Uh, we have not taken up this issue uh, at Livable Sunnyvale. Nonetheless, I strongly support this project. It's a step in the right direction to solving a problem that we need to make serious progress on. I fully support the supervisors and whatever decision they make. Thank you. Next speaker is James. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. This is like eye opening. Like, are, are you guys really listening to the, the voices? Like, we have so many voices uh, objecting to this, and you just uh, pretend nothing exists and just move as it, as it planned already. And just add a small, like, uh, addendum and say the issue is being addressed. Previously, all the recharge are just like, purposely picking supporters and i don't think anyone is like op opponent are included next speaker is vivian gonzalez you have 30 seconds please go ahead hello i just have a question counselor last time in the monoville meeting mentioned that it's not required a job test when finding a job so the same there's no job test for these homeless sh uh, sh shelters and there's public videos on that. Also in the Crestfield community meeting five days ago, Ms. Hernandez, you said there wouldn't be any drug test and you smile at the idea a homeless person enjoy drugs secretly in his room. So is this how you do background checking? How do we trust you to take care of our safety? I strongly oppose. Next speaker is Yang. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. I, I strongly oppose the location at Bella Vista Yin. Firstly, the outreach is quite limited. I was in, I live within 10 minutes walk from there. I never got any notice. But the county officer said 2000 has been sent. Where are these go? You already hear so many uh, post options from neighborhood. For those who support it, please consider local residents. Well, we within, live within 10 minutes walk from there. We, we need to be taken care also. Next speaker is Ethan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm strongly against this home key project. Tons of local residents are just aware of this project two weeks ago, and we are trying to let our local opposition voice out to be heard. But today we see there is a fast growing opposition. How come the county can completely ignore and doesn't care at all about our voice? Local residents are against this project and your decision will be remembered. Please vote no. Next speaker is Sunnyvale Local. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 24-year-old transgender woman was killed living in an under construction room at Neil Peters home, uh, home Key Project. When this happened, Santa Clara County only terminated the management company. This type of action is a good sign of lack of accountability. According to the report, Ms. Hernandez could not be reached for comment despite multiple attempts. I don't think this builds trust at all. Management company review, useless. Next speaker is Rebecca. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I live 350 feet away from Bella Vista Inn and I'm a new mom with a newborn. Anyone can tell me you do not need to worry about the homeless projects. However, it is my child who will be walking to school and playing in the neighborhood every day. It is me that will worry it 
if I let my kids play with their friends in the neighborhood every day. So if you are also a parent, please understand a mom's concern. Please listen to the people who actually live nearby. So I urge people who have right to vote to vote no to this project until parents' concern can be well addressed. Thank Next speaker is Gabriel. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I live in a neighborhood. Every week, I go to Walgreens, Lucky, and Big Lots. This site is practically a home yard to me. I'm very worried and disappointed. My con many concerns have not been addressed. The voice of people have not been heard, and it is creating many problems, and uh, which I cannot list here in 30 seconds. And now it's leading to a horrible disaster. I strongly oppose to home key projects. Please vote no, no, no. Next speaker is Olia Sorokina. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, hi, um, uh, I'm speaking in support of uh, um, home key uh, projects. Um, it's not a secret that permanent supportive housing has proven itself as an effective method of keeping people housed. Um, besides, we as citizens and um, elected officials have the duty to uphold the state and federal law to affirmatively further fair housing by placing permanent supportive housing in resource rich areas, which uh, both of the uh, Next speaker is Rebecca. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm a resident of Santa Clara for many years, and I strongly oppose the home key sites that are so close to schools, park, and residential neighborhoods like Bella Vista Inn and other sites, and need more transparency of the project, which will spend over 23 million. We have around 3,000 signatures online and 4,000 physical signatures collected from nearby residents, and we will like the city council to review the plans and adjust the concerns of residents. We'll go to the current project sites and find the right place for the. Next speaker is Amy Kay. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Amy, are you there? We do not have Amy. We'll move on. Next speaker is Faith H. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Faith, are you there? We don't have faith. Um, next speaker is Anna. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Anna. I strongly oppose converting the Bella Vista into the home key project because it's very, very close to, to the other elementary school and it, it's close to the residential area. So whoever please vote no to this project, we have over 3,300 people Please, please, please hear our voice. Don't ignore us, okay? We are also residential. Please take care of us. Thank you. Next speaker is Lily. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I against uh, the uh, Bella Vista um, interim housing project because this um, applicant, um, they, they would have mental issues and there is no background check as uh, many people have already mentioned. And um, these people are, um, they don't have any, um, please say no to it, sorry. Next speaker is Steve, you have 30 seconds, please go ahead. I just want to say that, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Cool, yeah, I just want to say this entire process is just so in in transparent. And, uh, you know, we have more than 7,000 people sign the signature, both online and physical, and you don't take this seriously. And clearly there's a lot of, you are fail, failing a lot of people. And as elect, elected officials, you have, to rem you have to represent people. And if you don't do so, you know, people are just gonna remember what you did. Next speaker is James Liu. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, I just some uh, question for uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, you are the representative of the city of Ambu Peters. Do you know what's really happening in the Hillview Core Conkey project? Do you know the difference of Hillview Core Conkey project and the Crestview? Do you hold accountability for what you said about uh, this uh, core field? You said there's no drug screen, but on the committee meet meeting, the officials said that there will be no drug screen. What you said is not true. You need to hold your accountability for what you said today. Please. 
Next speaker is Jessica Sutter. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I oppose the Bella Vista project. I talked to the merchants surrounding Bella Vista Inn, Walgreens, cafe, tea house, dry cleaner, etc. They all opposed it. They see all sorts of people and all know what it will be like when an interim housing for unsheltered people is just one minute walk away from them. What's more, none of the docs or slides or meetings on this project address the child safety concerns to give any detailed effective plans on how to actually screen out sex offenders or people who might harm our kids living nearby. With over 3,000 local residents signing against it, if it is as ideal and- Next speaker is Catherine. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I live here and I just know it about a week ago. Almost everybody I know it said no. You can keep ignoring us, ignoring 7,000 total wet signatures and I-9 petitions. And you, you can keep fooling us by fooling us saying, okay, there is similar to Crestview. No, it's not. It's not permanent housing, it's temporary housing. And it's, uh, and it's, there is no public outreach before. This is the first meeting I heard about the Bella Vista Inn. Don't fool us. Next speaker is Abby Tuning. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Abby Tuning, and I'm calling on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition in support of this home key project. The Bella Vista is a great opportunity to provide housing for some of our most vulnerable neighbors, and supportive projects like this are a critical part of preventing displacement and solving our housing shortage. So we urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Next speaker is Kyung Chen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I strongly oppose this project because I live in Santa Clara for a long while. If you go outside and talk to your neighbors, no one supports this, this project. I think this is a not transparent project and it will bring a lot of issues like safety to our kids and schools and no one cares. And we will definitely vote who support this uh, project out next time in the next election. That's all. Next speaker is Salim. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Salim, are you there? We do not have Salim. Next speaker is Kelsey Baines. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, um, this is Kelsey Baines, the regional director for Yimby Action and real Santa Clara County resident. Um, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for your leadership in supporting Home Key and your commitment to ending homelessness in our county. We know what works to end homelessness, and it is cheaper and safer for everyone, including our unhoused neighbors, to house people. It makes me very sad that it seems like people in every neighborhood think their neighborhood is the wrong neighborhood for solutions. Thank you. Next speaker is Alex Chan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I strongly oppose the location selection and Bella Vista. Uh, in, in Crestview meeting five days ago, Mrs. Hernandez said, compared to Crestview, the Bella Vista and the YO are, are the actual homeless shelter. There's no drug screening and no background check, and there's no actual public hearing before today. The whole process is moving so silently and quickly without transparency. We don't know what kind of deal, what kind of corruption is under hidden beneath. There are much better locations that you can build twice the amount of units across me. Please will, will know. To home key at Bella Vista Y Oak. If you Next speaker is Sarah Y. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I live in the Santa Clara City, just 10 minutes of walk away from the Bella Vista site location. I strongly oppose the current home key project location. There are no plans to ensure the community safety. And similar home key project in Milpitas, 58 911 calls were generated from the home key site in just four months, including rape, assault, and mental health. I urge you to listen to real, real local residents. Educate yourself about the location and vote no. Next speaker is Samina Usman. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Samina, are you there? I'm here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You're a little faint. Hello. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm driving. Um, um, my name is Samina. I am a strong supporter of this uh, project and all other home key projects. I'm a Santa Clara um, resident and homeowner, and um, I, I feel like we, this is long overdue. We absolutely need to be supporting those. It's our mortal, it is our moral responsibility to do so. We are the richest nation, the richest area of this richest nation, and we should be supporting those who are unhoused. 
The next speaker is Wayne. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I strongly oppose the investment in projects. We have over 800 volunteers to go through every street, knock every door in the neighborhood, and no one support it. And then we have collected over 3,000 metal signatures within only three days, and it will, it will definitely be more in the future. In the last meeting, Mr. Hernandez says there's no screen, screen screening process, there's no background check, there's no drug test in those locations. How do we ensure our neighborhood uh, security? Please vote no for, for it. Thank you. Next speaker is Mary Gloner. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Mary Gloner. I'm speaking as a homeowner in Santa Clara for over 25 years as a child of Chinese Filipino immigrants who came to this country to live the American dream and a first generation graduate of Santa Clara University. I'm speaking in support of the proposed home key projects. I wanna thank the staff, the community leaders for developing a compassionate, comprehensive, humane and preventive model to housing that benefited families like mine. Thank you. President Wasserman, it's now 2.30 PM. Thank you very much, David, well done. Um, we will now close the public hearing and I will now turn to Consuelo for a staff report and then I'll turn to supervisors for questions or a motion. Thank you, Board President Wasserman, Consuelo Hernandez here. Um, I just wanted to share, I know that community engagement has been a key question in this process. And I just wanted to share that the approach at every city is a little different. Um, in Mountain View, as Supervisor Samidian mentioned, it was very much a lead of the city to uh, partner with the county very explicitly. In the city of Santa Clara, we discuss these opportunities in a different way, where we each take our respective roles in a project, depending on what, what that is. In the case of Bella Vista Inn, um, the role that the city played is in advertising our engagement, meeting with the development partner to understand the two phases of the project. The developer held a community meeting on August 30th. Um, the city manager, through her newsletter, let the entire city know um, that this meeting was taking place. Um, and with that, we still only had 30 participants. Um, through the past six months, our CD in partnership with our office um, and Supervisor Ellenberg's team in terms of identifying key stakeholders have walked the neighborhood, have provided um, information to the businesses around it, have met with the HOA behind the property, um, including one-on-one um, -on -one stakeholder meetings and um, some group discussions, as you mentioned, as you heard today, Catalyze SV scored the project. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, the project includes two phases. We are submitting an application for home key for phase one, which would basically allow us to use the hotel while the developer is exploring a long-term affordable and supportive housing project at the site. Without that, the, the hotel would basically sit there vacant, underutilized, and um, people would more than likely break into it. Um, otherwise, it would not be used. So the home key application is just for the first three years while the developer works with the city of Santa Clara for a permanent re uh, renovation of the project including the construction of a new seven-story tower, um, where in the end, it would be a 120-unit permanent housing project. In the interim, we would use it to house people that are waiting, that are on the community queue, um, that have a disabling condition, that need assistance to connect them to services um, while they wait for their permanent housing units or other housing programs to open. Um, happy to take additional questions from the board. Thank you, Consuelo. I'll start with Vice President Ellenberg for questions or a motion. Uh, I'm going to move approval of the of the project, but um, and hope for a second, and then I'll have a couple of comments. Second, right. from Chavez. Second from Chavez. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Consuelo. I I want to express appreciation to you and the um, developer partner for for reaching out to the community. Outreach is is um, our responsibility. But I would also note that residents have a role in in paying attention to information that that is put out and disseminated. And I think that it is in our interest to use as many um, types of vehicles for communication as is possible. Uh, the city manager going out to all residents, I think, was was a very good idea. Uh, reaching out to neighborhood associations, 
using, uh, as you do with, with my office, using the board offices to reach our constituents. Um, but I just want to note as well that it's really important for folks to be civically engaged and to pay attention and to know when, take it upon themselves to find out as well when, when issues and new projects are arising. And we will continue to do our best to, to not only push information out, but to invite residents in for these really important conversations. So I wanted to thank you for that and um, emphasize again that, that I'm very happy uh, to make my office resources available for community engagement on this and any other project in D4. Thank you very much. So we have a motion and we have a second. The motion is to adopt the resolution as recommended by staff. Do we have any other comments? Otherwise, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Yes, uh, I would like to. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, first, I would like to add a similar uh, amendment as uh, stated by a supervised committee and regarding the community impact report. Uh, I would like to add uh, the same where it's like within the first uh, no long, no later than 18 months uh, to have the community meeting also every year thereafter uh, during the life of project so that uh, the community get uh, notified what's going on. Is that acceptable to the maker? That's absolutely fine. Thank you. And to the seconder? Yes. Thank you very much. Anything further, Supervisor Lee? Yes, that's a question. I'll go make a comment as well if uh, the time is appropriate. Yes. Sure. Um, there were some comments earlier uh, regarding the, uh, the, the background check issue. Uh, I just want to confirm, uh, there is no planned drug test, but there will be background check if, and if that uh, project one day become a permanent support housing. I'm not saying it will be, but I'm saying the plan is that any permanent support housing does include a background check, correct, Consuelo? Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Um, yes, when there is a an apartment building that requires an application for mm -hmm. a rent, uh, you know, rental agreement, there is a background um, and credit check that takes place. Okay, all right. Just want to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Um, and on this issue, before I, I share how I vote and why, I would like to share with my colleagues in the public that this has been some pretty uh, unfortunate misinformation that has been spreading around about me on this specific item. Uh, they have been flyers floating around making personal character attacks about me and how I would, quote, bring massive homeless shelters, unquote, to my own neighborhood. And I just need to get the facts straight. First of all, Sunnyvale already has one homeless shelter at 999 Hamlin on North Sunnyvale, near 101 and 237. We are not voting today for any other shelter. Anyone saying that either don't know the difference or deliberately scaring you by giving you misleading information. My family and I lived in Ponderosa area for over 25 years, and I'm an immigrant from Asia on Hong Kong. My three daughters have attended Ponderosa Elementary School and my youngest is a fifth grader there. I've owned my home off of Iris since 2011, and it would make absolutely no sense, no sense for me to increase crime in any residential neighborhood, and especially in my own neighborhood. As an immigrant to this country, I've served the Sunnyvale community as planning commissioner council member, vice mayor, and mayor for 13 years, and since 97, and before serving now as county supervisor. I'm proud to say that Sunnyvale has been ranked as one of the top 10 safest cities in the United States during my service, and I'm certainly proud of that accomplishment. I serve to give back to my country that has given me and my family so much. For today, there are two items that's being considered near Ponderosa Park that will seek home key, home key funding. Both of these are located in the city of Santa Clara. The first one is improving and renovating the La Vista Inn on El Camino Real near Lawrence Expressway, which is about a quarter mile from the Sunnyvale border. The second one that earlier people have spoken to as well is about White Oak Lane, which is a interim container housing project on about 0.7 acre lot near Ponchiana on Lawrence Expressway, next to the 7-Eleven near the Sunnyvale border. Today, we're only voting on the first project, Bella Vista, and not the one regarding White Oak Lane. When we talk about container housing unit, this is something that I've lived in myself while I'm serving in the military in Iraq. It's much more cost effective, it's fast to build, and the need is certainly here with our homeless, unhoused problems. However, I certainly do not necessarily support every container housing project if the location is wrong and if the site is of the wrong size. 
And I'm going to come right out and state that I do not support the White Oak Lane proposal for its location and size. But since this is under the city of Santa Clara jurisdiction, we need to contact Santa Clara City Council and the council members to voice these concerns. White Oak is not the subject of discussion today. Now I will end my comments here and focus on what we are voting today, which is Bella Vista in project. Bella Vista is located also on El Camino Real with lots of services and on the VTA bus line. Un unfortunately, when I do some research on Yelp and Melcrest about Bella Vista Inn, it's actually ranked as a one and a half star motel with many, many problems currently. Many guests have given it one star and stated things I cannot say in a public and a respectful manner. According to these comments, in summary, police and other complaints are a daily occurrence relating to drug use, potentially human trafficking, and other ills that many, many people are worried about today. And this has been going for actually months or years. Bella Vista is not in a good shape and needs to go. To fix these type of problems, our county, along with the city of Santa Clara, is using this opportunity to obtain state funds to fix this neighborhood problem. And this will be renovated into a much better place for everyone and also for our neighborhood. We actually will be improving the neighborhood with this development. And by, by no means are we gonna make it ever worse. We talked about the seven story um, building that we're gonna put in. And this is a very exciting project. If you haven't seen the drawings. And I really do think that this is a very exciting project that we should be proud of someday. Some talked about the home key project in Lopitas and Hillview Court. And I'm gonna tell you right now, there are no tents being pitched at the Hillview Court project. If you drive by Hillview Court, you will not be able to tell it's a project for the in-house. It looks like a motel with a parking lot with security managed 24 seven. This project actually, the Hillview Court is still not yet finished and we're still doing renovations until December. And I personally and my staff have been monitoring this project very closely to make sure that it is secure is safe to the neighborhood and become successful. By constructing more housing units, more people living on the streets will be first moved into interim housing first, like shelter. Only those who are qualified for background checks will then move to permanent supportive housing because our goal was to reduce and end homelessness, move everyone living on the streets and the creeks into shelter first. Some have raised concerns about the price tag of the project. And I just wanna say that this is not just about renovating a simple motel. This also includes the built, the putting in these supportive services. Some of us call the wraparound services. Continuing supporting areas related to job placement, medical, behavior, health counseling, and referrals. These are the type of services that are extremely important to make sure the needs are being addressed. It is not just housing we're talking about. Ultimately, what we're doing is we want to reduce those tents on the streets and the creeks and help so many that's needed for so many years. For those of you who mentioned that you do care about homeless and unhoused people, thank you and we welcome your help. For example, Project Helping Hand based right here in Sunnyvale has been doing God's work, volunteering and reaching out to the homeless throughout Sunnyvale at Fair Oaks Park, at the library, by the creeks and provided food and warm clothing to them in time of need, like last week's during the rainstorm. Please contact our office at 408-299-5030 and we will connect you to groups like these that serve our most vulnerable neighbors and residents. Finally, as I've lived in Ponrose Park for 25 years, I have no plan of leaving. And I welcome to work with you on your concerns in your neighborhood and don't believe these flyers on your, wall, on your door. And I look forward to seeing each and one of, every one of you to talk about these things and also our concerns about White Oak Lane in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We have a motion by Ellenberg, a second by Chavez. If there's no further discussion, I'll ask David to do a roll call vote. We're then going to move on to our time. Let's see, our uh, report from public health. All right, David, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. We're moving on to item 16, the public hearing regarding the purchase of real property located at 1390 South Winchester Boulevard in San Jose. I am going to open the public hearing now and receive testimony from the public. David, I don't see anyone waiting. Do you agree? I see no speakers, Mr. President. 
Thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Do you have a comment before I close the meeting, close the uh, hearing? I'm going to take that as a no. You're muted. Just thumbs Sorry. up. Yep, no comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm now closing the public hearing. Oh, we have one speaker. David, would you please let the one speaker in? Sure, one moment. Next speaker is Loretto QD. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Loretto QD, are you there? I'm here. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Loretto Quevedo Gimandal with Loretto QD in Silicon Valley. And I'm a um, an house advocate as well as for underprivileged family. And so- Please speak I, closer to your microphone. I, I strongly support and Loretto Cuties Brigade Silicon Valley and my colleagues here in Melpitas and all over the county, we strongly support Project Home Key all over the county. Thank you so much for your um, courage and supporting all the in-house uh, project, in project Home Key. Um, Next speaker is Ella Lee. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Ella is not unmuting. Hello? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Councilor Lee, because you just talk about like you do you you concern about the, the the best in the shelter place location everything you will talk to Santa Clara County, but how come you still vote yes? If you something not sure, you should put this project behind and then talk to city and they come back yes. If you guys vote not for us, not for people real living here, are you guys really living here? I want to know whoever say yes are living here. Yes. Next speaker is Emma. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, Emma. I just opposed the Bella Vista project. Please do not mix up affordable housing and interim housing. And Thanks. I so this is this is the project on South Winchester. We've already concluded Bella Vista. Next speaker is Amy Zhu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hey. Yes, uh, my name is Amy Zhu. I'm a homeowner of Sunnyvale. I strongly oppose the location of Home Key at the Crestview Hotel. So the location impacts a lot of negative issues on Sunnyvale communities. I strongly suggest the committee choose another location. Crestview Hotel is not the right place for Home Key. You know, the El Camino is a very busy road and heavy traffic along the Sunnyvale and the Mount View. President Wasserman, we have a few more people who have um, requested to speak, um, and it looks like some of them have spoken on previous items as well. Okay. Um, um, yes, if they've spoken on previous items, that's fine. If they're speaking on this item, we can go ahead. Uh, we'll go up. We've got six right now. Let's draw the line there because I had closed the public hearing portion. So let's just do the six that we have, David. Okay, we will do. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy Joseph. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm the resident of Santa Clara. I highly oppose the home key project, and we haven't seen any detailed plan how to ensure safety. And the supervisor Lee mentioned the cameras, but we know the cameras doesn't work. If someone were murdered, you say, hey, there's a camera. So what does that mean? I strongly urge supervisors well to know we should have a well-planned solution, but not this ridiculous solution for us to go through. Thank you. And again, speakers, you're speaking on the 1390 South Winchester Boulevard project in San Jose. Next speaker is Cindy Newman. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I came for the Veterans Proclamation. I stayed for the home key issues, and I support Winchester and support all of you for your knowledge, your, your patience with the public, and the public needs to be better educated. NAMI, you need to reach out. Thank you. I'm signing. Next speaker is Kenny. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Kenny, are you there? We do not have Kenny. Next speaker is Faye. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I strongly oppose the Karen Santa Clara and other uh, home key locations. We are just half a mile away from the Bella Vista Inn, but not notified about the secret project from county or city. Bella Vista side has no public hearing before this meeting. 
Home PCI in such high density residential area is very uh, is a very bad decision. In computers, there have been a lot more 911 calls generated from the home key site. Only a tiny fraction of local homeless people can benefit. It doesn't help solving the homeless problem, but adds more issues to the local community. Strong note to the current locations. Our final speaker is a phone caller ending in 910. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, Supervisor Smidian, loved your speech. We need to hear more speeches like that. Thank you for your speech as well, Otto. Um, I support all home key projects. And also, I just have a huge problem with all the xenophobia, classism, racism that's been happening with all of these callers. People need to think about it. If the tables were turned, there would definitely be people in the streets protesting. So if it's not okay for one group, it's not okay for another group. Look into yourselves and think about the hate. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Now I will close the public hearing. I will turn to um, uh, Consuelo for any comments that she may have on this. And then I will turn to the board members for discussion and a uh, motion. Thank you, Board President Wasserman. No comments from the Office of Supportive Housing. Thank you, Consuelo. Board members, anyone wishing to make a motion? Purchase the property. So moved, Chavez. I'm second. happy. Okay. So motion by Chavez, a second by Lee. Any further discussion on item 16? And the motion, I assume, is to adopt the resolution and staff recommendations, Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Thank you very much. And the seconder, Mr. Lee, Supervisor yes. Lee? That's great. Thank you. David, roll call vote, please, on item 16. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. 17 was held. We're now going to turn to our public health officer at uh, the latest time this year, that's for sure. And uh, doctors, I hope you're around and available. Dr. Cody, start us off, please. Let me get the- uh, Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Uh, Dr. Smith is going to bring up the slides um, and I'll uh, present. I believe Dr. Kamal is also with us, and we have our special guest, Dr. Fenstersheim, who will also be joining. I, um, once the slides are up, okay. I'm Great. still okay. working on it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I'm I'll just start out. Okay. Hi, Dr. Marty. <laughs> Good afternoon. All right, Dr. Cody. So um, as the slides are coming up, I think I can tell you uh, that our, um, as I always show you the COVID epidemic in our county and the, the points that I wanted to make about where we are now, is that after the last surge, which peaked in August, um, we had a decline. Um, and after a period of relatively flat cases through October, we're actually beginning to see a gradual increase in our cases. Can you see this, that slide now? There we yes. are. So we're seeing a gradual, uh, unfortunate increase um, in our cases. We're keeping a close eye on this. This uh, gradual increase is being um, seen in other parts of the state as well. Uh, the next slide shows where we are uh, in the pandemic. Whoops, I think we'll go back a little bit. We were, I was going to share. Um, nope. Okay. I think I, <laughs> sorry about that. So this, this shows the seven day average rolling case rates by vaccination status. And I wanted to point out two things. Um, first is that as you'll see that top blue line, which is the case rate among those eligible to be vaccinated, but not vaccinated. Um, you can see that that's both significantly higher than the purple line, which is uh, case rates among vaccinated. And you can also see that rates, uh, COVID rates are going up among those who are unvaccinated, but they are staying rock solid and flat among those who are vaccinated. So just wanted to uh, point out those um, two patterns. Next slide. There we are. This uh, shows COVID deaths 
by week in our county. And just as the cases uh, from this latest surge peaked in mid-August, the um, deaths uh, are a bit delayed um, and they peaked about oh, uh, a month later. Um, they are on the decline. We are now reporting deaths just on Fridays, as you probably know, and a total of over uh, 1,800 residents of our county have died of COVID during this pandemic. Next slide. So this is where vaccinations come in and we continue to make uh, progress, uh, although slow. We are now up to 73.2 of all residents in the population with completed vaccination and over 85% of those uh, who are currently eligible. I just wanna note that after the, uh, the um, authorization of uh, boosters uh, for Moderna and J&J, &J, in addition to Pfizer, we did see a bump um, in the number of booster shots given uh, in the county. And next slide. This is, uh, these are data that uh, you all asked uh, to see. So we've included it here. It shows the percent of residents vaccinated with at least one dose and it's broken out by race ethnicity. And what you'll see is that there were significantly great differences by different racial ethnic groups until about um, early April of this year. Uh, and then you begin to see that there are pretty significant differences among Asians as compared to other racial ethnic groups. Now over 95% uh, of Asians have received at least one dose. And among uh, Lat uh, Latino, Hispanic, white and African-Americans, um, it's really about the same, 71, 72, 73 uh, percent with at least one dose. And the next slide, I will pass it to Dr. Kamal if he's available for a quick update on testing. Dr. Kamal. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Uh, next slide, please. So our testing continues to be robust. Uh, we have adequate capacity and our positivity rate has stayed pretty stable around 1.1%. Okay. And I'm showing uh, healthcare uh, testing by healthcare systems. We see that Stanford continues to do a fairly good job of testing. Uh, county is still in the lead, but um, Stanford is catching up. Next time. I think I'm on. Um, so good afternoon, supervisors. Marty Finsterscheib here. I've come back for a limited engagement, but it's uh, mainly because I am I'm a pediatrician and I just couldn't stay away from the onboarding and rolling out of our 5 to 11 vaccine. So this is a time frame here on the first slide. We did on October 22nd uh, begin ordering the pediatric vaccine. So they wanted it pre-positioned and there was uh, lots of vaccine that was manufactured, and we expect that we won't have any uh, problems with supply. Um, we had the FDA recently authorize the vaccine, and then today the ACIP, which is the uh, Immunization Practices Committee of the CDC, um, had their meeting, and I was on all day listening to it because it was uh, uh, there was a lot of good data and presentations so we can understand the vaccine better, but they just now voted to approve the vaccine and to recommend that approval to the CDC director who we expect will make an announcement this evening. So I think we are a go for five to 11 vaccinations to start um, soon, anytime after that, but most likely tomorrow. Uh, next slide. So what did we do in our planning? We expanded vaccine enrollment of the providers. Um, that means mainly those who are in private practice in our community clinics also. We've onboarded a number of family practice and pediatricians especially. 
Um, we conducted surveys of the large health systems such as Kaiser and PAMF and Stanford, and they're all on board um, as they get their vaccine also to roll this out. So that's, that's great. We've been working very closely with the County Office of Education and individual uh, districts in the, in the uh, county, and we will be partnering with them, especially through our mobile vaccine um, program and our clinics to actually take clinics to schools and set them up for the kids that go to school there. Um, they will be held most likely at, in the hours right after school, like a three to seven uh, PM clinic. Um, and so we're now onboarding these schools. We have confirmed and booked a number. We're probably at about 25 that we booked, another 30 or so that we're just waiting to get the uh, date confirmed. Um, we are doing this by uh, priority census tracts, meaning we've identi identified um, census tracts, especially in the 10 highest need zip codes. And those represent about 80 schools. And those are on our top priority um, places for our first clinics that will be uh, run by our mobile units with, in conjunction with the school districts. Um, and then we will move to tier, a second tier, um, which includes about 80 or 90 schools um, as we move forward over the next several weeks. For your information, there's a total of 300 elementary schools in our community. Um, there's also additional funding that's coming in through various grant sources. And so the community health clinics, especially, um, well, our community-based clinics and our community-based organizations will be expanding their ability over the next several weeks and months to provide additional outreach and vaccination even beyond the walls of their clinics um, to provide, again, support for the entire community. And we are also we also are working on consistent messages um, for the community so that parents are prepared, well prepared, uh, as we roll out the vaccine. Excuse me, Dr. Marty. Dr. Marty. Yes. Pediatrician Marty Fensterside. Yeah. You, <laughs> yes. Before you proceed any further, when will we, as a board, be able to announce to the public that vaccine vaccinations for kids five to eleven provided by Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, whoever it is, will be available? Okay, so first of all, it's just Pfizer vaccine. So okay. we, that's the only one for five to 11. Um, it's, it's a special formulation of that vaccine. It's a yep. smaller dose. And as soon as the CDC director, uh, Dr. Rolinsky, and we expect in talking to some of the people back there that she will this evening um, give her seal of approval, give the green light, so the recommendation is coming from this committee, this committee, but she is the final say, and we have every indication that she will, she, because as they were meet, beginning their meeting, she said, I support this, and we expect her. So I um, think as early as this, this evening, as soon as we get the word, probably hear it on CNN first. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Marty, assuming, assuming she approves it, we can make an announcement tomorrow that the public can go to the public, the county website and find the link on where they can take their five to 11 age children to get the Pfizer vaccine. Is that correct? Are we set yes. up? Yes, we are set up? yes. And, and in fact, we are already um, taking appointments so that if you go to the website now, we only had a few to begin with, but um, we will be um, adding additional appointments onto that, uh, onto that website. But people have already signed up knowing there's a, um, you know, there's a statement right before you go to that um, website where you make your, your uh, appointments that says, you know, pending authorization and approval, uh, you will be able to come and be vaccinated. But we are already uh, setting up those appointments, but you can make that announcement as early as tonight, as soon as the uh, CDC director or first thing in the morning. But we expect we can even, we, can, we will start our vaccinations probably tomorrow morning. Thank okay. you. We won't, we won't jump the gun as soon as we see that it's approved. Um, I know I plan, I'm sure their supervisors do plan to get word out to their constituents that they can go to the county website to make an appointment to get their five to 11 year old vaccinated with Pfizer. Right, right. and all of the other providers should have, again, as I said, we onboarded a lot of pediatricians. We will be providing their vaccine. We are redistributing their vaccine. Kaiser will be getting their own vaccine. Awesome. Um, so it's it's all gonna it's all gonna happen pretty quickly. Next slide, so I can get through these. Um, Dr. Smith, 
So we have key messages to parents. And I, I was on a town hall last night in the Alum Rock School District um, talking to parents. We had a Spanish um, a breakout room and I did the English. Uh, but the key messages to parents are to really think about, get your questions answered, make a plan now to get your kids vaccinated. We know that the parents have a lot of questions and we tried to answer a lot of them. I thought the questions were excellent last night. They had a lot of very, very um, knowledgeable people that had done their you know, homework and read up on it, but very, very good questions. Um, the vaccine, uh, to your point earlier, it's only fi it's Pfizer vaccine. It's a smaller dose. It's adjusted just for the kids. It's one third the dose actually of the adults. It's still two doses and it will be separated by three weeks as all the other Pfizer vaccines are. And then you will be fully vaccinated after, your, after you've completed two weeks after your second dose. And the vaccines were shown to be extremely effective and very safe for these children. Next slide. And again, uh, to your point also, we will have um, appointments available immediately through our healthcare system and the uh, private docs are going to be providing vaccine, albeit not a lot of them. You know, we sent, the Medical Association sent out a survey as we had asked them uh, to all 600 family practice doctors and pediatricians. We got back under 20 surveys, um, but we, we are onboarding to nearly 50 uh, private pediatricians and family practice doctors. The county locations, again, will all be up and running and our mobile vaccine units will be going to schools over the next several weeks, especially in those first priority schools to make sure that we meet the needs of those children in those higher need areas. Retail pharmacies will be getting vaccine also, as will the community uh, clinics. We have 167,000 children that are five to 11 in our community. And um, to my calculations, we will be receiving in this first week, week and a half, about 75,000 doses of vaccine. So I, I, I think that already shows that we should have plenty of vaccine. We just need to get everyone up and running. I think, is that the last slide? Yes, okay, thank you. So we're happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Members, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and um, Thank you to the whole team, of course. Let me just ask, uh, well, let me first share. <clears throat> Yesterday at one o'clock on a Monday, um, I reached out to uh, PAMF because it has a presence in my uh, significant footprint in my district. Um, they, uh, on the issue of boosters, on the issue of booster shots, they were not providing boosters in Palo Alto. They were, uh providing boosters in mountain view and los gatos uh but all of the appointments were taken for this week in both mountain view and los gatos and they were not taking any appointments after this week so <laughs> the answer was no in palo alto the answer was theoretically Los Gatos and Mountain View, but no this week and no ability to schedule anything after. Uh, also checked in with our own county uh, clinic at the Mountain View uh, Community Center, uh, which I know the community appreciates greatly. And they had no appointments uh, for this week as of Monday. And we're also not taking appointments after this week. So uh, I say this is a cautionary note to my colleagues before we start announcing availability, there's theoretical availability and there's real availability. But I guess I would ask the team, including Dr. Smith, um, uh, what are the prospects of um, ramping up our efforts yet again, uh, if it was this, uh, if we had this kind of a choke point uh, on um, boosters and uh, vaccinations, prior to uh, the young people being identified, uh, I can only imagine that it's gonna get appreciably more challenging in the days and weeks ahead. I'll stop there and see if you can uh, offer some comments about our abilities to ramp up yet again. Dr. Smith. I guess I'll jump in on that one. Um, we, 
do have, uh, as Marty pointed out, the plans to reach out to the uh, <clears throat> young community uh, in terms of the uh, boosters for adults. Uh, we're doing boosters. Uh, we're seeing relatively small numbers. It happens to be that Mountain View is limited because of uh, access problems, but we do have sites available throughout the rest of the county and we're trying to um, work with the city productively to expand our capacity at Mountain View. Um, but um, I guess that's the best I can say for what's going on with boosters. But we do know that we're going to need to have more capacity and um, we're planning on scoping that out as soon as we get the approval from the kids. Well, we, you know, we have exhorted the public to get their shots, get their boosters, and we're now in a situation, you know, a year and a half into the pandemic plus, and as I say, we've got folks who can't get uh, an appointment either with a private healthcare system like Palo Alto Medical Foundation or through our public health system in the North County. I, I don't think we can take that as an acceptable outcome, Dr. Smith. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna push to say whatever we need to do throughout the entire county, we need to uh, step up our efforts. Uh, and if that means uh, that public health needs to engage with the private health care systems yet again, then I'm going to ask as an individual supervisor, please do so, because we can't let this uh, continue um, without, without being addressed. Let me then pivot and ask uh, Dr. Smith and uh, anyone else on the team to comment. Uh, supervisor Lee and I, as the members of the Health and Hospital Committee, um, hosted a, uh, I thought, really very helpful, very informative meeting on a uh, special hearing of the HHC on the issue of long COVID. Thank you to the representatives from Valley Medical Center who participated, as well as to folks from uh, outside institutions, including UCSF and Stanford and Brown University. Um, there was some conversation there about the eventual uh, development of uh, something like a long COVID clinic as more information becomes available. Uh, Dr. Smith, that apparently prompted a, uh, an inquiry from the press, which uh, we saw in the Mercury. What else can you or the rest of the team tell us about the plans for long COVID? Again, my hope is that our county will be um, anticipating and ahead of the curve rather than in a reactive mode, which the pandemic has unfortunately so often obliged us to be. Yes, uh, Supervisor. Uh, first uh, issue with trying to get uh, capacity for the third uh, vaccine. Uh, we are scaling up our efforts and we are working with the surrounding organizations. But as you point out in your story, there are still glitches in the process, but we're watching them closely and working to expand. Um, in terms of the long COVID issue, um, <clears throat> we at our health system are not seeing large numbers of long COVID sufferers. Um, much of that has to do with the fact that we were able to reduce the transmission of COVID uh, during the early parts of the year. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it doesn't become long COVID until you've had the disease and had some time expire and still have symptoms. <clears throat> so we do expect that there will be a time period in the near future when we will start seeing more cases of so-called long COVID. And the standard of care at this point is recommended to be multidisciplinary approach, just like any other chronic disease. You might have a multidisciplinary diabetic clinic or an HIV clinic or pulmonary clinic. Once we get to a point where we have that need, we will reorganize our clinic structure and reassign physicians and staff to be able to deal with that. And we're looking for leadership from the medical staff of VMC and 
the uh, enterprise function so that we take our lead from the medical experts about when they think uh, we need to do that, how we need to do that. And we're prepared to do that financially and operationally as soon as the need arises. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I would add, uh, Mr. Chair, and this is a comment, obviously not a question, is, uh, and you know, Supervisor Lee may or may not wish to speak to it, but I, I couldn't help but be struck by the references in our uh, hearing on long COVID uh, that uh, the incidence of long COVID was significant among younger uh, patients, for, uh, and we have had a certain um, laxness, casualness, if you will, among younger uh, potential patients uh, because of the view that they had COVID, if they got it, was something they could make their way through uh, in a way that wasn't as risky for them as it might be for somebody uh, who was older. And, and while some of that may be true, what we heard about was that uh, the incidence of long COVID among younger patients is a significant concern in part because uh, by definition, if it's long COVID, it can be uh, lifelong potentially. We obviously don't know given the recent arrival of the pandemic and that uh, this is uh, something that younger patients may have a particular need to be attentive to and concerned about and perhaps might motivate some of them to uh, get themselves vaccinated if they haven't yet taken advantage of that opportunity. So thank you for that. That's all I have today. Uh, again, I will want uh, to ask staff in future meetings, how are we doing on ramping up capacity? Because I think we're there again. Yep, it's going to be exciting getting 50% of the kids 5 to 12 and getting 80% overall in the county. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on the last point that um, Supervisor Simidian raised around the impacts of long COVID. And um, I will tell you that, or yeah, just to say that anecdotally, um, that there are members of our community who have, have been suffering with that, who've gone to their primary care um, locations and not ours, by the way, but others, and been told that there isn't much that can be done for them. And so what I'm wondering is how would we know the, um, the impacts for people and how's that being reported? Meaning, do we have a central repository where we know folks who have complaints about long COVID? I'll try to jump in on that again. Um, there is a, uh, panoply of symptomatology that's associated with long COVID, but, um, and it's currently been announced that there is a change in the billing coding to identify individuals with long COVID. So that will allow us to collect data more specifically. Um, many of the symptoms are sort of, uh, generalized types of symptoms, not specific things mm -hmm. like pain, fogginess, um, tiredness, um, hair loss, hair still loss. No taste. <clears throat> so and, until the medical community gets very facile with uh, doing the coding correctly and making sure that they identify the full complement of symptomatology, our data is not going to be super accurate, but what we're doing now is um, in our primary care clinics and for that matter, our specialty clinics, uh, our physicians and staff are quite well aware of the risk and they're coding it correctly and treating it appropriately. And as I said, when we get to a point where we have sufficient numbers, I expect the enterprise medical staff to come to us and say, it's time to start up a comprehensive clinic and we'll do that. But I think the fundamental answer to your question is the <clears throat> disease process is sufficiently opaque and, and uh, um, generalized at this point that I don't think anybody is confident that nationwide we're getting exactly the right numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes some time for it to be expressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all really great points, Dr. Smith. W one thing that I am just um, 
mindful of, and I and I know that you are, especially based on your um, your history and your um, experience as a medical professional, and I'm I'm sure this is true for the team that's listening, is that um, that we also recognize that we have parts of our population that are underserved and and do not necessarily know how to um, uh, may not always be accessing services. And so one one question I would like to have um, answered is given that we represent um, so many hard to serve folks that we already have a hard time getting in the door in the first place, whether or not there's a specific strategy that we would be thinking about relative to assessing that, um, that need as we start to see it become more prevalent. And one thing that I'm also curious about, well, anyway, that, that's really what my question is. It, for example, does this mean that we need to do a deeper dive into our partnership with the community health partnerships or our own clinics, even if that data for some time is anecdotal to better understand where we're seeing trends? Yes, I would say that um, we're getting a closer and closer relationship with our community clinic partners. Um, Later on today, you're going to be talking in a few minutes, actually, talking about um, our effort to try to equip them with EPIC so that we can share information more clearly and concisely, quickly. Um, so I think the general gist of your, your question is absolutely correct. We're going to have to have much tighter partnerships and information sharing. Um, when you get to the details, that's a little bit above my head. Um, it will happen at the uh, practitioner level, and uh, I don't think we have anybody on line from uh, VMC, so I'd have to get back to you on details about that. If we could, I, I would love a, a, just a, our next COVID update just to get further thinking on it. And I do want to thank um, Supervisor Sumidian and the crew in health and hospital for taking a dive into that. I, I, I am concerned that we're, that that may just be bubbling um, below the surface in part just be based on, again, anecdotal feedback that I've gotten. Um, the second big area that I'm, I'm curious about is to go back to the, another point that Supervisor Simidian raised. And I, I know that, um, that there was a significant tug and pull between the county hospital and not all, but some of our healthcare partners, both in terms of testing and um, vaccinations. And I, I'm, I heard your response, but I'm not sure I completely understood the, the game plan for um, getting all of our partners to be um, as functional as we're gonna need them to be. Uh, I have a little bit of a concern as we're getting starting to vaccinate children about how the overlap of the uh, vaccination for adults uh, will and boosters for adults as we're still doing first time vaccinations for some without those partners available to us. And I'm wondering if there's anything that, that, that um, you think that we as our, as a board or yeah, as a board can do to support your efforts, A, and B, how long do we wait for them to get their act together? I have Dr. Kamal to give you at least the answer to your first part of your question, and I'll help out. Thank you, Supervisor. So in response to your question, we did send a survey out uh, over a week ago to all the large healthcare systems, including El Camino, Stanford, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and Kaiser, to ensure, number one, that they stand ready and willing to vaccinate at least the children in their healthcare system, who they normally provide care for as well as to adhere to the no wrong door policy and as well as having an idea of the time frame. And so they, they, they all responded to that survey. They all do intend to provide vaccination to children under their care. As far as the time frame is concerned, um, I can say that none of them are going to be as rapid as the county healthcare system will be. However, they do have plans in place and are proceeding with them. I would add that to some degree, especially with Palo Alto Medical Foundation and Kaiser, they are partially at the mercy of their larger corporate entities. 
especially in the early part of the vaccination campaign for children, where their vaccine allocation is coming from their foreign organization. So just like before, when we had the right. multi-county entity allocation, as well as some of their IT infrastructure as well. So and I think those are the limiting things. And so we're, we're, continue, we're continue, continuing to engage with them to um, make sure that we are as supportive as we can be and encouraging them to be as quick as they can be. Yeah, I, I would just say, um, colleagues, that I, I want to make sure we're, we don't slip too far into um, December with without our partners being really ready to go. That's that's a lot of responsibility just for the county health system to, to take on um, and and really appreciate the work you've been doing with pediatricians. And one thing I just wanted to add is that if they if those offices need technical support, I'm wondering if we have the capacity to provide that so that they fill out the appropriate paperwork and are available to give vaccines. You're talking about the private uh, pediatricians and family practitioners? I am. Yes, here. we've got a support team ready to give them whatever support they need. As and Marty pointed out, the numbers uh, are considerably smaller than the number of individual practitioners that are out there, but we expect that to expand. Yeah, that would be great. I, I do want to say that I think for a lot of parents that not being able to talk, not being able to go in and get that vaccination from their pediatrician may slow them down from getting their children vaccinated. So the, that technical assistance, if that's what the problem is, is going to be really, really important. And um, and I know you know that. I, I don't mean to tell you something you don't know, I guess. But again, what I'm asking is more specifically, what is that resource and, and how do we get that out to them? I anyway, and how we see, and I guess we'll know more in the next 10 days as children are being vaccinated and we can see what amount of hesitancy there is, if, if any. Um, but I do think being able to talk to your pediatrician, at least for, for me, that would have been a great comfort. So thank you. And thanks for all the work. It's, it continues to be tremendous. Appreciate you. Uh, you. We, uh, we gave Marty a little bit of break so he could sleep a little bit, but from now on, he doesn't get to sleep. That's right. No leaving, Marty. Don't try it again, Dr. Marty. And good point, Supervisor Chavez. I know when I went into Walgreens for various things, there were parents lined up to get their vaccinations, and they had their children with them watching mom and dad get vaccinated. So I think I'm, I'm hoping that'll rub off and go back to a familiar place. Um, I'm just so excited. I just... It's for the good of the community and gets us closer and closer to meeting those three metrics to getting us maskless. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, welcome back, Dr. Fenstershire. I, I, I figure you won't be able to stay away from us for so long. So uh, glad to see you back again. Um, so last week, Supervisor Smith and I held the special uh, HXC meeting where we both got a chance to uh, ask the experts on some questions about the long COVID. Um, some of the key takeaways is that long COVID clearly is a legitimate concern, and that may occur with mild or severe COVID cases, uh, has long potential for long-term negative impacts to our health. Uh, what I'm also surprised to learn was that these early evidence has shown that long COVID affects younger and working age adults, particularly women. Um, high body mass index, BMI, and obesity may also increase the risk of long COVID. Um, given these um, uh, knowledge we just uh, learned, uh, what is our st uh, staff doing to make sure that these young adults and especially young women are aware of the, the fact that they are at risk for these long COVIDs? Dr. Marty, maybe you can take that one. Or this is Dr. Cody. I could I could jump in. I, I think your point is very well taken, um, and uh, many supervisors have have touched on this. That uh, long, you know, we now understand that long COVID is real, and um, we don't know the prevalence, but we think it's greater than we might imagine. And so, how can we make the public aware? I, I think that's really the nut of it. Um, I, to be honest, have not seen any really robust uh, campaigns to educate the public uh, about long COVID and what they might do. Um, but I think that's something that we can take back and yes. think about. Um, I think it's quite important. Yes, exactly. And as we know, uh, some of the 
last holdouts or the younger adults thinking that they don't need to get vaccinated. So I wonder if we might be able to use this also as an opportunity to help improve our messaging to young adults on that. I remember Dr. Uh, Narash Shimhan uh, talked about how you know vaccinations actually reduce long COVID uh, by 50% for those breakthrough cases as well. So I certainly think that that would be great if we can use this opportunity to get out to the uh, younger adults. Um, uh, the other thing is staff has also been providing us notification on the pop-up clinics uh, that's happening, and I certainly appreciate in our district. But the timing usually is about one, one or two days before the event. And I would just ask if there's any way you could get us uh, a little bit more notice in the future so we could actually plan better and help with uh, outreach to make uh, get it more visible uh, for our district uh, so more folks will be out there. Um, and also, um, now that there is a um, fully vaccinated being, you know, two shots, or one shot of Johnson Johnson, uh, now that we have booster shots, are we going to have a different definition of fully vaccinated is? Are we just going to continue basically on the same definition we've had so far? We'll continue with the same definition. So um, uh, two doses of an mRNA vaccine or one dose of a J&J &J, right. um, uh, remains the definition of fully vaccinated. Right. Now, um, it's true that for those who got J&J, &J, Two months thereafter, now they are basically encouraged to get their booster, and they are allowed to get any uh, of the the vaccines. Correct? That is correct. Okay, great. Um, and I certainly would advocate anybody who's got J and J to hurry up and go get that second vaccine because, based on numbers, uh, certainly uh, they are the ones who might have a uh, uh, greater need to get that uh, second booster. So, thank you. Um, Thanks for uh, identifying that the uh, by race, unlike in this case, the Asian population seems to be have the highest vaccinations comparing to other uh, groups in the county. Is there any best practices you think we could help um, improve the vaccination rate in the other racial groups? Well, I, I think it's interesting that the, our population really falls into uh, you know two two groups with with very high vaccination rates mm -hmm. among Asians and similar vaccination rates uh, among uh, the other the other groups. I think that um, as as you probably know, mm -hmm. this far out into the vaccination campaign, the reasons why people are not getting vaccinated are quite varied, um, and they don't necessarily uh, break out by race ethnicity. There are many many other reasons why people. Uh, people are are hesitant, um, and of course, we are trying to um, work around uh, everything that we can um, to encourage people um, in a non-judgmental way, so that they can understand and feel comfortable um, and have uh, access to vaccines with no 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 barriers and um, and confidence. Um, so we do continue to chip away, uh, although it is slow going at this point. Right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, one thing I do want to say is a big thank you to our Movax and our BMC teams for coming out to our um, Day on the Bay event a couple of weeks ago in Alviso to give out the COVID and flu vaccines. It was a very uh, successful turnout, gave out close to 200 flu shots. I'm one of them. Uh, and also 32 uh, COVID uh, vaccines as well. I just want to say thank you so much for our community for making our community safer through your, through your important vaccine work. Uh, also, uh, thanks to our Diabetes Prevention and Wellness Program and Public Health Department for reaching out to our office. I'd like to let everybody know that November is the Diabetes Awareness Month. Uh, according to the CDC, more than one in three U.S. adults have pre-diabetes, and that's 88 million people. But the majority of people don't know that they have it. Please check with the doctor and do what you can to make your small, healthy lifestyle changes. And I myself actually found out that I am actually slightly pre-diabetic. And since then, I've been watching out myself. So please check. This is very important to get your uh, blood, blood, uh, blood test to, uh, to uh, figure out uh, your situation. But thank you very much, everybody. Hey, can we go ahead and make sure I'm sorry, Dr. Fenster check? I was just, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that I wanted to take that comment from Dr. from Supervisor Lee to encourage people to get their flu vaccine. Again, we're moving into November now, mm -hmm. and um, the CDC does estimate.
estimate that we are going to have a lot more flu this year than we had last year. Right. There's hardly any. And so it's very, very important for people to get a flu shot. And that anybody listening between six months of age and, um, you know, <laughs> and, and seniors, everybody should get, especially pregnant women and those with any underlying medical conditions. Thank you. And if anybody under six months of age isn't listening to this, then we need to find out why. Um, thank you, Dr. Marty. I've uh, got my shingle shot. I got my flu shot. I'm uh, waiting for my, be able to get my COVID shot. Um, Dr. Cody, a clarification question, please, and then we'll consider your report received. Any person waiting to get their booster shot, they can get, you're recommending they get something different or something the same? We do not have a, uh, a recommendation. What we're telling people is we're emphasizing the people for whom boosters are strongly recommended. And as you know, that's if you're over 65, yes. if you live in a long-term care facility, or if you have a over 50 and you have a underlying medical condition, which includes just about everything you can think of. Okay. But um, the key thing to know is if you got your your initial series with Pfizer or Moderna, you have to wait at least six months yes. and you can be boosted with anything. If you've been got your initial J&J, &J, you only have to wait two months. We recommend that all J&J &J, uh, folks get boosted and they can get boosted with anything. Thank you. I, so, I yep. understand those. So you haven't taken a position yet about the booster being different than the initial one. No, mix and match um, is is authorized and okay, uh, but the CDC doesn't have a, nor FDA have a recommendation as to you should stay with your primary series or you should mix and match or what you should mix and match with. Basically anything is okay. Just get boosted, especially if you're in a high risk group. Okay, so anything is okay. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you very much for that. Seeing no other hands, well, we have one one speaker. David, would you allow the uh, one speaker in? Two speakers, then we'll proceed. Sure. The next speaker is Alva Lee. You've been unmuted. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Oh, Alva has dropped off. The next speaker is Tino. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. The VAERS reporting system is a red flag system. Dr. Cody, her team, and this board have completely dismiss the thousands of reported deaths and severe injuries. The deflection is that those reports don't prove causation or people are misinterpreting the data. That is an outright cop-out. Dr. Cody had a two-year fellowship at the CDC. That would normally be a good thing, but right now it's a severe conflict of interest and you're about to experiment on five to 11 year olds. You can't say you didn't know. I'm tired of listening to you guys do this. Next speaker is Linda Edwards. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. I urge the Board of Supervisors to instruct Dr. Jeff Smith to accept each and every medical and religious exemption submitted in good faith by county employees. Avoid the high, high cost of numerous lawsuits and negative employee relations, worker shortages, and constantly onboarding and training expenses. Let's keep county workers employed who have been disaster service workers and essential workers for the last 19 months by providing essential services for our county. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. We'll consider the report received and action given. And we'll move on to item number 19 to receive a report from the Office of the County Exec relating to American. Oh, um, this will be me. Let me get the slide back up here. You see that? Yes, sir, we do. Okay, um, so I'm gonna give you an introduction um, today to our ARPA proposals, uh, but I'd like to start by reminding everybody again that today is Dantaras, which in the Hindu tradition is a celebration, a festive day just before Diwali, celebration of wellness and health. And the story goes that the God of death was going to, was destined to kill a young husband, but his wife protected him by putting gold and jewels at the doorstep 
and thereby distracting the god of death away from their house and protecting the family. So I thought that was a particularly important story to tell as we stand here ready to make recommendations to the board of how we should invest taxpayers' money to prevent death and destruction in our community related to COVID and the pandemic. So I'll go through um, our presentation. Uh, you have much more detail in your transmittal. Um, what we're giving you today is uh, our recommendation from staff. Obviously, the board can modify that, ignore it, and do whatever they want with it. Uh, there are um, a few recommendations that the board has already acted upon, mostly related to the um, uh, hero pay, um, but um, most of the recommendations that we have suggested will also require further action from the board because they require contracts to be made and details to be delineated about particular programs. Um, so when we looked from a staff perspective at the community, we took leadership from the board in setting priorities and we focused on equity uh, for the community that was affected the most dramatically by COVID um, and maintaining our safety net responsiveness and being able to continue our response because the COVID pandemic is not over. <clears throat> I just wanna remind you that we uh, will receive over two years, about $374 million in one-time funds um, dispersed in two aliquots. It's uh, determined by the federal government that these uh, funds will be used for uh, expenses related to the times between March 3rd and December 21st, 2024. There is some flexibility to relate related to earlier expenses, but it's very um, individualized. The final rule has not yet been published, so we made our recommendations based on the interim final rule. So in big chunks, let me just go through what we've been recommending here. This is a healthcare and behavioral health recommendations. I won't go through all the details that are in your transmittal, but um, we recommending, we're recommending more than $30 million for behavioral health expansion over the two years and more than 2 million more for um, placement options related to behavioral health treatment. We're also recommending expenditures for uh, telehealth and behavioral health and utilization management. And then related to medical care, as I mentioned, we the board has already acted upon an, a, a recommendation to allocate $7 million to some of the community clinics to expand their access to uh, Epic so that we'll be on the same electronic health record system as uh, they are. And then related to this is the NetSpark implementation, which is an electronic health record that specifically um, deals with behavioral health issues. We're also making a recommendation that we expand that. Also, children and transitional youth were a major focus for the board and for everyone during the pandemic. Uh, we're recommending $20 million over the two years for the advancement of the children's agenda, which the board has already um, talked to us about in detail, having to do with uh, providing opportunities, childcare, training, um, workforce development for childcare services, and a um, number of other services, which I won't go into in detail. Um, another 5 million for those services specifically related to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, 10 million for behavioral health service expansion in the schools and uh, 2.4 million for um, special treatment for withdrawal for transitional age youth. 
Um, then in terms of the equity imperative, um, we're recommending additional 500 or uh, $10 million for community-based organizations um, allocated as basically a one-time grant, just to make it clear to you and to the members of the nonprofit community. This is a grant in addition to whatever changes in, but in the uh, contract would be related to what we used to call COLAs. Now we call the cost of doing business. So this is additional funding besides that. Um, and focused on trying to help sing, sustain the organizations that actually do a huge amount of the work in our communities um, with flexible funds that they can use for whatever they think is appropriate. We're also recommending a um, subsidized employment initiative, $6 million grocery and support for the community, 4.5 million. Supplemental security advocacy. This has been a big focus for the board. Um, our social security sign up or qualification rates are not as high as they should be. We're recommending an outreach team of $6 million. And then small business air quality, which will be discussed a little bit more in detail in one of the next items. Housing and homelessness continues to be a huge problem and has been accentuated by the COVID um, pandemic. Uh, we're recommending 14.5 or 14 million for a heading home campaign, another uh, 2.7 million for family reunification, 300,000 for homeless veteran services and 3 million for uh, encampment outreach and engagement. Justice involved issues have been a major focus also during this time period. We're recommending uh, $4 million for uh, allocation for rental assistance for our reentry clients, 2 million to expedite court cases and treatment protocols, another uh, 3 million for video visits in both adult and juvenile sites. And then uh, dealing with our past and future COVID response regarding um, the county, actual county government, as I mentioned, 76 million, uh, roughly speaking, for pandemic pay or so called hero pay, um, 740,000 for county fire, just because. County Fire does not get a allocation of ARPA funding since it's a dependent district. Uh, 1.4 million for defibrillators and monitors. And then uh, funding for those anticipated re, uh, expenditures that we uh, believe will not be paid for by FEMA in the future. Um, during the COVID response, we were spending $20 million a week um, and as you know, we're approaching closely to the billion dollar range. So we feel like we should make allowance for that need in the future. So um, with that, I or Martha are available for questions. There's a lot more detail in your, in your packet. I'm sure you'll wanna hear from the community, uh, but any questions you have. Mike, you're on President Wasserman, you're muted, sir. Thank you very much. Vice President Ellenberg, I see your hand is already with you. We go to our public speakers first. Absolutely. Thank you very much. David, take it away. One moment, please. Next speaker is Pancho Guevara. You will have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Pancho Guevara from Sacred Heart Community Service. I co-facilitate the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition. Uh, real specific proposals for the American Rescue Plan expenditures grounded in our, our equity investment agenda for recovery were submitted for your consideration by 70 nonprofit organizations and allies. The scale of the federal resources to the county government should be viewed as an opportunity to make breakthrough achievements in critical areas, such as alleviating racial, ethnic, economic, and other disparities that produce so much death and suffering during the pandemic. Thank you for your consideration of our proposals and we look forward to partnering with you to make them happen. Next speaker is Zaya McWilliams. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. 
Good afternoon. Second Harvest of Silicon Valley is the single largest nonprofit provider of food to low income households in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, serving approximately 450,000 individuals every month, up from 250,000 pre pandemic. We speak today in support of using American Rescue Plan funds to strengthen our safety net and improve equity. Thank you. Next speaker is Richard Adler. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Richard Adler, and I'm a member of the county's Seniors Digital Inclusion Workgroup. I ask the board to include the funds requested by our group to bring 2,000 low-income older adults online just to make a start on closing the digital divide in our county. I am happy to note that this proposal has been endorsed by the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition. Please do not leave our seniors behind. Thank you. Next speaker is Samina Usman. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Samina Usman. I'm with the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, I urge the board to consider um, community based organizations that are not as well known, but they do incredible work in the community, um, such as, of, oh, of course, I'm going to mention CARE, but um, other organizations such as Support Life Foundation that's been giving uh, food uh, to those in need. You have Rahima Foundation that's been supporting refugees and supporting those also um, in need. You have NISA that uh, works as the women's shelter her and you have a Khalil Center as well. The Next speaker is Alan Kamara. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Bottle Supervisor. Um, this is Alan Kamara. Um, we want to thank you on behalf of all our nurses for this pandemic pay. Um, however, we are asking that you include all our nurses, our part-time nurses who have been staffing this COVID pandemic uh, to be included in this pay and not just for the full-time nurses. And we'll send over 6,500 petition to you. I will hope you consider that. Thank you. Next speaker is Wendy mahaney Garahu. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. This is Wendy mahaney Garahu, Chief of Community Impact for First Five. We'd like to thank Dr. Smith and the Board of Supervisors for including children and early learning and care professionals in the AAR funding, ARP funding proposal. This funding allocation has to not only support our children's success, but also the success of our community. These kinds of investments have a very high rate of return, and we urge you to double it as Susan Ellenberg has considered. Thank you. Next speaker is Faiza Gafour. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Faiza, are you there? We do not have Faiza. Sorry, I just, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. And so I'm um, part of NISA, the North American Islamic Shelter for the Abused. I'm their executive director. And we are a nonprofit that's been around since 2002. We support women and children, minorities with education, counseling, support services, advocacy, referral services. We're trying to cater more for the needs of, of, of these individuals. Um, we have shelters set up what we are in dire need and are humbly requesting more funds to be um, for us to be included in that. So thank you so much for your consideration. Next speaker is Sean Girth. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Sean Girth, and I am speaking to you both as a real coalition member and as executive director of Educare California Silicon Valley. I support the real proposals and I urge the supervisors to approve that spending. I also urge the supervisors to uh, follow Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal and increase the funding for children. We know that has a huge return on investment. Thank you. Next speaker is Bon Villaverde. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. My name is Von Villaverde, Director of Advocacy at Aki. Um, Aki strongly supports the proposed expansion of behavioral health services and school-based behavioral health services for youth, which Supervisor Ellenberg wrote about in her op-ed yesterday, along with funding to update uh, electronic health records at community clinics. We also strongly support the Behavioral Health Workforce Pipeline Pilot Project that was included in the proposal submitted by the Real Coalition. We also hope that ARPA funding can also be used to invest in uh, communities, criminal justice reform. Next speaker is Sparky Harlan. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, Sparky Harlan, Bill Wilson Center. Uh, thank you for considering the withdrawal funding for uh, transition age youth. 
I would like to see you triple the funding specific for substance abuse, not behavior health. Most of the time, behavior health that's school based or in permanent supportive housing is mental health, not substance abuse. We had five young people die during COVID with fentanyl overdoses. So I urge you to increase substance abuse treatment for that population. Next speaker is Sarita Coley. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Sarita, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisors and Dr. Smith. I'm speaking to you today as the Chair of the Community Health Partnerships Board of Director, as well as the CEO of Aki. Firstly, I wanna thank you very much for supporting the funding to transition to Ocean Epic electronic health records for four of the community clinics, which will help us coordinate care and get better to building a more effective system of care for our patients. And I also wanna thank you for the focus on behavioral health services, including substance abuse treatment for youth. Next speaker is David Mineta. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, uh, Board of Supervisors, County Administration, uh, Dave Mineta from Momentum. I just wanna um, thank you for the support of behavioral health uh, both the expansion and also the school-based services uh, as we enter into what we consider to be the second pandemic and uh, um, also in support of the uh, uh, equity workforce development issues. So again, thank you very much to the county and the board uh, for this uh, uh, support. Next speaker is Matthew Tinsley. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, President Wasserman and Supervisors. My name is Matthew Tinsley from the Santa Clara County Office of Education. Uh, thank you for including programs for serving young children and families in your proposal. We've uh, provided you with some written feedback that, uh, to consider. We'd like to recommend increasing the child care services item by $5 million and adding a commitment to use these as matching funds for state workforce development grant applications with the county office. We'd also like to suggest um, using the facilities funding in the, uh, in the children's agenda item. As Next speaker is Heidi Emberling. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. I'm Dr. Heidi Emberling, Deputy Chief of Early Learning for First Five. Thank you for centering children in this ARPA funding proposal. As we know, there is no economic recovery without access to affordable quality childcare. And there is no childcare without dedicated early educators and caregivers. Today, we face a catastrophic shortage of qualified teachers. So I urge you to substantially invest, as Supervisor Ellenberg suggests, in the continued operations of this critical workforce. Thank you. Next speaker is Alicia Chavez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Alicia Chavez. I'm one of the organizers with Silicon Valley Debug. Uh, I am calling today to urge the supervisors to consider funding to community-based organizations to reduce the jail population and the pre-child supervision. Uh, as you know, there's over 400 people on uh, ankle monitors and, you know, being on ankle monitor and home detention is the same thing as being incarcerated. Uh, so we Next speaker is Carolyn Gray. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, Carolyn. I muted you. Go ahead and unmute yourself one more time, please. Hi, I'm Carolyn Gray from the Santa Clara County Office of Education, where I coordinate the Mental Health and Schools Youth Advisory Group, or YAG for short. The role is to ensure that the youth voice is included in the formation of school wellness centers to provide relevant and effective mental health services on school campuses. The YAG has identified the need for more licensed mental health professionals on campus, teacher training for mental health awareness, culturally competent mental health services, and institutional support for student mental health as their top priorities. On behalf of the Youth Advisory Group, I strongly encourage the board to invest ARPA funds towards student mental health services in school campuses. Next speaker is Amanda Dickey. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Amanda Dickey, the Director of Government Relations for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. We greatly appreciate our partnership with the County and Department of Behavioral Health Services and believe that this ongoing partnership is vital to addressing student behavioral health services long time. Uh, long term, we support the county's plan to commit funding to behavioral health services, both in the short and the long term, and ask you to consider some of the requests made by the youth advisory um, uh, group that my colleague mentioned earlier, which included some specific services and materials. Thank you. Next speaker is Mario Santosal. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. 
Yes, my name is Mario Santos. I uh, represent the registered nurses. We appreciate the county's decision uh, to fund Hero Pay, but look, uh, our RN uh, frontliners, um, COVID did not distinguish based on code. So we urge the county staff to take that into account and provide the Hero Pay to every one of our members. Thank you. Next speaker is Lisa Little. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm calling on behalf of the Commission for the Status of Women to thank you very much for using the funds um, and try to focus as much as possible on the critical needs of women and families. In particular, we're hoping that households under $30,000 in annual income um, get these resources for free beyond the behavioral health care. And we're hoping that there's a sliding scale to subsidize for households up to $50,000. Really appreciate you really focusing on the underrepresented groups. Next speaker is Quincy Phillips. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Ellerberg and the Board of Supervisors. My name is Quincy Phillips. I'm the Executive Director for Building Back Better. Um, and I'm also a member of the Real Coalition and want to uh, specify my support for their proposals as well as all uh, children, family, and community of color proposals. Thank you for the time. Next speaker is Carmen B. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Carmen Bremer. I'm a resident of District 2. I'm with Black, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, and I'm also a member of REAL, and I encourage you to support and review the proposals that's been submitted for ARP funding. In addition, we, I want to request and we request that members of the community with lived experiences of poverty and systemic racism be involved in the design and implementation of ARP funded initiatives. Thank you. Next speaker is Case Hill. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. My name is Casey Hill, Executive Director of Edulution, and I'm also speaking on behalf of the Sisipuede Collective and the Real Coalition. We strongly support Supervisor Ellenberg's investment priorities, specifically those aimed at strengthening our safety net systems. Please prioritize investments that are based on data-driven information and in the county census tracts that suffered disproportionately from the pandemic and institutional and systemic inequities. Thank you. Next speaker is Liz Gonzalez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Liz, are you there? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm calling in from Silicon Valley Debug and South Bay Community Land Trust, thanking the county and all the organizations working to get us to an equitable recovery. These funds can dramatically improve the lives of people in our county, and we encourage the board to invest the funds towards fundamentally changing systems, um, investing um, to lead us not only into a decarcerated future, but also transferring land and housing into community hands under resident democratic control. Next speaker is Emily Schwing. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Emily Schwing. I'm the public affairs director at Vegilution and as part of the Sisipode Collective. The county needs to prioritize our community's opportunities to work and earn a wage sufficient to provide for our families' needs given what they experienced during the pandemic crisis. The county, the city of San Jose, and our place-based organizations need to continue our coordination of providing basic needs like access to healthy food. We must continue to build the infrastructure of food entrepreneurs, building more commercial kitchens, that the community can access to support their food businesses. We can imagine when the county contracts our new food entrepreneurs and childcare providers for the county throughout the year. Thank you. Next speaker is Zoom user. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Zoom user. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Cafaro from the hospital. Good. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Cafaro. I'm from I'm calling from the hospital council. We are supportive of um, both uh, Supervisor Ellenberg and the thoughtful allocations that the administration has put forward. Supportive of the behavioral health. I think we might have lost the connection. We'll go on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Veronica Amador. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Veronica, and I'm a community member and a member of the nonprofit Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition. As a member of the REAL Coalition, my organization has submitted a series of proposals around ARP 
funding that we think will advance the recovery of those who have been hardest hit by the pandemic. We are also in full support of the Santa Clara County Digital Inclusion Working Group proposals for a digital inclusion program serving 2,000 older adults. Lastly, we continue to request that members of the community with lived experiences of poverty and systematic racism be involved in the design and implementation of AI. Next speaker is Nathan Ulsh. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Board President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. My name is Nathan Olsh, the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association. We greatly appreciate this discussion today, as this will be moving to our uh, county, cities, and community members. We support the items listed. However, we believe that there should be a dedicated fund for our small business community. Supervisor Ellenberg has presented a list of five priorities listing support our business, small businesses as one, and that should be considered. We're also looking to add an additional 125000 in a letter that we sent this morning. We would appreciate if you were to revise that. Thank you. Next speaker is Andrea Portillo. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Andrea? We seem to have lost Andrea. She's not unmuting. We'll move on. Next speaker is Mai. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. All right. Um, hello, my, mate, my name is May Abed, and I'm an intern for the Council on Islamic Relations. We urge you to prioritize including continued relief, um, wealth building, health equity, community engagement, nonprofit sustainability, and capacity building. Um, we also urge you to include alternatives to policing and incarceration because these are the areas that we believe will best advantage racial justice and recovery in our community. Um, and we continue to request that members of the community with lived experiences of poverty and systematic racial justice. Um, Next speaker is Elisa Koff Ginsborg. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Elisa Koff Ginsborg with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. BHCA members thank the administration for the focus to expand access to both mental health and substance use services, housing, and jail alternatives. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for your thoughtful op-ed. Critical one-time funds must be integrated into comprehensive ongoing service plans. BHCA supports other members of the REAL Coalition in supporting the proposal, and we draw your attention to the proposal. Next speaker is Heather Cleary. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Heather Cleary, and I'm CEO of Peninsula Family Service. I'm also a member of the Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition. As a member of Rio, we submitted a series of proposals around funding we think will advance the recovery of those hit us hard. Thank you to everyone for their work on the proposals. I'm pleased to see significant funding for children, but I encourage you to do more for children, their families, their teachers, as well as for older adults. Thank you. Next speaker is Louise Auerhahn. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, good, good afternoon, supervisors. This is Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. And first, I want to thank the board, the administration, and all of the county employees for your heroic work over the past 18 months holding our community together. Uh, Working Partnerships strongly supports the existing proposals for COVID relief and hero pay. And we further support and have signed on to the concepts put forward in the Real Coalition letter. In particular, we urge focus on funding for food, eviction prevention, affordable housing, children, youth. Next speaker is Milan Ballantin. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. My name is Milan Ballantin, and I'm with the amazing African American Community Service Agency. I am also, and we are members of the Nonprofit Racial Equity and Action Leadership Coalition. And as members, we are urging the county to look at these proposals and fund them because we need the recovery and the support for the hardest hit communities during this pandemic. We focus on all sorts of priorities, but definitely our community engagement for the nonprofits, our sustainability and capacity building and alternatives to policing and incarceration. These are important. Next speaker is Amber Frymier. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Amber, are you there? Thank you for this opportunity, board members, to speak today and for the motion uh, to provide hero pay. Both my husband and I are nurses for Valley Medical. My husband works as a per diem nurse in the ER, and I'm a 0.5 or half code status in the homeless health program. As previously stated by my fellow RNPA members, 
COVID did not discriminate nor recognize how many hours we were on staff during the pandemic. We respectfully request that all nurses in the Santa Clara system receive the same amount of HERO pay regardless. Next speaker is Nick Kawada. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Nick Kawada, SBCN. We co-facilitate co the REAL Coalition. And in our role as REAL Coalition members, we support the proposals outlined in our letter signed by nearly 70 nonprofits and allies. And we do want to express our appreciation for administration's proposal, among others, to provide flexible sustainability and capacity funding for CBOs. Thank you so much so for your work and for you know, consider our proposals that come not from ourselves, but for our community to make them better and to make transformative change possible. Next speaker is Melissa Guarino Gong. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Can you hear me? Oh, there we yes. go. Yes. Hello, thank you for taking my call. I am a registered nurse working as extra help for Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. I have worked for Valley Medical Center and the county throughout the entire COVID-19 pandemic. And I just want to urge the board to approve pandemic pay for all RMPA members and all members of the county, regardless of code status. We all did the lift. We should all get equal work. Thank you. The next speaker is Matthew Reed. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yes, my name is Matthew Reed from Silicon Valley at Home. We're part of the nonprofit Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition. As a member of the Real Coalition, we support the proposals you received around the ARP funding that we think outline forward-looking process and approaches to both the recovery and the new future. We thank Supervisor Ellenberg and the administration for the hard work on the detailed programming before you. I'd like to emphasize that our coalition has not asked for piecemeal funding specific to any of our organizations. Next speaker is Rosie Lopez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. My name is Rosie Lopez, and I'm the Early Care and Education Manager of Borough Family Services, and we are part of the CISA Political Collective. We agree with the funding allocations categories named child care services related to COVID-19 and children's agenda. This funding should be used to provide safe and supportive care for children with ongoing child care. Girl Family Services wants to expand child care services later in the day and on weekends. We also could expand our services by building out the second floor of our main facility. We also suggest that the county look at purchasing. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Victor, are you there? Yes. Victor, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go so, ahead. Uh, so part of some of the Mayfair and the Cecil Public Collective, as part of our organization, we've been working over the years to ensure that uh, displacement, anti-displacement efforts are created in the community and linking them back up to wealth building. And we all know that wealth building is connected to asset building. And for communities of color, this has always been an issue. We support uh, a pathway to community wealth building. We also support the real coalitions, specific items around this issue. And some of Mayfair also supports an increase in behavioral. Community. Next speaker is Nancy Bermeau. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. This is Nancy Bermeau. I'm a member of the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, the commission would like to thank all five of our supervisors for the work you've done uh, related to the, to the pandemic. We also strongly support Supervisor Ellenberg's op-ed and proposal to increase the funding for children and family, uh, particularly in the areas of rent and mortgage assistance for families with children and at-risk elderly, childcare and job training to support a return to the workforce for women impacted by job loss and job insecurity. Um, Next speaker is Joan Barron. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. My name is Joan Barron, and I represent CHC, which is proud to have a clinical staff of over 60 individuals, more than 60% of which are individuals of color. Challenges with hiring predate COVID, and it's hard to believe it's even more challenging now. Prior to COVID, one in five youth struggled with mental health. Today, that number is seven in 10, more than three times the number. To keep our staff here to help this youth, we must offer a living wage. We cannot have access to mental health, especially in person, if there's not staff here to provide it. Next speaker is Kira Kazansis. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm Kira Kazansis from SBCN, and I co-facilitate the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition. In our co coalition's proposals, we ask the county to spend much of its American Rescue Plan funding on the community members and neighborhoods disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Our proposals also reflect intentional focus on efforts to attack systemic racism that keeps the African-American 
uh, community and other communities of color disproportionately underserved, under-resourced, targeted, and marginalized. We thank county administration for their thoughtful proposals and for your consideration of this agenda, and we look forward to partnering with both administration and members of the board. Next speaker is Marie Bernard. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Marie, are you there? I am there. Thank you very much. Go ahead. My name is Marie Bernard from Sunnyvale Community Services, and our organization is a member of the Real Coalition. We appreciate the administration's proposal providing flexible funds for sustainability and capacity for community-based organizations. We see firsthand the disproportionate impact on the pandemic on the of the pandemic on communities of color. We particularly support funding for building local leaders and increasing funding for children, our future. Next speaker is Raquel Dietrich. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Raquel Dietrich, and I work with the Santa Clara County Office of Education's Child Care Resource and Referral Program. My colleagues uh, previously mentioned a letter of support um, related to the ARPA proposals. We support the um, County Executive's Office a proposal specifically related to early learning and care and workforce development. Although the state has dedicated funding to expand early learning uh, for all four-year-olds, uh, this will not be possible unless we work together to recruit thousands of new teachers. Next speaker is Hira Kanzada. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Hira Kanzada. I'm a psychotherapist from the Khalil Center. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that provides behavioral health. Um, I'm calling to please request continued funding. Great rise. On our wait list is we request funding to meet the services of this unique population where education. Next speaker is Kylie Clark. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Kylie Clark, and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator at West Valley Community Services, a local nonprofit serving the 22,000 people living in the West Valley. Our vision is a community where every person has food on the table and a roof over their head. We speak today to support the real proposals and urge the Board of Supervisors to approve the spending. A lot of thought and intention to advance racial justice and recovery was put into these proposals, and we appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Mary Gloner. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. I'm Mary Gloner, speaking as CEO of Project Safety Net, a coalition dedicated to youth suicide prevention, mental wellness, and superintendent Simidian's district, a real member, and a resident of Supervisor Ellen Ellenberg's district. Please adopt the real recommendations, which takes a social determinants and long-term approach to ensure communities are healthy economically, physically, and socially. I encourage partnerships with community-based nonprofit organizations for a comprehensive school-based youth mental health promotion, substance use services, and suicide prevention by building upon student-centered services. Thank you. Next speaker is Brenda Arenas. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Brenda Arenas y soy la navegadora comunitaria de Greol Family Services y formamos parte de la colectiva Si Se Puede. Estamos de acuerdo con los fondos para los servicios de cuidado infantil relacionados con COVID-19 y la gente infantil. Estos fondos deben usarse para brindar un cuidado de mayor calidad. También se pueden utilizar para los costos de construcción para ampliar los centros. Sugerimos que el condado considere comprar algunos de las muchas propiedades de cuidado con licencia que cerraron durante la pandemia, ya que estos pueden ser reabiertos con nuestro. I do believe we have our translator in the room, Rosario. Is she there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, my name is Brenda Arenas and I'm part of the collective Si Se Puede, and I agree with all the funds and the um, with the, with the use of the funds in order to improve the quality and also to improve the different funds for centers. And I also agree to have um, that the county may buy different properties that were um, that, that, that are on site for be approved. And this is where we got. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. I think we're we're trying to like even the amount of time that we're paying to a particular topic like this we can't do it we're doing a disservice to the issues involved when we allot this amount of time because time is uh can be there's a value to it it's currency and when we devote this amount of currency 
to a topic that is this complex, I think we are experiencing a poverty of humanity and a respect for the dignity of the human suffering. Next speaker is Fidelia Malaudzi. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Fidelia, are you there? Fidelia is not unmuted. We'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is R. Kanda. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, Richard Kanda, Asian Law Alliance. We're a member of the Real Coalition. I wanted to focus on the priority areas that Real has identified, which include continual relief, wealth building, health equity, community engagement, nonprofit sustainability, capacity building, and alternatives to policing and, and incarceration, because these are the areas we believe will best advance racial justice and recovery in our, com in our community. Thank you very much. We'll go back around to Fidelia Malaudzi. You have 30 seconds, please go ahead. Hi, I'm part of the RMPA board of, uh, uh, of the board and I'm a nurse at uh, O'Connor Hospital and I believe that all nurses deserve uh, equal pay for the 250. Uh, no, everybody who put in so much work during the COVID uh, pandemic height and I don't believe that there should be prorated rates for that. Everybody needs to be paid 200 and uh, the, the full 2,500 because there were other nurses that were part time that put in extra work. Even at point nine, we've all worked full time at that point. Thank you. Next speaker is Nathan Park. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Nathan, are you there? I'm here. I'm so sorry. My name is Nathan Park with Sacred Heart Community Service, and I'm a member also of the Real Coalition. As a member of the coalition, my organization has submitted a series of proposals around ARP funding that we think will advance the recovery of those who have truly been hit hardest by the pandemic. We call on the County of Santa Clara to spend much of its American Rescue Plan funding on the communities of color, impacted neighborhoods like the East Side, and community members disproportionately impacted, such as immigrants, women, children, and youth. Lastly, we continue to request that members of the community with lived experiences of poverty and systemic racism be involved in these decision-making processes. Thank you. Next speaker is Gabriel. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Gabriel Hernandez, director with the CC for the Collective. I would also like to thank um, Supervisor Chavez for her leadership in focusing the investment of these funds on the census tracts most impacted by the pandemic and that have been systematically ignored um, over the years. Um, we also signed on to the Real Coalition's outline of proposals and look forward to working with the county um, to continue the work of the recovery after this um, crisis. Thank you. The next speaker is Kraboa. Forgive me if I mispronounced your name. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Christoph Kraboa. I'm the CEO of Rebecca Children's Services. Uh, the great resignation, uh, as I call it, the great burnout, uh, is critically impacting our ability to hire and maintain qualified staff. I'm truly thankful for our partnership with Behavioral Health and you, the Board of Supervisors, but in order to meet the state's clear mandate of meeting the critical community network adequacy requirements, a contractual rate increase is critically needed. Thank you. Next speaker is Lana Nguyen. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Lana, are you there? We do not have Lana. We'll move on. The next speaker is Charlotte T. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Charlotte Theodore with um, with Sacred Heart Community Service. I'm a member of the nonprofit Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition. As a member of the Real Coalition, my member my organization has submitted a series of proposals around ERP funding that we think will advance the recovery of those who've been hit hit the hardest by the pandemic. We focused on priority areas, including continued relief, wealth building, health equity, community engagement, nonprofit sustainability and capacity building and alternatives to policing and incarceration because those are the areas we believe. And that concludes our request to speak. You're muted, President Wasserman. Try that one more time. Thank you, David. You got three thank yous there, David. You only heard one of them. <laughs> I appreciate all of them. Thank you. You betcha. You betcha. Vice President Ellenberg, saw your hand first. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. Um, 
I want to thank administration for for their proposal. I, I see many line many areas in line with my priorities and with community feedback the board has received. I also want to thank all of the public speakers, uh, notably members of the of the Real Coalition. Um, the the focus is is where it needs to be. I, I want to share uh, five priorities where I believe we need to concentrate investments. Um, as they relate to the ARPA funds. Uh, number one is investment in early childhood. Number two is an expanded access to mental health supports. Three, strength in safety net systems. Four, investment in community-based alternatives to the criminal legal system. And five, equity-driven support for economic recovery through small business grants. Uh, Dr. Smith, I appreciated some of the uh, reorganization of projects uh, in the slides uh, compared to how they were grouped for the ledge file. And I want to highlight just a few um, specific items and, and make some recommend recommendations for adjustments. Uh, first, on slide number two, I think it states that the board approved a strategic vision for this funding. My recollection actually from the August report was that the board received the report and that today we haven't formally agreed on a strategic vision. Um, but I do hope that today's discussion allows us to solidify, solidify our shared priorities. Uh, turning to slide five, of course, I do strongly support inclusion of investment in kids. Um, looking at this list, though, there, there are some overlaps in some of these categories. For example, the school-based behavioral health uh, and substance use treatment for youth could as easily be grouped with the behavioral uh, health investments on slide four. And absolutely, all of these pieces are critical, but I specifically would like to see the 20 million for the children's agenda increased to 40 to 50 million with investments specifically focused on the health development and early education and care for young children, given the related economic and childcare impacts on families and time lost during the pandemic for early intervention programs during those really critical early development years. On slide seven, uh, related to item 24 that we, that we approved on consent, I would like to see additional broader and flexible support for our smallest businesses that have been significantly impacted by COVID and the public health orders. Many larger businesses received PPP loans, many of which have, uh, have been forgiven. I would recommend that we increase um, grants to very small businesses to a minimum of $10 million, uh, exclusive of the 2.5 million approved earlier for air quality grants, uh, again on, on item 24. Pardon me, these grant funds should be flexible and focused on resiliency. The small business grant program should include both COVID reimbursements and business resiliency funding with, with broad flexibility, excuse me, um, as opposed to the, the air quality grant program, which I understand to be very specific um, to a particular, to funding a particular need. Uh, second, applications should be evaluated with an equity and COVID impact prioritization methodology such as the Rebuilding California process, and staff needs to define a management fee and send the administration of the program out for RFP uh, for transparency. Uh, next on slide eight, I do appreciate uh, some inclusions of supports for those who have come into contact with the criminal legal system, but to me, the housing supports seem in line with other safety net supports and would be better characterized there. Uh, the video visits reflect an operational change that we should be implementing regardless of the pandemic. I would like to see significant consideration and funding of community-based alternatives to incarceration, which include continued and increased efforts to minimize our jail population, including the proposals from the Real Coalition, um, uh, such as the $2 million in funding community-based pretrial release programs, uh, 1 million to provide a base a universal basic income to people who are being released and 2 million in grants for other experiments in community based public safety initiatives and I think that um, adds up to 
about $5 million towards those efforts. And then finally, uh, related to slide nine, uh, given the scope of community need, I would like to see that all of the $300 million of unallocated ARPA funds go to forward-looking community recovery. Obviously, we need to pay for continued COVID response um, and plan for some rejected claims out of other sources like FEMA, but we don't yet know fully what FEMA will cover. And by allocating ARPA funds now, we disqualify any of those expenses from being FEMA eligible. And uh, one, one more point with regard to, to the proposed amount, you know, before we set any proportion of the recovery uh, funds aside, I'd like to see some more detail for, from administration that backs up the response costs and expected reimbursement uh, and discussion if any unreimbursed costs can be covered out of um, other fund balances or other sources. So I'm going to uh, pause there. Uh, I'll just actually, apologies. Um, I, I did request earlier during, um, or at least raise the issue during uh, Dr. Smith's um, county exec report, um, asked for um, information in, in an off agenda regarding uh, uh, the date range used for analysis of hours worked by extra help employees to set uh, pandemic pay prorating and a table that lists the number of county part-time employees by department employed during that same date range and how many of those part-time employees were scheduled to work above their FTE code during that same period. That is what I have. I am very much looking forward to hearing uh, from my colleagues and then a question to President Wasserman about, you know, really process here. How are we, I, I understand that we're not voting on allocations today, but I would like to have a little bit of clarity around the, the process and what we are looking to accomplish during this conversation. Sure, Vice President. This was a received report where there's input from each of the supervisors, then Dr. Smith to come back to us. I'm sure he's taking copious notes as you were speaking. Dr. Smith, any comment that you'd like to make at this point before I turn to the other supervisors? Just a comment about process. Um, you're right. What we're asking is um, policy direction from the board. Um, I don't think that, uh, well, if you want to get involved in voting on policy, that's fine. But uh, I think it would probably be better for us to hear what the board has to say and then come back um, with some more details. Thank you very much. Board members, any other questions or comments that you'd like to give Dr. Smith before he comes back to us? Supervisor Chavez. Oh, and if I may, please, I'll just take my presidential prerogative here. I want to say happy 90th birthday to Norm Minetta when his son was on earlier oh. and um, speaking during this 30 seconds of public speaking. It reminded me of his 90th birthday. And please convey the board's happy birthday to Norm for a brilliant career. Supervisor Chavez. Oh, I thought you were going to bust into song. I was so I was so excited to see that, Mike. Go right, go right ahead, Supervisor. <laughs> but I think that's a wonderful idea for Secretary Mineta. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I too want to thank the speakers. Uh, you and all the the prep work and the materials that came to us from both you and the staff. Um, I want to just take a step back and make a recommendation, some recommendations relative to um, when the board takes final actions on these uh, different areas of work. Um, and one of them is that I, I am very interested in knowing what our partner organizations will be investing relative to our investments. And I want to just give an example. I thought um, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's point about us really leaning into early childhood education and, and um, in many ways is a really great idea. I think that that's exactly, um, to me, one of the most important things that we can be doing relative to both prevention for all the work the county does, but also really getting people back um, to work and back to normal. Uh, and in addition to that, I know that the state and federal government have made resources available to our partner organizations. So it's really important to me to understand what 
they're spending money on it and and what we're spending money both so that we have a, a single plan so we're not you know so we're not wasting resources is is number one um, but number two given the volume of one-time monies that we're gonna be getting, better understanding how those monies will be spent and over what period of time that really helps us get, um, get to the, these issues knit, knitted together. So as an example, is it best for the county to be investing its resources in one-time money for um, the construction and development of childcare facilities? Or it does it make more sense for us to be putting money into ch early childhood education um, uh, teaching and especially now that we're going to have TK, I, I think the stress on that workforce is going to be profound. So I'm very interested in making sure that that we know that this is what the county office of education is putting in. This is what the you know this this is how the state resources are going to be divided and and I'm just using them illustratively. And then the, therefore this is how we're going to be making our our investments because I do think the investments need to be significant. And I think they need to be aligned with our partner agencies. Thoughts about that? And I'm asking that of uh, Dr. Smith in particular or staff. Dr. Smith. Or staff. Um, well, I guess um, in order to have a coherent response region wide, it would be best to have clarity about what the other organizations are doing. Um, we also have before you some specifics, but lots of uh, general concepts, um, mm -hmm. and it'll depend on exactly how those are implemented um, to, for us to be able to see how we can interact with other agencies. For example, I mean, um, this is an obvious example, um, Office of Education and San Jose and the county are all interested in child care, as well as first fives being interested in child care. Um, the question will be how do we coordinate and cooperate and make sure that we offer the right kind of contracts to the right kind of bidders in a process that's more collaboratively than independent. Um, and you know we'll have to come back with recommendations about how to do that. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the reasons I'm so interested in that is that in addition to I think it will just stretch our dollars longer, you know, you know, further along. I also think that it creates like we have a window of opportunity to do more a higher level of collaboration than perhaps we've done in the past. And I think particularly with the office of Susan, I'm going to say the name wrong. The Office of Advocacy. Children's Policy. Keep it easy. Office That's of right. Children's Policy. I just want you to know that I actually thought of the office and can't remember the name. So there you go. <laughs> um, but as an example, given that we have that new leadership role coming into the organization, this may just be the right time to um, have the capacity to, to really leverage those resources. So Dr. Smith, I think the point you're raising is right, that looking at those partners uh, in particular is, is probably the right way to go. And it does seem to me that that should be a benchmark um, for expenditures that we're making. And I'm hearing Mike Wasserman in the back of my head because Mike's always saying, let's not pay for something that someone else is paying for, A or B should, should be paying for. And I think that will allow us to both increase the pot as Supervisor Ellenberg um, suggested, but also do it in a way that, uh, that that we can see at an even higher rate of return. So that, thank you for that, Dr. Smith. Um, a few other areas that I wanna dive into is that I'm very interested in the, the approach that um, we're looking at with our nonprofit partners. In the description in the uh, staff report, it says that there would be money that would be invested to support nonprofits that were particularly hard hit by COVID-19. And I am, I'm presuming that, uh, and it says that that would be done, the framework for that would be done in collaboration with um, the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. And uh, am I, do I understand that fund to be a hardship fund primarily? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Is it a hardship fund, the five million that you're setting aside for the nonprofits to work with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits? No, we're thinking of it as a grant fund, um, analogous to the hero pay, only for the organizations oh, that we have okay. contracts with. Okay. Um, based on the belief that um, many of our contractors, well, all of our contractors providing a wide range of services had major stresses in their organization related to the pandemic and the types of stress are significantly different depending on the particular service that's offered. So we felt that we needed to make it a grant program based on um, the number of contracts and the amount of the contracts um, excluding pass-throughs so that they could have the flexibility to use it however they would think was appropriate. Um, you know, some, some CBOs are providing behavioral health direct patient care. Some are um, doing telemedicine. Some are doing a lot of other different human services. So we didn't feel like administratively we could tell them how to use the resources but it's a grant program, not a hardship. So um, I think that, I don't think the, the the information in here, as I'm reading it, doesn't say, doesn't reflect what you just said, but you're saying that the use of funds could be hero pay or, or whatever the nonprofit wants to use it for. Right, we can't really call it hero pay because they're not our employees. Some contract, some of our CBO partners uh, employ individuals, some of them do it by contract, some of them don't employ anybody. Um, but we felt like, uh, just like the county employees deserved some recognition, the entire, CBO organization deserve recognition. Um, and we're just recommending an allocation that's consistent with what the add on basically to their contract. Got it. I, that's helpful. And, um, and that wasn't clear from the report. And what I would also say is what you're saying essentially is this is for nonprofits that we currently have contracts with to, uh, to address um, how they would like to support their employees or their organizations. Depending obviously on what the board directs us to do. Yeah, no, I we, understand. I just wanted to understand your intent. What we were okay. thinking is our CBO partners that provide health and human services types of services. So behavioral health, medical, you know, social services, um, all of the community services that were pushed to the limit during the pandemic. But we excluded things like pass-throughs where we have a contract, for example, to for somebody to distribute funding to a building project or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I understand. I understand the difference. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, one thing that I would really want the staff to consider is we have a number of nonprofits that are in the process of um, trying to um, get to the, frankly, to the next level of what their development's going to be. And a number of them that have come forward, at least to me, and I'm certain this has come to my, my colleagues' attention, that are looking long-term to purchase facilities uh, in communities of high need and, um, and or expand in their current locations. And one request that I would like to make, and Dr. Smith, this really isn't so much for you, but it would really be to our non profit partners is to better understand um, what those needs are and, and um, understand them in a way that might help us be able to direct uh, where they may be able to get resources either from us or another organization. I just want to give you two examples. Um, we have a, a nonprofit both in Sunnyvale that is in the process of buying 
a larger building in a different location so that they're able to provide more services. We have a similar situation with a nonprofit um, that is in the Washington neighborhood that will be expanding into downtown. Those expansions, um, and I would like to get this from the Silicon Valley uh, Council of Nonprofits, but just a framework as to what resources might be available to them and whether or not, and, and if there was a pool of money, what's the actual need for, for nonprofits that are part of the network that are within that, uh, in that situation that already have contracts with us. Thank you. Um, and then Dr. Smith on the, on the, um, the expansion of housing. Um, well, let me say one thing to my colleagues. Some of the stuff we're talking about, I'm not sure if it's ARPA funding or if it's our board funding. And I, I wanna leave the flexibility to the staff to figure out the right source of funds. We have, a, we have an expansive organization and I was always concerned that putting our eyes toward just this pot didn't really force us to think transformationally about the changes we wanna make in our service to the community. So the next set of questions I'm gonna lay out, I'm not, they're not, our ideas are not necessarily related to this pot of money because I'm, I'm not certain that, I, I would wanna make sure we're using the most appropriate um, source of funds to get this kind of work done. But since they weren't recommended as part of this is why I'm raising them. Um, one is I'm very interested in seeing the full funding of the, the community economic development corporations in um, some, it's coming back to our budget uh, as part of our budget process. I see that there's also a request from the public to expand the hard hit um, census tracts to include Washington, and I'm not adverse to that at all. Um, but I am very interested in understanding what are the options for fully funding the, the CDCs. Um, and then on the, um, on the housing expansions, which I, I think are really exciting. Like I think the big buckets you've chosen, um, uh, Dr. Smith, are right where we need to be. One area that I remain very concerned about is the housing available for victims of domestic violence and um, sexual assault. I know we have some pilots going on there, and I'd be very interested in seeing how we can expand those pilots. Again, you would determine whether or not it makes sense to use one-time funds for that or not. Um, but, but those are areas that I'm very, remain very interested in. And also I remain very interested in the digital inclusion um, uh, proposal. I think, I think it's one of the best proposals I've seen actually come forward from the community and it was done with so many people that I think this actually has the opportunity to do, to have some real um, exciting outcomes. Um, and then on the, the, the TAY withdrawal, I, I, Dr. Smith, could you talk a little bit more about what that, what you see that from a, from a, um, you know, I see here, it, it really is looking at um, substance abuse with um, both the drugs and alcohol. And I, I think that was something that you were already doing that, that Sparky raised that would be really important. Am I to understand this would be some sort of a, uh, resources that would be available either for a location or for these services to be provided for um, for detox essentially or is there another word for, am I I'm am I using the wrong word for that um, it's not really detox but I think uh, probably sherry would be able to give you a better operational description of what they were thinking about sherry are you on uh, yes I am good afternoon um, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellen Perg, and, and Board of Supervisors Sherry Terrell with the Paper Health Services Department. Um, for this particular proposal, uh, Supervisor Chavez, um, we were looking at uh, building out withdrawal management and transition age youth, as well as transgender youth, um, because this has been a particular need during COVID and the rise of substance use and overdose, um, as well as ED admissions. Um, and unfortunately, uh, deaths due to overdose of substance use. And so uh, this is really building out um, youth beds. Um, so potentially adding five beds for youth, uh, potentially 15 beds for adults um, would be what we would be looking to, to build out. And when you say build out, does that mean expanding with the current partner or are these are these more medically based or do you know yet? 
Uh, we do have um, current uh, providers that provide these. We would be looking at uh, possibly um, adding supports to existing providers. And if um, they are unable to do that, we would certainly be able to look for other providers who could provide those services. Thank you. And so the, the, this money would be for the five beds? Up for the, uh, the, the total beds would be five beds for youth and 15 beds for adults. And so in the in the staff report here, it's got a focus on youth and transitional aged youth. Are you talking about the same group or is the transitional aged youth and the youth, the five and then the 15 are for adults? The, um, um, oh, go ahead, Dr. I Shane. can answer this one. <laughs> The money that we're suggesting come from ARPA is dedicated to the transitional age youth, but we use regular behavioral health money for the adults. Got it. So this is part of an, this is a subset of an expansion. Right. Got it. And are we needing to use ARPA money because um, this wouldn't be covered by a by any kind of insurance or does this give us some flexibility in terms of who, who we can take in? Um, from an administrative perspective, we thought it would be a useful way to use ARPA because it gives us a jump start. Um, so it's a speed opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. <clears throat> we tried as best we could, you know, for the entire board to focus on recommendations that we could um, leverage with current resources or current programs because you know ARPA even though it sounds like a lot of money it's a one-time money and it's for two years and uh, mm -hmm. it, it'll give us a head start on some programs but it won't complete the program and many of the problems and issues that the board and the community are very concerned about you know our long-term commitments so um, I would encourage you all to think of this as um, leveraging money to get going on programs that we think that you think are important for us to do in the long run. And we will need to find additional funding down the line in order to maintain them. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, um, the other thing is I was very excited to see the continuation of the outreach workers. I think that's going to be a necessary part of how we do business in the future. I want to encourage staff to look both at the promotora model as well as the organizing model that we have been using during COVID-19. Um, I also just want to highlight for the staff that we have not yet begun the outreach that we're going to be needing to do for both Reed Hill View um, and I know we're looking at this for, you know, that we've already begun the, the work around using um, CalFresh as part of our COVID outreach, but I'm very excited about this. I just wanna make sure that we're looking both at the promotor model and the organizing models, um, because I do think they have different uh, roles in the work that we're doing. And I think it is a great way to not just um, be part of employing people as part of recovery, but I also think it's a very good way for us to take a look at the programs that we're offering and really be able to look at the access point. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I also just wanna encourage the staff to think about the full funding for our UBI pilot with our, um, our transitional aged youth as part of our future programming. And then two other issues I just wanna to touch upon because I think they're emerging challenges. One is the work we're doing relative to um, to farming and the farm, the protections that our farm farming community is going to need. I know we've had for our small community farms some really challenging news. And Mike, I'm sure you're probably more aware of this than all of us relative to how infestations of um, uh, different kinds of insects are impacting the 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 uh, the yield this year and what that means in terms of both the losses for farms, but how the smaller farms are gonna be able to protect themselves. And so I think that's something we should also just, I wanna put on everybody's radar. And then um, I think the, the other thing that I, I just wanna say overall uh, to the staff is I, I thought this was um, just very thoughtful and very respectful of the feedback that we got from the community. I, I do really like the idea of making sure that 
a component of the contracts for the way we proceed do have people with lived experience um, at the point where money is given play a leadership role in making sure that money is spent by whatever institution it is in a way that is reflective of the needs of the community. I think that is a fundamental change in the way we uh, do business. And I think one that would be extremely, uh, extremely helpful. So thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. And um, we'll be adjourning to our six o'clock meeting in just about an hour and we need some sort of break in between. So, um, don't know if we'll make it or not. Don't know if we'll be eating while we'll be listening to the presentation on the redistricting, but just making you all aware, we have another three items after this. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. And um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Smith and uh, staff for coming up with a very good and thoughtful start of laying out some very broad ideas on the spending of the ARP funds. Um, and um, and I think a lot of the questions has been covered by both my colleagues, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Allenberg, for their uh, very thoughtful uh, additions and questions. Um, and there's just a little bit of clarification I would like to ask as well. And, and is that during the June budget hearing, uh, I did uh, ask for the uh, uh, staff to get back uh, with option to develop a dashboard, right, to uh, make to outline our expenditures charged to the federal funding sources, such as like the CARES Act, right? Uh, and FEMA and ARP, since these are all kind of different buckets, they're somewhat, you know, related, but somewhat confusing and some could go to one to the other. And I would just like to see if uh, a house of progress on that dashboard and when we might be able to have something that we could look at. Yes, we're, uh, we're, we have posted on the website our expenditures and we're trying to integrate now with what we're receiving from uh, FEMA and what we anticipate to be receiving in the future. Um, so we should have it um, done by the end of the year. Great. And, and as I mentioned before, one, one thing could be very um, important is the eligible expenses for each, or each source of funding, right? And certainly our, our, my goal is just making sure that we leave no stone unturned and apply for every single FEMA reimbursement we can, right? And make sure that we are maximizing opportunities for, for the reimbursement, uh, okay? Um, now, in the big picture, right, the amount of funding that's been really voted on would be the heroes pay. Um, that's basically already you know, uh, all spent in that sense, right? Being being uh, uh, shelved off. Now, um, for on various uh, uh, presentation, UFRE mentioned that uh, a lot of the ARPA funding actually has already been spent on an ongoing basis. Um, do you have a rough idea how much that dollar amount is at this point? I mean, our total expenditures for the uh, re pandemic response so yeah. far? Pandemic response, but I guess minus what we expect to be uh, reimbursed by FEMA. Martha, can you give them the numbers, please? Roughly sure. Two. I don't have the details in front of me, but I remember <clears throat> between the beginning of the pandemic and um, about a two year out plan, it was over a billion dollars. I know that Margaret's on the line as well. She has more details. And then We've received about 100 million in FEMA reimbursement to date. Was that your question, Supervisor? Oh uh, yeah, no, uh, to date that's great, but I'm just thinking, trying to figure out exactly um, how much we really would need to come up from ARPA, right? Because we have a big bucket on the spreadsheet of 70 half, 78 and a half million dollars as an ongoing COVID response, right? So I'm just trying to figure out, is that the amount that we are uh, expecting that has already been spent or will be spent uh, uh, by by the time this this is over, uh, and, and I'm just trying to figure out exactly how we are allocating that because when you do 70 80.5 times two, there's 157 million. That certainly is a, the biggest chunk of of uh, of, of all the uh, allocations, right? So based on this 157 million, how much of it has already been spent, and how much potentially will be spent? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we we gave you um, some numbers uh, a few months ago, but. We'll have to update them, but our projections lately have been 
over a billion dollars so far, and we expect for the next year to be significantly lower than that, but we're not sure 100%. And that if we are successful in getting um, FEMA funding, we think it would be probably somewhere in the 300 to 400,000, I mean, million, <laughs> million. <laughs> Hope it's not a thousand. I'm in deep trouble with it. Um, <laughs> but um, the other funding, you know, we have CARES Act funding, we have ARPA, right. we have Medi-Cal supplemental, right. we have state funding. Right. So all of those programs we're pushing um, as fast as we can to get as many bills um, as possible paid for by them. But that's where we get into um confusing priorities because our right. general stance is get the money from somebody else before we start spending money that the board has discretion over um exactly so, right so, so i think that's where the dashboard idea came up was was hopefully right. helpful to lay all those out and then we can see where they're at and how to like say push as many of those reimbursable expenses as possible, right? So then obviously leave us a little bit more uh, flexibility on how to spend the rest of the ARP funding, right? Okay, so that's right. the one so big on this uh, dashboard idea. Uh -huh. yeah, so you. what we're suggesting here in terms of the um, last page was what we think is mm -hmm. reasonable that we'll need to spend locally that we won't be reimbursed by FEMA or other sources from, but I just, you know, jump in that it's our best guess at this point. Right. It right. depends a lot on, you know, how FEMA approaches the pandemic, what else happens, how many other expenditures are paid for by the medical system. I mean, it's, it's a little nebulous at this point. Right. Exactly. Now, um, on the ARP um, interim final rule, um, they lay out what you can spend the money on, one of which is actually on water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, right? So I was asking to see if there's any plans to address, like, for example, access to clean drinking water, improving wastewater management, uh, stormwater infrastructure to be more resilient to climate change or, or uh, some type of high quality broadband internet access to underserved communities uh, and whether that could be used in our fundings. Well, from from the administrative perspective, um, water and water purification really falls into the bailiwick of the water district and the water company. And uh, uh, how do I say this in a nice way? They have plenty of money to do what needs to be done. You didn't see Golden Speaker, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, but in terms of broadband, I think that's a great example of what Supervisor um, Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg were talking about, where we have to really coordinate it with other entities. There's no need, no question that there is need, but there's also a lot of entities that are interested in contributing. So we want to make sure that we do it in a coordinated way that makes sense because right. there's special populations that need to be reached out to, particularly the elders and those with exactly. uh, poor access to technology and those <laughs> children who really need technology to progress in school. So we need to coordinate with other entities before we can say exactly what we should do. Correct. And, and I think we, there was a request from the Digital Inclusion Working Group to support some of the digital literacy activity, activity for the older adults, for example. And I think this would be a type of uh, uh, support that this potentially could be useful for ARP. Um, also, um, I, I don't know, do you think there's some of these items that could be uh, allocated through the mid-year budget adjustments as well? Or maybe yes. Pilot those? Yeah. Um, just from a process perspective, mm -hmm. Um, as you can tell from looking through the recommendations, right. um, all of these programs are at different levels of development. Um, I know some of the board members are working on specific plans 
with other entities, uh, which are at different levels of development. So we anticipate that some of them will be ready for action during the mid-year budget. Some will probably take a little bit longer time to get clarified. Uh, some, as I mentioned, you've already done, for example, the um, uh, hero pay and the money for uh, Epic for some of the community clinics. And then some of them will just be adding money to current contracts, which will require us to modify contracts and come back to the board. Right. So it's not going to be a big bang implementation. It'll be bringing it to the board for final action as they are ready to come to the board. Okay, great. Um, and I do want to echo the comments made by my colleague, Supervisor Ellen Burke and Chavez on the need for child care uh, support. Um, the current uh, child care proposal uh, works with uh, supporting the workforce development of child care professionals, for example. Uh, and as we know that child care is the most expensive cost for many families following you know, household costs. So, and, and now we ask to see if we could include some funding for child care subsidies <coughs> as well uh, in, this, uh, in this next iteration. All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then a few minor issues I'm going to say is um, just a suggestion uh, regarding the matrix um, to see if we could actually add a column um, to uh, talk about the uh, doll, the rationale of the dollar amount of what, what the dollar amounts are based on for the programs. Um, and uh, and then the other one is whether or not it makes sense for us to also highlight some potential funding sources for these programs uh, in the separate column as well. Um, and we talk about the dashboards and charts, uh, you know, something like a Microsoft Excel song would be very helpful so we could sort it easily. Um, and uh, I want to say thank you for the hard work of putting all that together. Uh, uh, this is a lot of information, a lot of different proposals we're trying to accommodate, uh, like the real proposals uh, uh, that the community has come together along with so many uh, other, other ones. And I just want to thank administration for a very good uh, first start on making this happen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I. I will just clarify that uh, we will take the input from the board today and come back with a presentation that meets your needs in terms of Excel spreadsheets and explanations and extra issues. Um, but maybe I can also take the opportunity to just inform the public that um, many of the ideas that came from the real presentation and other community uh, input are critically important issues that you know need to be addressed won't necessarily need to be specifically addressed with ARPA funds but can be addressed with other issues. Um, I mean I, I think the board is quite a progressive board and well aware of the fact that many of the ideas that are coming forward will take some time to implement and some consistency and long long-term revenue streams, which, you know, will be jump-started by ARPA, but ARPA is not the end, is what I'm trying to say. All of the ideas need to be dealt with. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Supervisor Lee, anything else? No, I think I think this is really a great um, I'll propose, I'll propose start, like I said earlier. <clears throat> and one, I guess, if we could ask uh, Dr. Smith as well is, if some of these projects is related to sustainability and green ideas, uh, I would like to ask you to also highlight that as well. So we could also keep track of it to making sure we could, uh, that, that some of these things are addressing climate change as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And Supervisors, Create TV and staff, um, they're gonna need a 30 minute break to reset the equipment and move over graphics and things like that before we start our six o'clock. So we've got a few items left. I want to hear from Supervisor Smidian on this, and then I will speak, and then we're going to move on, but we're going to have um, an issue coming up very shortly that we need to deal with. Supervisor Smidian, go ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, I would just ask as we look at child care issues that we look at them in the context of the total early child uh, uh, early childhood education uh, conversation as well. Um, I think you will recall I have a longstanding interest in and engagement on the issue of transitional kindergarten, TK, which then became ETK for expanded transitional kindergarten, which now happily has become UTK, universal transitional kindergarten. Um, but as we're thinking about child care options, the development of that uh, TK program over the next couple of years represents a real opportunity in my view, but also it will be important to sort of wrap around your child care thinking, uh, given that new uh, development at the state level in terms of expanding TK. The second thing I would ask for, uh, Dr. Smith, is I was, uh, as I was listening to Supervisor Chavez talk about Promotoris, uh, I was thinking about that Asian health worker program that we have uh, piloted, started. Um, I know we're hopeful that we'll get a little um, uh, congressional uh, support for that out of the revised earmark process, but I would ask that administration take a look at uh, whether or not the Asian health worker program might not fit into one of those various categories or buckets that you have articulated. And the last thing I would say is I was um, engaged, uh, my mind was very engaged as you and Supervisor Ellenberg sort of went back and forth a bit about um, the catch-22 uh, challenge of, um, gee, if we use the ARPA funds for FEMA, uh, excuse me, if we use the ARPA funds for COVID expenses, does that preclude us going to FEMA? And you having told us on numerous occasions, gee, can't count on FEMA, we may not know for years in the future what we do or don't get. So if you and your staff can think about that sort of built-in tension or challenge uh, and uh, communicate with us in writing about that, I would appreciate it. Mr. Wasserman, that's all I'll do now, given the time constraints. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. And I'm gonna add in very quickly as well, Dr. Smith, it's, it's amazing what an issue we have. We get $375 million one-time money divided up between this year and next. And as usual, we never have enough money to do all the stuff that five supervisors want to do. I will chime in now and say that my, my desire is that we use the money wherever possible to reinforce doing what the county is expected to do. If other agencies want to partner with us, I use that word as far as matching type funds, I, I invite that. I'm also concerned about our nonprofit partners. Um, I think about Rebecca's, I think about Community Solutions, I think about Bill Wilson Center. And in talking with those people, they're having problems retaining employees and hiring them back at a competitive wage. And then that reduces their ability to provide services that the county counts on them providing for us, normally at a lower cost than what we could do it for, or we don't have the, uh, the ability to do the things that they do. And so I'd like to see any ideas you have where we can help out somehow. And again, it's one-time money um, till these, these uh, nonprofit partners of ours that do so much of what the county is expected to do can get through the next couple of years and get back to some sort of normalcy. Um, I think that's it. I'm, I, we don't have enough money to do everything we want, doing what the county is supposed to do and helping out as far as small businesses get through this period are areas I'd like to see our dollars spent. Supervisor submitting your hand is still raised. Is that intentional or not? It is not. It is down. Dr. Smith, this is a received report, but I believe you have plenty of direction. Uh, any other questions you have? Otherwise, we're going to move on. No, I think we're, we're okay. We will... Uh... Again, implementing uh, uh, the parts that are pretty clear by bringing them back to the board. Um, and we'll come back with a more refinement of the parts that are more general to ask for more direction. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. We now have item 20. Supervisor Submitian, did you have comments on this? One moment, please. Let me uh, grab my binder. Flip to the appropriate page. And
Yes, uh, I'm happy to move the requested action. You moved it, I seconded it. No speakers, any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. David, with that, I'm moving on to 23. Do you agree? That's, yes, that's the last item I have in my notes as well. Okay. Go ahead, Supervisor Simidian. I think this is too important an item to rush, and so I'd like to simply ask that we continue it to our next regularly scheduled meeting. Wonderful idea. That's what I was going to ask you to do, and I appreciate your flexibility in doing so. Supervisors, any uh, issue with that? No, I appreciate that very much, so we're not rushing. Thank you. We have one member of the public to speak. Dave, would you recognize that person, please? Certainly. One moment, please. Next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. You have 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Paul, are you there? He is not. Uh, okay. Oh. And that's all right, because we're continuing 23 that I'm sure he wanted to speak on anyway. All right. With that, David, I'm. what I see on my notes is we're going to return back to anybody from public comment that wanted to speak. I don't see any speakers. Do you agree? That is correct. Okay. And I was removed. We didn't do that. All right. We are now going to adjourn to the special joint meeting with the 2021 Advisory Redistricting Commission. Um, that will begin at 6 p.m. by virtual teleconference. Board members, any other comments before we adjourn? Seeing none, I will, all, I will see all of you at 6 o'clock promptly. Thank you very much. And, hey, sorry, uh, just a quick process question. Is it, the same, is it the same Zoom or do we need to? It's the same Zoom. Else? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Recording stopped.